So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of all saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're beginning today. Uh, it's a new beginning uh, that God has given to us. This is the thing that's so so beautiful about this gift of gifts, this, this prodigy of prodigies. It's to begin to live this abundant life of uh, Jesus and Mary. And what I, what I really see today, which is today's my 45th uh, anniversary as a priest, uh, and God is always filled with surprises. This is the feast of, um, of uh, St. Francis of Rome. She is a, uh, a beautiful saint who, uh, uh, she was a mother and uh, a, a great saint. And her angels used to appear to her. And her body, you know, in the Colosseum in Rome, uh, if, you, if you're looking at the Colosseum from the Vatican, if you backtrack up that little hill, uh, the, the, there's a monastery there with the body of, of St. Francis of Rome. And this body of St. Francis of Rome is beautiful. I've never seen such a beautiful body. As a matter of fact, it gave me an idea. Uh, so when my mother died, um, she, St. St. Francis of Rome was buried in her, in her wedding dress and she's, she's absolutely beautiful. And, and the thing that's interesting is that she's a skeleton dressed in a, in, in a, in a wedding dress. And that gave me the idea for, for my mom. And when my mom died, um, we had her wedding dress. She always, she always kept her wedding dress and, um, we buried her in her wedding dress. And that, that was the you know, most beautiful image because, uh, the, the, the days after my mom was the feast of St. Aloysius. And, uh, Jesus said, we will greet our King in our wedding garment. So this is, this is something that, uh, is, uh, always remind, I remember it because of, uh, of St. Uh, Francis of Rome. And, and I love the number 45 for some strange reason. It's a nice number. I, I feel connected, uh, to, to others, you know, so God is, God is good. He's got great plans. It's really a new beginning for us. It's a freedom that, that God is giving to us. And, uh, I'll tell you, honestly, uh, hang on to your hat. What God has planned for his children is going to really astonish the world. So I, I would call this, this um, new beginning, a new and divine way of holiness. This is what, this is what I think God is calling us to. And, and so we're going to focus on, on this gift of gifts today um, by um, reading the longed for, the yearning for this kingdom. This is, this is the life of the Essenes. The Essenes who were the Essenes in Jesus's time? It was Joachim and Anna. It was it was uh, uh, Joseph and Mary. It was uh, it, it was Andrew and Peter. They read the, Andrew ran to Peter. We found the Messiah. They were everyone was longing for the Messiah. Philip saying to Nathaniel, uh, "We found the Messiah, the one he's from Nazareth." And, and Nathaniel, in knowing Scripture, he said. What, what good could come from Nazareth, knowing that the Messiah would be born from Bethlehem? So everyone, everyone who was uh, an Essene, they were the first Christians. They were the first ones to believe in Jesus. These were the priests. This is why when you read the Acts, it was the apostles and the priests went out to proclaim uh, uh, Jesus Christ as King, as Messiah, as Lord. So this longing for is where we're gonna, what we're going to talk about today. And it's going to touch your hearts because um, this is what God has been waiting for to see in us. I think that's the thing that's missing in the divine will, the, that longing for the kingdom of God. So in volume one, now in these exits that the Lord would make me do, uh, sometimes he would, he would let her do these things outside of, outside of her bed, if you want to say. Uh, sometimes he renewed me with the promise of marriage already mentioned. So this this is one of the reasons why we wear the wedding ring. We wear the wedding, wedding ring because Jesus has proposed to us. He says, I th see the whole, the whole thing that Jesus says, I, I, I am going to go away and I'm going to return to bring you where I am and we'll never be separated from him. So this, this longing for Jesus is his return. 
this longing for the kingdom is for his return. This is what a married man, uh, when he marries a woman in, in Israel, they, they have a cup of wine. He drinks the wine. He sets it in front of her. If she sips the wine, she has accepted the proposal. So this proposal of Jesus to us is I am going to go away. And that's that's where he, what, he's, what he's been doing to prepare a place for you. And what, what the place for us is, is the kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So he renews with me the promise of the marriage, the wedding feast. He says, Jesus says that heaven is the wedding feast. So who can say the ardent yearnings that the Lord infused in me for this mystical marriage to take place? We, we should have that yearning as well. Many times I would, I would solace, solace him in saying to him, my sweet spouse, hurry, no longer delay my intimate union with you. Oh, please let us bind each other with the strongest bonds of love in such a way that no one may ever again be able to separate us, even for a simple instance, even, even for a second. See, the, the Lord is asking us to hear him. Okay, now we heard him on what I mean, we've been listening and we heard him on March 4th for this um, this uh, uh, um, the sealing of the communities. They have in the holy angels seal the communities of God because we're going to get into some rough weather. And it's like Noah sealing the boat before he got onto it. This sealing, this this covering, this branding this this being one with god is so essential and then he says to us get ready for april 8th now what's april 8th this year it's the feast of the immaculate conception uh no the feast of the annunciation sorry it's the feast of the annunciation because during holy week that's nor normally when you had the feast march 25th but what's that mean it's instead of nine months coming it's shorter now for for getting us getting ready for the for Christmas, this 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 incarnation of God that's coming. So God is telling us, get ready, get ready. And then he says, I want you to get ready for May 12th. He's he's saying these things. And, and the reason I really believe he's saying these things is um he's asking us, I, I want you to hear me once a month at least. You know, let li listen. I want I'll talk, I'll speak directly to you once a month. Now, why? Well, that's what that's what uh, in volume six, Louisa says, I, I, if you promise, if you die, I promise you, I will return to teach the divine will. And this is this is the thing that we're going to hear more clearly this this teaching that Jesus is going to give to us through little Louisa. So uh, so he says, if you listen once a month, he says, then what I want for my children is I as the as the word, I want to speak to you every week. And then he's going to say, now that you've trained yourself to hear me every week, this is like keep holy the Sabbath. Then he says, then I want to speak to you every day. The, and then what's that? What's, that's, that's in sacred scripture. They daily broke bread. They daily were listening to God. We're one, one with God. And then he's going to say, now then I want to speak to you continuously. So this this desire of Jesus is to is to get. He, he wants us to get closer and closer and closer to the word, to the one who, who speaks. Uh, the voice of the Father is Jesus. Filled Now we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit too. That, that's why if you look, you always have Louisa with the Holy Spirit. So he, she says, um, Jesus came back and tra transported me outside myself up to paradise. You're going to go to paradise before you die. You have to understand this. It's, it's, this isn't what we're hoping for. Jesus said, I rose from the dead to Louisa so that you would rise from the death of your human misery, from all your worry, from all your fear, from all your anxiety, from all your complaints, for all your negativity, for all your doubts, for all the sin. And this is why that's what's nailed to the cross with Jesus. We're going to be free of that. Okay. That's the ceiling of the communities. We're not going to be worried, fearful, anxious, complaining, negative. We're not going to doubt. We, we're going to trust in the Lord, believe in him, have confidence in him. In a way, it's going to be like paradise for us. It's going to be it's going to be uh, a new beginning. So many times I would so, so ask him, my sweet spouse, uh, don't delay any longer. My imitate union with you. Oh, please let us bind each other 
with the stronger bonds of love in such a way that no one may ever be able to separate us even for an instant. And while my soul was exc exciting itself with these yearnings, ardent yearnings for receiving that, that grace that Jesus himself wanted to give me, Jesus came back and transported me out of myself up to paradise. And in the presence of the most holy trinity and that of the whole celestial court, he renewed this marriage between Jesus and Louisa. And he, this is what he wants to do. He wants to show all of heaven this intimate union with between each one of us and God himself. That's heaven. The wedding feast. A new and divine way of holiness. And there in the presence of the most holy trinity and of the whole celestial court, he renewed the marriage. And Jesus put out the ring adorned with three precious stones of white, red, and green. Okay. The white, uh, well, let's start with the, the green first. Green is creation. Okay. Red is redemption, the shedding of his blood. White is sanctification. This ring is what he, he says. Now you don't have to have that on your, um, on your ring. You, I've just got a plain ring that I, that I, I wear basically. I wear it around my neck and he gave it to the father who blessed it and gave it back to the son again. Now listen to this. And then the Holy spirit took my right hand and Jesus placed the ring on my finger then I was admitted to the kiss of all three divine persons. Each of them blessed me. Now, this is not a romantic kiss. We are the little children of, of the great king. Uh, we, we are, we are, he calls Louisa my newborn. You can't walk. You can't feed yourself. You can't do anything without me, Jesus says. So he holds Louisa like a little baby and kisses her. He holds Louisa as his newborn and kisses her as a father would kiss the little baby. And then it reverses. Then Jesus says, I want you to be my mother, like my mother who held me and kissed me. And that's, that's the thing that God gave to Louisa uh, after renewing. See, to understand this kiss is to go through the nine excesses of love. And that's what Louisa went through every single day. Uh, till Christmas, the nine months of Christmas, every single day, she went through the nine excesses of love. And that's one of the things we can do. If God is directing us, you could go to your spiritual director and say, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? Now, this, it's it's always important to follow the direction of, of the priest, because that's, that's the way Jesus says he wants it. So what happens is uh, you, you enter into this life where this intimacy with God, where you become the little one, the nothing, and God becomes the father, the king, the Lord, your master. He's the one who is going to protect you. He's going to guide you. He's going to fill you with divine treasures. We went through the, the, the 8,000 titles of Louisa. Why? To prepare us to understand why God wants to seal the communities. What he, what he did with Louisa, he wants to do with us. He, and, and he wants to see in us those divine attributes that um, Jesus gave to Louisa. So one morning when my most loving Jesus made himself present before me in, in, in the form of the crucified, and this is, if, if, if you're still complaining, if you're still negative, you haven't spent enough time looking at Christ crucified, meditating on Christ crucified. You haven't spent enough time meditating on the sacrifice that Our Lady went through on Calvary. If, if you're still complaining, it's because you haven't understood the, the love of Jesus and Mary. So she says, he made himself present before me in the form of, of Christ crucified. And he told me he wanted to crucify me with himself. That's what God is asking. Paul, St. Paul says that if you can't pick up your cross and follow Jesus, you know, you're, you, you can't be a Christian. Well, what's that mean? Pick up your cross. Well, each one of us is suffering physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Each one of us has difficulties, has uh, oppressions around us. It could be family, it could be friends, it could be neighbors, but God wants to free us, free us to embrace our cross. You know, if you're physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally suffering, everybody is to a greater or lesser degree. So he says, I want to you to be crucified with me. I want you to share in my sufferings. Now, why would God do that? When, when we say to our heavenly father, father, I want to get closer to your son, Jesus. 
I want to get closer to your daughter, uh, Mama Mary. I want to get closer to your little daughter, Louisa. He says, good, I want you to do this, but I want you to be more like them. Okay, the these are the three that suffered, Jesus, Mary, and Louisa, the suffered the most that, of anyone. And God is asking us, would you be willing to go through some suffering to be one with them? They've got, they've done it all. And so, I mean, each one of us suffers. You get a sliver, you, 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 you bang your toe against the, the, the table. Uh, it's, it's like you go, Lord, thank you. <laughs> it's you, you learn to say, oh, you're allowing me to suffer with you. Thank you. This little way, this little way. Thank you, Lord. I want to be one with you. See now that he's already gone through everything that we've ever gone through to the point of when we die, Jesus has already died in us. He's died one with us. He's, he's done the hard work. So when we die, when you, uh, that's why I like reading and listening to the, uh, the near death experiences. When we die, it's beautiful. Jesus says to Louisa, death is the door to the Trinity. Yes. This new and divine way of holiness is nothing to be sad about. It's, how, you know, you lucky stiff, <laughs> you know, you're a, what does that mean? You're, you're, you're free of sin. You're one with God. And that that's where we're going. So this is, this is the good thing. God is going to change our understanding. So he says <clears throat> that he wanted to crucify me with him. And as he was saying this, I saw rays of light were coming out from his most holy wounds within those rays of light. They were nails coming towards me at that moment. I don't know why I, I, though I desired so much to be crucified by him as to feel consumed. He says, she says, I was caught by the great fear that made me tremble from head to foot. So here it's not, it's not going to, somebody says to me, you know, well, Louisa didn't eat, drink or sleep because God gave her the grace. Well, Louisa was hungry. Louisa was tired. Louisa was thirsty. And, and Jesus said, would you be willing to do this for me? And she said, yes. She was hungry. She didn't eat. She was thirsty. She didn't drink. She was tired. She didn't sleep. And it wasn't because uh, it was uh, it was easy. And then that's what, and so the Lord is sharing that with us as well. If we wake up in the middle of the night, the Lord is saying, are, 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 you, are you ready for what I want to show you? Are you ready for what I want to tell you? And our job is to say, yes, Lord, let, let your will be done in me. So even when we wake up at night, Instead of complaining, like, why can't I sleep? It's like, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I can share in the suffering that you went through, that your mother went through, that you gave to Louisa. So she says, I felt such annihilation of myself. I saw myself so unworthy to receive that grace that I did not dare to say, Lord, crucify me with you. She's telling us what she wanted to say, but she was terrified. Lord, crucify me with you. I want to be one with you. I want to be fused with you. And if this is what you want and you said it, I want this as well. And again, you don't have to feel, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> it's like, I want what you want, Lord, whatever it is. Now, let me just tell you about suffering. Suffering can come to the point of ecstasy. Um, you, you see this with the saints. Um, when the saints were, were crucified, like with um, the ecstasies of love of St. Teresa of Avila, the ecstasies of love, of St. Catherine of Siena, these arrows of love going through their heart uh, from God. This, it's, it's not a human love. It's a divine love. Lord, crucify me with you. And Jesus seemed to be suspended, waiting for my human will. But who can say how ardently I desired it? See, it's, it's, it's a new and divine way of holiness is not earthly. So in my inmost soul, Though at the same time I saw myself unworthy, my nature was frightened and trembled. It's okay. Your nature can be frightened and, and trembling before the Lord. But let me just put it this way. When we say fiat to the Lord, our sufferings turn into ecstasy. Since I have crucified you completely, Jesus said to Louisa, you need me to let to send new crosses upon you. Now, the crosses that he'll send upon you is, is a purification. He wants to get rid of all worry, fear, anxiety, complaints, negativity, and sin. Those are the demons that we, that, that we feed. When, when you're worried, you're feeding this demon, uh, keeping it alive in you. Oh, I got to worry about that. You know, I can't, I, this is going to be tough. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to worry. No, 
You stop feeding the demons. So these are the crosses that Jesus has given you. Are you going to continue to feed fear in you? Are you going to continue to fear doubt in you? Are you going to continue to fear anxiety in you? And it's no, I don't want that. I want heaven. I want the peace, the joy, the happiness of the true life of Jesus, the true life of Mary. So he says, up until now, you, the crosses that you have had, I, I, then he says, I shall bring you to heaven. I shall show it to the whole of the celestial court as a pledge of your love. Now, that's what he's doing with us. He's, he's saying to us, I don't want you to worry about anything anymore. I'm going to take care of you. This is a cross. And, and do we pass the cross by saying, I trust in you? See, that's why he said to St. Faustina, the final devotion I give to you before I return is divine mercy. He says, I want you to show the whole celestial court, all of heaven, all the angels, all the saints, your pledge of love, your fiat. And I shall make another one larger descent from heaven to be able to satisfy the ardent desires I have upon you, Louisa, upon you, little children of Louisa. See, it's, we have to understand that it's, it's, the, the 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 commercials say if you have a headache take this if you if you have a, a stomach ache take that and if you and again you take care of yourselves but it's showing you that this is the time we're living in and you can offer that up especially during Lent uh, instead of being worried about anything saying to Jesus I trust you instead of being afraid of where you see your children and grandchildren going or the or the or our nation going you say Jesus I trust in you. I have confidence in you. You are my savior. You are my Lord. You are my God. And I, and I know you're going to take care of this. It's complete confidence in Jesus. And he says, when you pass your little crosses, I'm going to give you a larger cross. Why? I want you. The father says, I want you more in the image of my son. I want you more in the image of, of my, 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 my daughter, my new, my, my, my little daughter, Mary. I, I want you to do this. Why? When Our Lady appeared, she says, I am the daughter of the, when she appeared to Bruno in 1947, I am the daughter of the father. I am the mother of the son. I am the spouse and temple of the Holy Spirit. She is our image with Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the two who breathe this life into Louisa. And now they want to breathe this into us. So all the other virtues remain humble and reverent before the virtue of the cross and grafting themselves to the cross, they receive greater glory and greater splendor. So what the Lord is showing is you haven't seen anything yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give this gift to the, to all the world, a new and divine way of holiness. And everyone will be in ecstasy knowing, knowing that they're drawing closer and closer to our Lord, our savior, our master, our King, our God, our all, and his mother through this little newborn Louisa. She says, who can say what flames of this love, this ardent desire, this speaking of Jesus would cast into my heart? I devoured by, by hunger for suffering. Okay, what does that mean? Yeah, come against me, worry. I trust in God. Come against me, fear. I have confidence in God. Come again. It's like she devoured the hunger, hunger for suffering. It's not going to bother you. As a matter of fact, when you see something that's impossible, you're going to smile and say, I can't wait to see what you're going to do, Lord. You are so good. You are so holy. You are so peaceful. You are so joyful. I want to enter into this true life of Jesus, this true life of Mary, amid all your sufferings. Mary at the cross, watching her son die, a horrible death. She, there was no fear. There was no, there was no, um, complaining. There was no negativity in her sufferings. It was, she, she had total confidence in God. She had told she, and when she held her son, you know, the Pieta holding her son, not seeing the love in his eyes anymore, not hearing his voice speak to her anymore, you know, looking at his hands and they're, they're, they're crippled and cr crunched up. She did not fear. She did not. She was not complaining. She was not negative. But in that sorrow, she had peace and joy and happiness. That's what God wants to give to us. The true life of Jesus and Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve, because we're going to, we're going to suffer because 
we have we're outside of paradise where there is no suffering. This this planet that we're on, you know, save the earth. Jesus, save the humanity. What 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 where we are now is saying to the Lord, you, Lord, bring us back to where we belong. What does Our Lady say to Bruno in 1947? Our Lady of Revelation, she says to Bruno, my children are going to enter eternity where they belong and enjoy the beatific vision. She says where the children of the evil one, they're never going to enter eternity and enjoy the beatific vision. They've chosen where they want to go. And it's not heaven. So he says very, very cl clearly. He says, uh, these flames of, or they, we said, these flames of ardent desires, the speaking of Jesus, that's what happens when you read the book of heaven, cast into my heart. I felt devoured by a hunger for suffering, to be one with Jesus in order to satisfy my yearning, yearnings, or better to say, to satisfy that which Jesus himself infused in me so that Jesus himself would renew for me the crucifixion. It's the crucifixion. Let me just put it this way. Uh, it's mystical. The crucifixion is real. And um, it's, it's all I can tell you is it's ecstasy. It's, it's saying to the Lord, let it be done. That, that's what St. Teresa of Avila said. That's what St. Uh, 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 Catherine of Siena said. Let, let it be done as you say. That, that is the beginning of this intimacy with God. It's not human intimacy. It's divine intimacy. So she says, I remember that sometimes after renewing these crucifixions, Jesus would say to me, beloved of my heart, I ardently desire not only to crucify your soul and to communicate the pains of the cross to your body, but also to mark your body with the marks of my wound. This is, this the, this is her invisible stigmata. I want to teach you the prayer in order to obtain this grace. Okay, so now here is a prayer given to Louisa in volume one that Jesus wants us to pray. And he says, this is the prayer. I present myself before the supreme throne of God, bathed in the blood of Jesus, praying to Jesus by the merit of his most luminous virtues of his divinity to concede to me the grace to be crucified. Now, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to go through the crucifixion uh, that the saints went through. I, I think what God is going to do is we're going to, each one of us have our own crucifixion, which is according to what we agree to, to, to a greater degree or a lesser degree. And when, when, you, when we get to heaven and when we see what God has shown, he's going to show to us what suffering did how suffering is redemptive, how suffering is needed for uh, the, the sanctification of humanity. We're going to say to Jesus, first of all, let's go. I want to go back to earth to suffer. And Jesus is going to say to us, I gave you the opportunity. I already gave you the opportunity. So let's not lose the grace that God has given to us by worry, fear, anxiety, complaints, negativity, and even sin. We want to say to the Lord, I want what you want. Give to me, Lord. But this, this gift of gifts, this prodigy of prodigies, this great gift of the divine will, that I can have the grace to be crucified, one with you, Jesus, fused with you, Jesus. Volume 2, 9 1999 Father, The father confessor came and he asked me if I had done the obedience after I told him how things had gone, and he renewed the obedience. So this is another reason for... Uh, uh, you're uh, you're a find a priest who can help you enter into this life. The obedience is necessary. See, if you do it on your own, you, you'll never know if this is what you want, the devil wants, or what God wants. But if you're under the obedience of a, of a, of a priest who's your spiritual director, you could say, Father, I'm thinking of this. What do you think? Now, once the priest says yes, or once, like, for example, somebody said to me once, I'm going, I'm not going to eat anything all of Lent for 40 days and for 40 nights. I'm not going to have anything to eat or drink. And I she, he said, can I do that? I said, absolutely not. What are you nuts? <laughs> you know, you don't starve yourself. Well, I want to do what the saints have done. Well, you're not a saint. I'm sorry. You know, and you're going to hurt yourself. See what the evil one will do is try to overwhelm us. Do this, do this. And you got to, you got to know the three voices. The devil's voices, you're no good. 
the 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 Lord's voice is be my be my little child. I will take care of you. Everything will be fine. Our voice is where do I go? Where do I go? The three the confusing confusing voice is what you present to the the spiritual director. I'm I'm thinking of this, but I'm not sure about that. What about this? What do you think of that? And you put it in his hands. And if if the priest says yes, then it's good. If the priest says no, then you say thank you. It, I remember when I when I was in the seminary when I would pray. I'd get to the point of prayer where there would be a Y in the road. This happened continuously for with me. The one was eternal death. The one was physical death. And I, and I didn't know which road was which. And I'm, I'm for, for, for weeks, I was going through this for even, I think months. And finally I said to my spiritual director, I said, I don't know which road to choose. I, if I choose the wrong one, I'm dead. If I choose the wrong road, I'm eternally dead. Which road do I choose? And I, I mean, it was, it was very real. And my spiritual director said, don't pray like that. <laughs> and I went, never thought of that. And so I never, and, and that disappeared. But again, the evil one will try to pull you into misery. The Lord will pull you into happiness and peace and joy. So when the father confessor came and asked, have you done the obedience that I, after I told him how things have gone, he renewed the obedience. What was the obedience? The obedience was basically um, not to listen to Jesus. Now I said that to a couple of people. Uh, they they would they would um, they'd have they have a journal, and I would read the journal, and they'd get to the point in in the journal where they would say dot 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 dot, and I go, that's not God, you know. So I would I would I remember to one person I said I said you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't continue to do this because uh, it'll lead you into hell. Stop listening to the, the this voice. And the person said to me, I love those voices. I says, and I, I and I I'm not going to obey you. And I went, Well, then you're on your own. Got good luck. God bless you. I said, but I'll tell you, if you don't stop listening to the voices, because the voices got more and more and more demonic. And and I said, if you if you don't stop, you, you know, and then she told everybody, Father said, I'm going to hell. Father said, I'm going. And I said, I didn't say that. I said, if you continue to do this, you're, you're, you're not on the path to holiness. You're, you're, Cause everything was getting darker and darker and darker for her. So again, if she had listened, it would have been better for her, but because she couldn't, because it was her, her will, I want to listen to those voices. See, that's the devil too. See, the devil will let you experience something. And then you go, wow, that was really an, like an ecstasy. And that was really good. Uh, I want that. I want that. And then what he does is he leads you away from Jesus, the light, and brings you into darkness, which he can mimic. See, the devil can't create. All he can do is mimic what God says. And, and that happens over, uh, over a, number of, a number of years. That goodness is mimicked into darkness. Like, for example, you know, um, gosh darn, this GD. It's the, you're, you're, you're saying the same thing without realizing it. You know, and, and we have to be free of all that is opposed to God. So even that word, you, 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 it's like, that's not part of my vocabulary anymore. Uh, it's, it's you're, you're learning that he tricks us like hocus pocus. It's, ex, it's, it's uh, a hoc es, uh, um, I can't even think of it. Uh, this is my body in Latin mixed up hocus pocus. It's just hocus pocus. It's just, it's just magic. So our job is hoc est corpus. Thank you. And then, so it's a new beginning that's coming. God is, God is saying to us, you get rid of the negativity. So in your spiritual life, God will free you from negativity. He wants to do that. He needs to do that. And that that's all the jumble words that the devil throws at us. Like, uh, for example, uh, one, one, your underwear, uh, fruit of the loom. It's a mockery of fruit of the womb. It's a mockery. And it's like, I want nothing to do with that. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's keep holy the Sabbath. It's not, a, it's not a sports day. I'm not, I'm not having anything to do with this. I'm not, it's not another Saturday. You, you begin to see clearly what's around you. It's not that you're negative, but you don't want the negative. All I want is the positive. So she says, I would absolutely not converse with Jesus. And my sole and only comfort was Jesus. And that I would drive him away if he came. So that was that was the obedience. 
So having understood what was given to me was true obedience to the to the her spiritual director. In my interior, I said, Fia volnatastua, also in this, let it be done as you say, Jesus. But oh, how much it cost me. What a cruel martyrdom. I feel I have a nail stuck inside my heart that and, and it pierces it through. And since my heart is used to asking, to longing for Jesus continuously, so much so that just as the breathing and the heartbeat are continuous, so does it seem to me that my desiring and wanting my only good is continuous. So wanting to prevent this would be like wanting to prevent somebody from breathing or his heart beating. So see, her whole life was wanting Jesus, desiring Jesus, being with Jesus. So after shedding so many bitter tears for the whole day and night, I found myself as in my usual state, always with my benign Jesus. And he showed up and he said, I, and I forced by obedience, I said to Jesus, Lord, do not come for obedience does not want it. Now you have to understand that might seem cruel, but it was for her, the, 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 the spiritual writer that find out, is this Jesus or not? Is this Jesus or not? And she went through some great suffering. And then Jesus compassionated me and wanted me to strengthen me in my suffering. And I found myself with his creative hands, marked my person with a large sign of the cross and he left. So here the, the stigmata was put into Louisa. So, so then she could show this to her spiritual director and the spiritual director says, okay, okay, Jesus is with you. And he compassionate in me and wanting to strengthen me in the sufferings in which I found myself with his creative hand marked my person with the large sign of the cross and he left me. But who can describe the purgatory I was in, this, this missing of Jesus? That's what purgatory is. They see God and then they have to be punished. They, they still haven't gotten rid of everything in their life that's opposed to God. So that, that's purgatory. You're purged of you know, all of the misery that you've in that you, you, you're not, you're not freed of that. That's why we have let, let purges us of the human loves. Yes. I was forbidden to ask and long for Jesus. She says, and those blessed souls of purgatory are permitted to ask the fling themselves to pour themselves out toward their highest good. They are only prohibited from taking possession of Jesus. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to possess him. That's, that's the divine will. That's this great gift. But no, I was deprived all, all, of also of this comfort. So all night long, I did nothing but cry. So this, this suffering that Luis went through is necessary that we're going to go through. Okay. Volume 3, 8, 3, 1900. And as I was in my usual state, I was longing and searching for my loving Jesus. And when, after waiting him for him for so long, he came and he told me, my daughter, why do you look for me outside of yourself? See, now this is what Jesus is showing us. You, while you could find me more easily within yourself, is Jesus the Lord of your heart? Have you conceived Jesus in your heart? That's what he's saying. When you want to find me, enter into yourself. Go deep into your nothingness. And there, without, you, without yourself, I want you to find the most tiny circle of your nothing, nothingness, and you shall catch sight of the foundations that the divine being has laid within you the factories that he's begun in you look and you will see. So this is the prayer um, where you go into prayer. This is the best time uh, in front of the blessed sacrament in, in front of the monstrance. You will experience yourself as nothing and also experience yourself is filling the whole chapel, filling the whole, the whole parish. It's he wants to see in your nothingness. God is there in, in your littleness. God is there. And you have to experience this and, and to a greater or lesser degree, but you have to begin to know that there's nothing. I have nothing. There's nothing. If I am talented, God gave me an angel. If you're an artist, God gave you an artistic angel. If you're good at math, God gave you an angel of math. We are nothing. And he, he shares with us his divinity. So again, this nothingness is important to know why it's not to look at me. It's to look at God, focused on God, God alone, looking at him, adoring him and loving him and praising him and thanking him and blessing him. And then he says, I want you to see that within yourself where, where God dwells. Volume 4, 2, 9, 29, 1900. 
I went through several days of silence between me and Jesus with a scarce suffering at, at the most. And it seemed that he wanted to continue testing me. He's always testing us to make me exercise a little bit more patience. And here's how. I'd come in, I would say, my beloved, I long for you from heaven. In heaven, the, the, people, the angels in heaven, the saints in heaven, uh, do I await you? And, and, and he would escape like a flash. And then coming back, he would repeat, cease your ardent desires from now and make me, and for you, make me languish continuously to the point of fainting. Other times your ardent love, your yearnings, your refreshments are sadness for my hearts, my heart. So he says, he says, now look, listen to what he's saying. My beloved, I long for you from heaven. In heaven, uh, I, I, I await you. He says, then he said, cease your ardent sighs for now. For you make me languish. Continue. When, when we, he would say to Louisa, Louisa would say, why don't you come to me? I, I long for you. And he says, your languishing gives, brings me to the point of feigning. Why? I can't find anybody who loves me that much. Your ardent love, your yearnings are refreshments for my saddened heart. You know, it's, it's, he, he, this, this, this marriage, this mystical marriage, this, this union with God is, is essential for us as well. And she says, I thought, uh, volume four, nine, 10, 1902. I thought what that blessed Jesus had come back according to his usual way, but what was not my disillusion when after deciding that he was not going to take me for now, he began to make me struggle for seeing him most of the time, like a shadow, like a flash. And then this morning I was feeling very tired and exhausted in my strength for my continuous longing and waiting for Jesus. And he seemed, he came and he transported me outside of myself. See, this is the other thing too. The gift of bilocation is ours. Jesus will take us, he'll transport us outside of ourselves to take us where he wants us to be. Don't be afraid of that. But again, this is why you need spiritual direction. That your spiritual director will show you what this means, why, why he's doing this. And he says, after he transported Louisa outside of himself, he's told Louisa, if you are tired, Come to my heart, drink, and you shall be refreshed. See, the, the, this, you know, this is why some people have, this is mystical language. Why would I drink the blood of Jesus, you know, from his heart? It's, this is our life. We want, we want his blood flowing in our veins. You know, we're talking spiritually. You shall be refreshed. So I drew near the heart of Jesus and I drank in large cups gulps a milk mixed with the most sweet blood. You see what he's saying? It's like, as the mother feeds her child, I'm going to feed you. After this, he told me the prerogatives of love are three. Constant love is number one. And then strong love, is number two. And then love of God and neighbor is bound together, number three. This is the prerogatives of love. It's threefold. Constant love. How, how many times have you said to Jesus, I love you today? I adore you. I praise you. That, that's if all you could say in front of the blessed sacrament, when you're looking at Jesus in the monster and says, I love you. Jesus says, my heart is overflowing. Constant love, strong love. I love you more than anything on earth. And then the love of neighbor, God and neighbor bound together. If these prerogatives, Jesus says, do not appear in your soul. One can say that her, her soul is not the quality of true love. So think about that. When you're in front of the blessed sacrament, here's three things, right? Constant love, right? Strong love, love, like love of God and neighbor. This, Jesus says, I want to see this in you. Discipline yourself to have this, this constant love. Throughout the day, when you look at a tree, do you say, oh, that's a nice tree? Or do you say, thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this love that you're showing me. See, that, that's the round of creation. And then we get into the round of redemption. Volume 4, 11, 10, 1900. The most perfect love is the true trust one must have in the beloved. Have you, have you, do you say to Jesus, you're my beloved? Do you say to the Blessed Mother, you're, you're my beloved? Did you say to Louisa, you're my beloved? Jesus marrying Louisa. It was, it was in the Old Testament, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. In the New Testament, it's been Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Now in the this testament to come, this new and divine way of holiness, it's Jesus, Mary, and Louisa. 
Do you have true trust in the one who is the beloved? And even if you, you, he, it should appear the object that one love is lost, you don't see Jesus more than ever. It is time to prove living trust. And this is the easiest means to take possession of that which one ardently loves. Jesus, I trust in you. You're having difficulty in your family. Jesus, I trust in you. You're having difficulty with your health. Jesus, I trust in you. You have difficulty with your, your, your finances. Jesus, I trust in you. It's a new and divine way of holiness is here. And we'll be back in 15 minutes, okay? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Celso. Um, Father has asked that during our breaks that we watch the uh, clergy presentation on the divine will. So we will watch the first half of part one right now. Fiat. Greetings, your eminences and reverend fathers. Welcome to part one of the divine will presentation for bishops and priests. This presentation will introduce the life and the background of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, and her most notable work, her diary entitled The Book of Heaven, which contains private revelation and instructions from the Lord himself to Luisa Picaretta. The first part of this presentation will explain the current stance of our Holy Mother Church on Luisa Picaretta's writings and the spirituality behind the divine will. Also, the status of the ongoing process of Luisa's beatification and canonization. The second part of this presentation will explore what saints and others have said about Luisa in her writings. In the final part of this presentation, we will explore the roles of bishops and priests regarding the doctrine of the divine will and give suggestions on how its teachings can be disseminated. Now, let us get into the background of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. We will refer to a couple of biographies written about Luisa Picaretta and view a brief video clip from a documentary interview with the late Archbishop Giovanni Battista Picchieri who is involved with her ongoing beatification process and familiarize you with a couple of key individuals who were directly involved with her during her lifetime. In 2014, the Vatican Press published a biography about Luisa titled The Son of My Will, which was written by the author Maria Del Genio. The synopsis of the biography provided by the Vatican Library goes, quote, Luisa Picaretta, the apostle of the divine will, is known by now almost all over the world. Her message to go from doing God's will to living in God's will on earth as it is in heaven is groundbreaking for her time. In this book, ample space is devoted to documented events in Luisa's life with the hope of contributing to a clearer understanding of her life and message, end quote. Here is a brief video clip from a 2015 interview of the late Archbishop Picchieri on this biography and the cause of Luisa Picaretta. Here we have reached a milestone with the biography which was written by a professor. The professor Maria Rosaria del Genio, competent in this case, over which she labored and documented very well. She knew nothing about Luisa, but she could not write without documenting and through this very accurate documentation. She has produced the biography which has been edited by the Vatican Press. We now have already the translations in three languages, Italian, Spanish, and in English. Many who are reading this biography feel even more enamored of this creature, Luisa.
However, there are the writings, the diaries, the 36 diaries that she wrote under obedience, which see, speak precisely of the message of the divine volition. So here are these writings, which we have, we could say, the character of a writer like Louisa, as she could have done them, and which are not very sophisticated. Yet they are the most precious content, which needs to be read well and pondered well. At one time they were preserved by the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, but then my predecessor, Bishop Carmelo Cassati, requested them and now we have them again. We have read these writings and they are now diffused throughout the world. And we could say with an expansiveness which even amazes us. However, we're also aware that for the process of beatification and canonization, it is necessary to interpret them well, because the writings of Louisa have been interpreted badly at times, and therefore have caused obstacles in recognizing the holiness and above all the genuine spirituality of the divine will. For now, we have undertaken a thorough examination of the writings, we could say a, a critical study, and this is going forward over time. We have already arrived at examining 15 of the, the diaries, the volumes. The others still remain because there are 36 diaries. But we have confidence at arriving at this goal so that the church, and that is the congregation of the causes of the saints and the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, which are in collaboration, can have in their hands the authentic instrument which came from the hands of Louisa. And we can say that one can find in these writings that which is truly contained within them, regardless of the handwriting, regardless of the errors in grammar. But what really matters is to gather the substance. And the substance is essentially this an authentic commentary on the prayer of Jesus, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray and we encourage the same servant of God that she would make everyone know and help everyone to pray well the Our Father, not just to recite it. And we want to inspire her to help everyone to know how to truly find oneself again in the will of God. As the Son, Jesus Christ, is found in the will of the Father, and how all the disciples of our Lord Jesus, who prece precedes us in the faith, are found in the will of the Father. Since that time, those responsible for Luisa Picaretta's writings have completed the final studies of the volumes and are expected to finish the official edition of the writings within the very near future. Padre Bernardino Giuseppe Bucci affectionately known as Padre Bucci, also has established a biography about Luisa Picaretta. Here are some facts about Luisa's life drawn from his biography. Luisa Picaretta was born in Corrado in the province of Bari, Italy on April 23rd of 1865 and died there in the odor of sanctity on March 4th, 1947. Luisa Picaretta was declared a servant of God by the Catholic Church on March 7, 1994. And during the many visitations from our Lord to Luisa, our Lord gave Luisa the title, the Little Daughter of the Divine Will. Luisa Picaretta became a Dominican tertiary as a teenager. Padre Bucci describes Luisa as a chosen soul, a seraphic bride of Christ, humble and devout, whom God had endowed with extraordinary gifts. An innocent victim, a lightning conductor of divine justice, bedridden for 62 years without interruption. She was the herald of the kingdom of the divine will. 
During Padre Bucci's infancy, Luisa carried him in her arms and prophesied over him that he would become the priest of the family and not his brother, who was the favorite son. According to Padre Bucci, his aunt Rosario Bucci was Luisa's caretaker for 40 years and was the first promoter of her cause after Luisa's death and would even visit the Saint Padre Pio to seek his advice and endorsement regarding her cause. Padre Bucci specialized in missionary theology and co-founded the Association of the Divine Will with Sister Asunta Marigliano. He served as the spiritual advisor of the association, which was canonically erected in Corrado on March 4th, 1987. He also served on the tribunal for the cause for beatification of Luisa Picaretta, which began in 1994. Padre Bucci was the only person officially authorized by Archbishop Picchetti to speak in the United States about the cause and spirituality of Luisa Picaretta. Here are a few quotes taken from Padre Bucci that emphasize the importance of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Quote, in the new millennium, the world and the church are going to focus on Luisa Picaretta and the divine will, end quote. Quote, Luisa's doctrines are not from earth, but from heaven. You need to understand that Luisa wrote with the light of the church's authority, end quote. Quote, it would be as foolish for a lay person to stand at the altar and say, this is my body, as it would be for them to teach the divine will, end quote. Quote, Jesus said, the divine will is the sacrament of sacraments. All the world will become Catholic. Luisa is the starting point. Always remember this, end quote. Finally, quote, our duty is exactly this, a correct interpretation of the writings of Picaretta in the light of the magisterium of the church. This is the precise will of this soul, all of God, and very faithful and very obedient daughter of the church, end quote. Rosario Bucci was Luisa's faithful and silent confidant who lived with Luisa and assisted Luisa for 40 years. Aunt Rosaria, as Padre Bucci often refers to her as, was the sister of Padre Bucci's father. Luisa said to Rosaria, you will be my witness. After Luisa's death, Rosaria diligently promoted Luisa's cause under the spiritual guidance of Saint Padre Pio who encouraged her, saying, quote, Rosa, go ahead, go ahead, for Luisa is great and the world will be full of Luisa, end quote. After the venerated Padre Pio's death, Rosaria made known to Padre Bucci that during her confession, Padre Pio told her that Luisa is not a human factor, that she is a work of God himself and that he himself will make her emerge. The world will be astounded at her greatness, and not many years will pass before this happens. The new millennium will see Luisa's light." End quote. Padre Bucci strongly believed that when Rosario Bucci passed away, Luisa Picaretta personally took her soul at the moment of her death. This belief was based on reports from women who noticed unusual signs, like a radiant light and a sweet fragrance emanating from Rosaria's body. The confirmation of this extraordinary event came when, during the customary second burial ceremony at the cemetery, Aunt Rosaria's coffin was opened and she appeared as if peacefully asleep. Instead of the usual scent of death, a gentle and sweet fragrance surrounded her. This was such a remarkable occurrence 
that it drew the attention of all the family members and the acquaintances present who wanted to touch and kiss her body. Okay, so we'll, we'll begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Our Lady, Queen of all saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Listening to what was just on, I, it's so it's so good to uh, think about Father Bucci, uh, a great a great priest, um, faithful to Luisa and what her wishes were. Um, you know, Father, but just a clue. Father Bucci was the first one to read uh, after Luisa, after Aunt Rosaria. He was she was the first one to read um, uh, Volume thirty five and thirty six, and he he studied that. And he was the one that presented it to Archbishop Karata. He said to him, you've got to read this. <laughs> and Archbishop Karata, who studied Louisa um, even before um, uh, as a seminarian, because their, their spiritual director was in, infatuated by Louisa. And as a, as a seminarian, Archbishop Karata studied Louisa. Uh, he, was, he was thrilled with this. And he let somebody read the writings at that point and... Uh, the, the person took the writings and they're still not back in, in the Vatican, but one day they will be nothing to fear, nothing to be anxious, anxious about. Um, everything has to come back home. If you want to say for it then to be presented and, and everyone will understand this, especially, especially with the illumination of conscience. I think people will begin to understand that uh, God has great plans and we're in them and, but he needs us to cooperate. That's, that's the most thing. So we're continuing uh, this. Uh, uh, Jesus is talking about uh, trust. Uh, so yeah, like what we just said in volume 4, 11, 10, 1900, the most pure, perfect love is in the true trust in the beloved. And that's what we want. We want to truly trust Jesus and Mary. And if it should appear that the object of the loved one is gone, e even more than ever, it's time to prove your living trust in Jesus. And this is why God in his wisdom had uh, Pope uh, John Paul II ask in the 80s that everyone have Eucharistic adoration. Go back to our prisoner of love. Go back to spend time with our Eucharistic Lord. Uh, the more that we fall in love with our Eucharistic Lord, the more we begin to understand this first bread the second bread, the super substantial bread of the Holy Eucharist is given to us. Why? Jesus says to prepare us for the perennial communion that's coming. So he says, more than ever, it is time to prove this living trust. This means this is the easiest way to take possession of that which ardently loves. So what is what is the divine will? The divine will is to ardently love God. Volume 4, 12, 23, 1900. This morning on coming, Jesus told me, my beloved what do you want to tell me that you so much yearn to speak with me? And I, feeling all ashamed, said, my sweet Jesus, I want to tell you that I ardently yearn for you and for your holy will to be done in me on earth as it is in heaven. And if you concede this to me, Louisa says, you shall make me fully content, fully happy. I yearn for you, Jesus, and I want your holy divine will. This will make me fully happy. And he added, in one word, you have grasped everything, that by asking me for what is the greatest in heaven and on earth, and I, what is greatest in heaven and on earth is the holy divine will of God. I want you to yearn for it. I want to comfort you more and to conform you more to doing, living in the divine will. So the Lord knows what he has planned. He's offering it to us. And he says, when you accept this, he says, you're going to be fully content, fully happy. This is the greatest thing in, in heaven and on earth. And, and he says, the more you yearn for it, I want to con conform you more to it. And so my sweet volition may be more sweet and enjoyable for you. Place yourself in the circle of my divine will. Okay, what's the circle of your divine will? It's your heart, your mind, your soul. Enter into the Jesus has to be the, your, your, your everything. 
You want to conceive Jesus in your heart, the circle of love in your heart. He says, and admire its different divine qualities. Now that's what we did when we went through the, the uh, divine attributes uh, that God breathed into Louisa. The, these, these titles that Jesus gave to Louisa. He wants to see that in us as well. Those 8,000 titles, when you go through it, Jesus says, how much do you have of this in you? 36, 30%, 60%, 100%. What do you have in you? It doesn't mean we go around patting ourselves, look at me. I have. No, in your littleness, only, you only can have these titles in your nothingness. When nothing else is there but this and this alone, he says, I want that sweet and enjoyable life in you. I want to place you in the circle of my divine will. And I want to admire in you the different divine qualities, pausing now at the sanctity of my volition, now at the goodness of my holy divine will, now at the humility of the divine will, now at the beauty of the divine will, now at the peaceful dwelling of my divine will produces in your soul. It's Jesus. It's Mary. And these are pausings, he says, and we're in a pause right now with, with the divine will. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to be <gasps> complaining about. These pausings shall make you acquire even more new and divine, unheard of uh, lessons of my holy divine will. So think about it. When you go through these 8,000 titles and you pause and you listen and meditate just on one of these titles, it, it's this is what God wants to have dwell in you. How close are you to what God is asking of you in, in your nothingness, in your hiddenness? And these pausing shall make you acquire ever more new and unheard of news about my holy divine will, these lessons. And you shall become so bound and so enamored with these lessons that you will never go out of the divine will again. You will never worry. You'll never be fearful. You'll never be anxious. You'll never be complaining. You'll, you'll never be negative. You'll never be doubting. And you're going to be filled with peace, joy, and happiness. This is what this is what I found in the book of heaven. And, and there's no need, there's no need to fall back into the misery of the human will with our worry, fear, anxiety, complaints, negativity, and sin. He says, I don't want you to leave that. So as you begin to enter into this pausing, studying, learning these lessons, these truths that Jesus gave to Louisa, it's everything is great. Volume 4, 126, 19, 2. Just as God loves mankind as part of himself, as a particle that came out of God, so that you see, to see the littleness of us, he ardently desires that this part of himself return back to into himself. He wants us to return to participate in this, not to be separate from God. So does the Queen Mother. By participating in this love, Mankind now with this passionate love of God. Where do we get this passionate love of God? From Jesus, the new Adam, from Mary, the new Eve, that's been breathed into the newborn Louisa. This is why we're, we're calling this, this new era from this day on a new and divine way of holiness. This new and divine way of holiness is given to all the world. And our God, our God is asking us, pleading with us to begin to live this abundant life. So volume four, 327, 1902. Finding myself outside of myself, Jesus says. I found myself outside of myself. So finding myself outside of myself. So this is this is the bilocation that God is going to give us. He, we're going to be here, but we're He's going to teach us more that is that is even more, more exciting. I went in search of my most sweet Jesus. And while praying my round, round of creation, round of redemption. I saw Jesus in the arms of the queen mother and as tired as I was, see, you see, she, at this time, Jesus was saying, don't sleep as tired as I was all daring. I almost snatched Jesus and I took Jesus into my arms. Now, what does that mean? He's the little newborn and she, he, she as mother grabs, grabs Jesus again, after she went through those nine excesses of love for nine months, her reward was holding the baby Jesus uh, at Christmas. We, now if we have a, a little statue of, of Jesus, we can hold the baby Jesus as well. And Jesus says, he says, if even when you kiss the statue, kiss the cross, he says, even though it's an inanimate object, he says, your intention is that you love me and I will accept it as you're actually kissing me. Jesus says that's, that's divine. That's, that's divine. 
So again, um, Jesus shows us. She's, she says to Jesus, my love, if this is your promise that you would not leave me when in the past you have barely come at all. He says, Jesus says to Louisa, Louisa, I was with you. Only you have not seen me with clarity. So we're going to get the, the vision, if you want to say, our sight, seeing clearly where Jesus is. Had your desires been so ardent as to burn the veil that prevented you from seeing me, you would have certainly seen me. So what is he saying? We're veiled at this point because we haven't seen clearly. How, how can we see clearly? He says, it's your ardent desire to see Jesus. Now, how many of you have said every single day, and I mean, every single day, Jesus, I long to see you. I want to see you. So what does he say? He says, to see me, you must be purified. To see me, you must live in purity of heart, mind, and soul. What does that mean? It goes back to, let's just think of the television. Somebody was telling me, oh, I, I like my, my programs, but those commercials are terrible. I think they're always there. They're always there. I said, stop watching TV. Well, what about my programs? <laughs> well, you're being programmed. You're being programmed to accept all that is evil. So what God is asking of you is burn that veil so you can see Jesus clearly. What's the veil? You're, you're, you're not loving him enough. You're not desiring him enough to see him. How many hours have you spent in front of the Blessed Sacrament looking at Jesus, falling in love with Jesus in the monstrance? Have you seen him yet? That's what Jesus is saying. He says, had your desires been so ardent to burn the veil that prevented you from seeing me, you would certainly have seen me, Jesus says. Those are the words of Jesus to us. Volume 5, 310, 1903. In my wounds, in my blood, I saw nations being saved and the good that creatures would receive. And my sacred heart, feeling instead of feeling tiredness, felt divine joy and ardent desire to suffer more so humanity would come back to me. So this is the sign that one suffers. It's participation in my pains. What are you going through physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally? Are you saying, Jesus, I'm doing this one with you in your suffering? So this is the sign that of what one suffers in participation of my pains, that there is a suffering united with joy to suffer. I'm doing this, Lord, so that you can come down from the cross for one, one more, one second, that you can, you can be, you can be filled with someone taking your place even for a, for a second. More than in operating, for one operates for me and does not look at what he does, but the glory he gives to God at the fruit he has received. So what Jesus is saying is, have you said to Jesus this in your, your suffering, when you stub your toe, thank you, Jesus, that I can suffer with you. When you get a sliver, thank you, Jesus, that I have this sliver. You know, it's Jesus is saying, are, 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 are we focusing on him, our beloved? Are we looking at the beloved's? Are we focusing on what they have given to us? Volume 7, 624, 1906. After I told the father confessor what, what is written above, the, the priest got upset for he absolutely wanted me to oppose the Lord because obedience did not want it. Now, what was that? This is the suffering that Jesus asked Louisa. And she presented it to the priest. And the priest said, no, absolutely not. You're not to do this. As for myself, I was feeling worse as though the many privations of blessed Jesus that had burned me to the quick over and over made me long for heaven. See that, that suffering that Jesus, uh, that Louisa would say fiat to made her long for heaven. She's seen things from a divine perspective. I felt my poor humanity vividly as if kept grumbling against obedience. What was, why was the, what was the obedience? She, she, the priest would say, don't, don't, I don't want you to suffer anymore. I felt my poor humanity as if under a press and I could not make up my mind. In the meantime, our Lord came with an arc of light in his hand and, and, a, and a scythe, a seed came out, the, the, the scythe cutting wheat came out, also of light that touched the ark and blessed Jesus, that blessed Jesus held in his hands and the ark, as the ark was touched, this ark of light, this, this, this cutting down, 
It remained absorbed in Christ and he disappeared without giving me the time to tell what obedience wanted. And I understood that the ark was my soul and the sigh was death. Remember I told you about getting to that point of one was eternal death, one was physical death. See, this death, the three days of darkness as God says to death, come to earth and take what's yours and leave. We have to go through the three days of darkness. But we're not to look at the darkness. That's what, that's what the saints have said. Your soul has to die to all that is human. Okay, all that is human. That's why we have Lent. What are you going to give up this Lent that your, your soul, your, your humanity wants? It's, it's to deny that. Why? So that, so that you can get clo closer to God. Now, that's why you need a spiritual director. If, if you're doing this on your own, as uh, St. Saint, Saint Teresa, uh, Teresa of Avila says, if you, if you are your own spiritual director, you'll, 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 you'll direct yourself into hell. Because we're very good at uh, not keeping a promise. How do we know? What was your New Year's resolution? Here, we're, we're going into the fourth uh, Sunday of Lent. What was your Lenten resolution? We're always starting over. Why? Because we're fallen humans redeemed by Jesus and Mary, but not yet sanctified. So we're, we're going to fall continuously. And it's always to go back. Okay, what did I promise at the beginning of the year? What did I promise at the beginning of Lent? Let, let's get back to it. When you, when you fail... And you, you fall into sin and you go to confession and each of it, that should be part of our life. Our Catholic life is going to confession. Go, go to confession. You, at that point, you are happy. You are full of grace at that point. God gave us the sacraments and the sacramentals in the Holy Church. How great our God is. Volume 8, 12, 25, 1908. Finding myself in my usual state, I was longing for little baby Jesus. And after many hardships, he made himself seen in my interior as a little baby. And he told me, my daughter, Louisa, the best way to make me be born in your heart. See, we, we want to conceive Jesus. Now he wants us to be born. Is to empty yourself of everything. Because finding empty space, I, God, can place all of my goods in your heart, your mind, your soul. I can fill you with the divine rather than with a human. And only then can I remain forever in your heart if there is room to be able to carry all that belongs to Jesus, all that is my own, Jesus says. So we want to conceive Jesus in our heart. And when we do our acts and our rounds in the divine will, it's a, it's a molecule that's added to the life of Jesus. Okay, why? He wants to be born in us. He wants to gaze in our gazing, speak in our speaking, listen in our listening. He said, I made the senses for, for God. He wants to reign in us. He wants to walk in our walking, dance in our dancing, sing in our singing. He wants to be the Lord of everything in, in our heart, mind, and soul. He wants us to give birth to him, not like Our Lady, but with, his, with our eyes, with our ears. If Jesus is with you in the divine will, in your family, your family is filled with peace why Jesus is there. Mary is there. The new Adam and the new Eve through the little newborn, Louisa. I remain in your heart forever because there's room in your heart because you're doing your acts and your rounds. All that belongs to me and all that is my own is within you. Seek Jesus within. When you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What's, what's the greatest image of Our Lady on earth? It's Our Lady, the divine indwelling. What's what? It's to overflowing. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Volume eleven, the Good Morning to Jesus. If you haven't done this yet with Volume eleven, this is something to do when you wake up in the morning. She woke up. Oh my Jesus, my sweet prisoner of love, here I am before you again. I left you saying good goodbye, good night. And now I come back saying, good morning, Lord. Do we wake up refreshed saying to the Lord, good morning, Lord. I was anxiously burning to see you again in this prison of love. This is the Holy Eucharist. To give you my yearnings, 
my affections, my heartbeats, my ardent desires, and all of myself in order to transfuse myself completely in you, Jesus, to abandon all of myself in you, Jesus, in a perpetual memory and pledge of my love towards you, Jesus. Is Jesus our beloved? Is that the first thing we think in the morning? Jesus, I want to do my prevening act. I want everything that I think, say, and do today, one with you, Jesus, breathing in my breathing, beating in my heart beating, to adore God and to love God and praise God. With everything I think, say, and do, with my intellect, memory, and will, I want to do everything in the holy divine will. This is my desire, my sweet prisoner of love. See, we have to fall in love with Jesus in order to fall in love with Jesus. 511, 2, 14, 19, 12. In my all, all things hold each other's hands. All look alike. All are accord, in accord with God. Therefore, suffering gives place to pleasure and says, I have done my part in the will of God. Now you do yours. This is, this is, this is what Jesus is saying. Suffering gives place to pleasure. Okay. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's, Lord, I know you're using this to bring everyone into the into heaven. You asked Louisa to stand in the breach. As you asked Moses to stand in the breach for the Israelites, you're now asking Louisa to stand in the breach for all the children of God. And then he's saying to us, would you stand in the breach? Standing in the breach is suffering, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional. He says, I have done my part in the will of God. Now you do yours. And if only Jesus wants it, it shall, I, God, shall enter the field again. Fervor says to coldness, you shall be more ardent than me. You shall content yourself with staying in the will of God, in the will of my eternal love. With more, with more ardent love, you're going to say, I'm going to stay in the will of God. I'm not going to be worried today. I'm not going to be anxious today. I'm not going to complain. That's nailed to the cross with Jesus. It does not belong to me. And then God goes, really? What about this situation? What about that situation? What are you going to do, do about this? Let's think, of the, let's think of the children. Let's think of the grandchildren. You're going to be worried about this? You're going to be anxious? What are you going to do? It's, I'm going to stay in your will, Lord. I'm going to enter into your eternal love with total confidence. I trust in you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. Be their Lord. Be their Savior. They're not going to listen to me, but they can listen to you, Lord, because you are their God. <laughs> Jesus, I trust in you. I believe in you. I hope in you. I have confidence in you. Volume 11, 316, 19, 13. My daughter, when the soul prays with fervor, it increases, it, it, it's, it is incense with smoke. On the other hand, when the soul prays feeling cold, there's the, you're, you're, you get up in the morning and you just go, oh, another day. You're, you're, this is praying with cold. Without allowing anything extraneous to me to enter herself, it's incense without smoke. Both of them are pleasing to me, Jesus says. But the incense without smoke pleases me more. Okay? You don't have that fervor. You wake up and you're, you're, you're aching. You wake up and you're, you're, you're tired. You wake up and you say, Lord Jesus, even in this, there's no incense. There's no smoke. I, I offer this up to you. Both are pleasing to me, but the incense without smoke pleases me more because smoke always causes some bother to the eyes. So what is Jesus is saying? I love, I love it when your fervor, he says, he says, but it's, it, there's a human fervor there, which is, it causes irritation to the eyes. But when you wake up and you're aching, you, you're, you're, you're physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, not all there, and you say, Lord, I begin this day. Well, I was told by uh, a Carmelite a long time ago, um, you pray whether you want to or not. You pray whether you want to or not. And I don't feel like praying today. Pray. <laughs> the, the old saying about Eucharistic adoration, if you can't spend an hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament, God is telling you to spend two hours. If you can't spend an hour, you're not, it's, it's, you're, you, you, Jesus says you got to be there two hours. So what do people do? People get there late for their hour. 
and then they leave early. Well, I put in 58 minutes. I'm pretty good. No, Jesus says, <laughs> what I've seen, what I've experienced is the miracles happen at the last 30 seconds of that hour. Why? He says, you really stayed here an hour. Look what I'm going to do for you. The others came in. They're here every, every, every day. But they come in a little late and they leave a little early. It's the same thing for receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. That 15 minutes is to adore God and love God. That's why Holy Mass ends, right? Once you receive Holy Communion, it's to fall in love with Jesus. It doesn't matter if everybody's in fellowship out there. That's nice. That's, that's a Protestant understanding. The Catholic understanding after receiving communion is to fall on your knees and adore him and to love him and to praise him and to thank in the name of everyone and everything past, present, and future. You hear laughing and shouting as you're kneeling in silence. You're saying, Jesus, I want all this to praise you, all this noise to adore you, all this. I want, to, I want everyone to be spiritually on their knees, praising you and loving you and glorifying you. It's not to turn around and give them the evil eye. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Don't you know you're supposed to be holy like me? No, it's Lord, you're, you're, you're filled with peace. You're filled with joy. And all the noise is God saying, turn that all to me, all praise. Again, you can change the world by falling in love with Jesus. Again, I'm very, very clear. I, as I was feeling the same way, lovable Jesus told me, my daughter, ice in my will is more ardent than fire. The coldness. See that? Remember Jesus says, be hot or cold. Be hot or cold. If you're, if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out. Where does that come from? There was, there was the sea and there was the mountains. Okay. The mountains are cold. The sea is warm. But in the middle, there's a swamp. You can't drink that. You can drink the water, the cold water, or, or the warm water that's cooked on the stove, but the swamp water you can't drink. I'll vomit you out, Jesus says. If you're indifferent, ice in my well is more ardent than fire. What impressed? What would impress you the most? To see ice that has the virtue of burning and destroying anything they may touch it, or fire turning things into fire? He says certainly the ice that will that will set it on fire. You're, it doesn't matter how you feel. You, you do your duty. You say to God, my Lord, my Savior, my Master, my King, I ache all over, but I adore you. I love you. I praise you. I thank you. I bless you. In the name of everyone and everything past, present, and future, I will read the book of heaven, even though I'm tired. I want to be consumed with your love, Lord. God goes, good, good. This suffering that you're going through is good. Look what it's going to do. It's going to set the world on fire. Your family changes as you read the book of heaven when you're tired. The world changes. Every word that you read, Jesus says, is a divine life. And as you read that word, humanity is experiencing the love of God, getting the world ready for the illumination of conscience, getting the world ready for the three days of darkness. You want to know what the illumination of conscience is? Keep on reading the book of heaven. What does Jesus say? The greatest thing I could give to humanity is that they know who they are and who I am. That's the book of heaven. What's the three, what's the three days of darkness? God is going to show you who you are and who he is. Where did we find this? In the book of heaven. I am 11, 7, 28, 19, 15. Jesus I, Jesus says, I place the pains that I suffer where I am. No, this is uh, to, <laughs> I, Jesus says, place the pains that I suffer when I am without you, like a crown around your heart in order to prevent the offenses of creatures of entering into your heart and to prevent you from con condemning any soul to hell. I, this is Louisa, Jesus, I place all the sufferings that you have given me. And like a crown around your heart in me in order to prevent the offenses of humanity entering into your sacred heart to prevent you from condemning any soul to hell. You, you worry about your family? Pray this prayer. The pains that I suffer when I am without you are like a crown of thorns around your heart in order to prevent the offenses of humanity from entering my, my family from entering into your heart 
and to prevent you, Lord, from condemning any soul to hell. But with all this, my Jesus, I still feel my nature being upset. This is the human. And I incessantly call you, Lord. I search for you, Lord. I long for you, Lord. Is that our life? Searching for God, calling on God, longing for God. At that moment, my level with Jesus extended his arms around my neck and clasped me, told me, my daughter, tell me, what do you desire? What do you want to do? What do you love? And what, what, what does she say? She says, I desire you, Lord. I desire that all souls be saved, Lord. I want to do your will, Lord. I want to love you alone, Lord. Is that our echo? If it isn't, write it down. When you go in front of the Blessed Sacrament, kneel and say this to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, I desire you. Jesus, Jesus, I desire all souls to be saved. Jesus, Jesus, I want to do your will. Jesus, Jesus, I love you alone. And mean it. You are beginning to fall in love with God. And he says, so you desire what I want. <laughs> this, this is how the Lord responds to us. So you really want this, huh? With this, you hold me in your power. And I hold you. And I could not detach yourself from me. Nor can I from you. And you can say then that I have left you. I am not with you. You are all alone. You desire what I want. And you hold me in your power. And I hold you, Jesus says, and I can't, I can't go away from you. And you say, how have you left me? Why have you left me? See, this abandonment of Jesus, he says to Louisa, I do this because I don't see anybody loving me. I don't see anybody longing for me. I don't see anybody that wants me. And when you do this, Louisa, I am with you. I am in your interior. That's what we have to discover in us. Is Jesus reigning in us? Is he the Lord of our life? Is he the King of Kings in our life? Volume 11, 12, 14, 19, 16. The creature escapes from my lap and trying to detach herself from my arms in which I hold her tight. She goes in search of vigil. Vigils are passions. Vigils are, are sin and attachments and pleasures. Vigils Vigil the fears, the anxieties, the agitations. See, I hold you tight in my arms. But when you detach yourself, you go in search of your passions, sin, attachments, pleasures, fears, anxieties, agitations. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be there anymore. I want you to be in my arms. When you go to bed at night, do you say to Jesus, I want to be your little newborn in your arms, Jesus? As, as you held Louisa in your arms. I want this, Lord. I don't want the world. What's the world? Passions, sins, attachments, pleasures, fears, anxieties, agitations. I don't want that. So as much as I long for the soul, I call the soul to rest in me. Have you, have you read the, the section on uh, resting in the arms of Jesus? As a little newborn, have you read that yet? He says, well, if you rest in me, he says, you're listening to me. When you don't rest in me, you're not listening to me. This is the great offense that affront to my love, uh, an affront to my love that the creature takes into no consideration. She gives that a thought to repair for it. Are you in the arms of Jesus for your family? Is your family, are you bringing with you your family in the arms of Jesus? You're not... You're not, he says, you're not even thinking to repair with what your family's doing, what your friends are doing, what your nations are doing, what humanity has done from Adam on, even though we've been redeemed in 2000 years ago. This is why I wanted to sleep. I wanted to give satisfaction to the father for the rest that souls do not take in the father and repaying the father for everyone. While sleeping, I impetrate a true rest for all of humanity, make myself the vigil of each heart in order to free them of the vigil of sin, 
Again, free them of the vigil of their passions, their sin, their attachments, their pleasures, their fears, their anxieties, their agitations. At night, be rest in the arms of Jesus. Be a little newborn in the arms of Jesus, one with Louisa. She's the one that did this. You're having trouble sleeping at night? Begin the habit of falling in love with Jesus as a little newborn in the arms of, of, the, of Jesus. Why? So that you can give true rest to all of humanity, making each vigil and each heart, freeing them from sin, bringing them back to God. If I am 12, Luis is speaking, 12, 6, 1917. How true it is that what you say, that in your divine will, one wants nothing. One wants to know nothing. If one wants to do something, it is because you, Lord, have done it. One feels the ardent desire to repeat what you, Lord, have done. Everything disappears. One does not want to do anything anymore except for what Jesus did. Jesus, breathe in my breathing. Jesus, beat in my heart beating. Be Jesus, walk in my walking. Jesus, cook in my cooking. Jesus, work in my working. I don't want to do anything human anymore. I want to do what you did, Lord. I want you to reign in me. And Jesus says, and I make the soul do everything. I give the soul everything. It's Jesus in us that's doing it. When somebody says, I'm doing my divine acts in the divine will. No, you're not. You have no, who are you? <laughs> who are you? It should be Jesus and Mary reigning in us. Jesus, I want to do everything that you've done. Jesus, breathe in my breathing. Jesus, walk in my walking. Jesus, sing in my singing. Jesus, dance in my dancing. That's what I want. I want the true life of Jesus and Mary in me. That's the life of Louisa. This is the new and divine way of holiness. I'm not going to, I don't want to do anything in a saintly way, good way or holy way. That's volume one through volume 10. I want to learn how to do things in volume 11 through 19, how to live the divine will through the power of the Holy Spirit. This, this great Pentecost that's coming. I want to start living it now. Why? So that I can do 20, volume 20 through volume 36, how to enter into the divine inheritance of the Father. The divine inheritance of the Father. This is what Adam lost. This is the life of Jesus and Mary. A new Adam and a new Eve. God is now breathing into us, if we wish. Volume 12, 1, 2, 19, 19. My ardent love is for the salvation of souls that will place an echo on all my pains, all my sufferings. Echoing God. My ardent love, Jesus says, is for the salvation of souls, place an echo on all the sufferings of Jesus and Mary. Uh, an echo of love. So what we say, you stub your toe, Jesus I want this to be an echo of you walking to Calvary, stubbing your toe. You, you, you cut your hand, Lord. I want this to be uh, 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 an echo of love as you were scourged, as you were nailed. It's everything. Our memory has to be of Jesus and Mary. So the three powers, intellect, you've got to begin to see things from a divine perspective. How do you do this? Read the book of heaven. And then what? then enter into the true life of Jesus, the true life of Mary. The sacred scriptures come alive. Our dogma and doctrine come alive. This, what the saints have done comes alive in us. Why? He's leading us to sanctification on earth as it is in heaven. It's the fulfillment of the Our Father. And then finally, 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 may your will be done in me on earth as it is in heaven. I don't want my human will in charge. I want to use my free will to choose to live in your holy divine will, Jesus your holy divine will, Mary, and that you breathed into little Louisa. I want this. Volume 12, 129, 1919. The soul is incapable of comprehending my divine work altogether. Therefore, I, God, keep manifesting myself little by little in the book of heaven. Little by little. And, and again, when you read the book of heaven, this is the great part. It's a map it's, it's, it's a, a, a blueprint of what's coming. It, as you begin to read this, everything begins, the doors begin to open. You begin to see from a divine perspective. You begin to see with the mind of Christ. Your memory isn't of you. Your memory becomes the Holy Rosary. 
Yet you begin to, you begin every mystery. What did Jesus do? What did Mary do? I want to be part of that. And then finally, 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 your human will is, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I don't want to do it my way anymore. I want to do it your way. Your will be done in me on earth as it is in heaven. Fiat mihi. Let it be done to me as you say. Fiat voluntas tua. May your kingdom come and reign in me on earth as it is in heaven. Little by little, Jesus is manifesting this. He says, and then Louisa, from your link of connection with me, Jesus and Mary, other links of humanity shall be connected. My family's getting connected closer to Jesus. Every word that I read, why? He is doing it. That word, Jesus says that he speaks as the word of God is a divine life. It's affecting all the world. The world can't be changed anymore. You've heard nothing can stop what's coming. It's going to be biblical. That's the book of heaven. People are saying things that they don't even aren't even aware of. Great things are coming. Amazing things are going to happen. And then Jesus said, I, God, shall have crowds of soul, souls who living in my divine will shall redo all the acts of the humanity as Jesus did. And, and I shall have the glory of many suspended acts done only by me. So all that Jesus has done, he's waiting for us to do it as well. As, as a little child, as, as a teenager, as a young adult, as crucified. He's saying, everything that you've gone through, I've done. And he says, I want my children to be like me. So from creatures also, these are from all classes, virgins, priests, lay people, according to their office, there shall no longer operate humanly, but pertaining to my divine will, their acts shall be multiplied for I, all as I did, as I did and my mother did in a fully divine way. And I shall have on the part of humanity <clears throat> the divine glory of many sacraments received and administered in a human way, so others in a profane way, other in a what sullied with interest and many good works, which have remained more dishonored than honored. Everything's going to be restored. Everything's going to be redone. Louisa, there is so much I long for this, this time. I so much. I long for this time that you're in that you with Louisa pray and long for all of what I want together with me and do not move from your link of connection with me. Starting with yourself first, Louisa, as the first one. First one born of original sin. Watch what I got I'm going to do. Volume 12, 2, 13, 19, 19. I did everything in the divine order, but I am not yet content. I want to enter. I want the creature to enter into my divine will. I want the creature to enter into my divine will in a divine manner to come to kiss my ex. This is the little baby kissing the king of kings, the father of fathers, substituting for everything as I, Jesus, did. Jesus, breathe in my breathing. Jesus, beat in my heart beating. Therefore, come, come. I, Jesus, long for it. I, Jesus, desire it so much that I put myself, though, in feast when I see that humanity enters this divine sphere and multiplying herself together with me. She multiplies for everyone past, present, and future. This is bringing all of humanity with you and loves and repairs and substitutes for all of humanity, past, present, and future, and for each soul in a divine manner. Why? It's Jesus that's doing it in us. Mary, I'm just getting out of the way. Jesus says, I want you to be my skin so that I can reign on earth within you. There's, there's, there's three comings of Christ, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Bernard tells us. The first coming of Christ is the incarnation. The final coming of Christ is when he comes as King and Lord and Lord. But the middle coming of Christ is now where he reigns in us. That was taught by St. Bernard. If you want to know where it is, go to the, um, the breviary of Advent, the first week, Tuesday, the second reading. The first week, Tuesday, the second reading, you'll see that there's three comings of Christ. Where here is the middle coming of Christ. Together with me, multiplying for everyone, love and repairs and substitutes for all, for each one in a divine manner. I, and Jesus says, and I no longer recognize human things in the soul, but all of my things, what I do, Jesus says, my love rises, my love multiplies and repairs 
the and multiplies to the infinite. See how see how the how they would max God to the infinite and beyond. The substitutions are divine. What joy, what feast. The very saints unite with me and make feast ardently waiting for Lu Luisa and her children. A sister of theirs to substitute for their own acts, holy in the human order. This is what the saints have done, but not done in the divine manner. We want to repair and we do in the name of everyone and everything past, present, and future. The souls, like today's the feast of St. Francis of Rome. I want her to be honored. I want to redo everything that she did. Her angel used to appear to her. The angels are going to appear to us. And for, this divine order is coming. They pray, the saints pray to me, let Louisa, the creature, enter soon in the divine sphere that all of their acts may be substituted only with the divine will of God and with the imprint of the eternal one, Jesus that I, Jesus, did for everyone. Now I want you, Louisa, and your children to do this for everyone and for everything past, present, and future. I want you to learn how to pray the way I pray, Jesus says, the way my mother prayed. Not in a saintly way, not in a good way, not in a holy way. Beyond that, in a divine way. This is what God is asking of us. So we'll be back in 15 minutes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue now with the presentation for all clergy. And while it's targeted for all clergy, it's also meant for all people of goodwill to know the mind of the church regarding Louisa Picaretta and the lessons of the divine will she brings to us through Jesus. Fiat. On the 4th of March, 1947, the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, passed away at the age of 82. Seven. A solemn funeral procession was held for her at the main church of Santa Maria Greca. More than 40 priests, the chapter and the local clergy took part in the funeral procession. The sisters took turns to carry her casket on their shoulders, and an immense crowd of citizens surrounded her. The streets were incredibly full. Even the balconies and the rooftops of the houses were swarming with people, so that the procession wound slowly onwards with great difficulty. The funeral rite of the little daughter of the divine will was celebrated in the main church of Santa Maria Greca by the entire chapter. Now let's view a short video clip from a documentary commissioned by late Archbishop Picchetti, titled Dawn of a Mystery. Your Excellency, you have read the writings of Luisa. Can you give us some comments about them? What stands out is that in the history of spirituality, there has never been an emphasis on fiat. On fiat voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra on doing the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. Then I asked myself, how do the saints in heaven do the will of God? By being immersed in God. And this is what Louisa says, the Trinitarian life, the insertion of our souls into the bosom of God begins here on earth and is subject to our acceptance, to our saying yes, to our saying fiat as Mary did. Continuing in my usual state, I found myself outside of my body in a garden in which I could see the Virgin, my Queen, sitting on a very high throne. I decided to go up and kiss her hand, and as I tried, she came to meet me, placing a kiss on my face. While looking at her, I saw a globe of light inside her being, and within that light, a word appeared, fiat. From the word were emerging many and different seas of virtues, graces, greatnesses, glory, joys, and beauties, everything that the Virgin, our Queen, contained in her soul. All her goods were rooted in one single word and were springing from one single source, fiat. I kept looking at her with great amazement, and she said to me, my daughter, all my sanctity came out from the word fiat. 
I never moved out of the will of God, even for one breath, step, act, or anything else. My life, food, and all was the will of God, and this produced in me great sanctity, riches, glory, and honor, not human, but divine. Thus, the more a soul is united and identified with the will of God, the more she can be called holy and be loved by God. And the more she is loved by God, the more she is favored, because her life is nothing but the product of God's will. How can he not love this faithful soul if she is always one with the divine? Therefore, a soul must not look at how much or how little she does, but rather at what she does is the will of God. In fact, the Lord looks more at something little if it is done according to his will than at something great done outside of his will. Senza di questa. This is the condensed biography from the postulation for the cause of beatification and canonization of Luisa Picaretta. Quote, Luisa Picaretta was born in Corrado, province of Bari, Italy, on April 23, 1865. She was baptized in the Mother Church hours after birth and there received the first sacraments in 1874. When she was 11, she became a daughter of Mary, and as a teenager, a third order Dominican. She received only a first grade ed education and was called to serve our Lord as a victim soul at the tender age of 16. On February 2nd, 1899, she was given the obedience by her spiritual director to begin a diary of her spiritual experiences which she continued until 1938. 36 notebooks which detail her intimate rapport with heaven. In 1926, she wrote her autobiography under obedience to her extraordinary spiritual director and censor of her writings, Saint Anibale Maria di Francia. Her bed was her cell, her room her chapel, and her bed her cross. The word which gave her life was God's own creative word, fiat, end quote. Here are the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Her most essential writing is her, is her diary that contains all the teachings and revelations that Jesus imparted to Luisa and instructed her to write. Jesus himself even suggested the title the kingdom of my divine will in the midst of creatures, the book of heaven, the recall of the creature to the order, to the place and to the purpose for which he was created by God. Two other renowned writings of Luisa Picaretta are the 24 hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will. Other works include Childhood Memories, 70 Letters Between Luisa and Her Spiritual Director, Saint Anibale, 239 Letters to Various Addresses, The Three Appeals, The Appeal of Jesus Christ the King, The Appeal of the Queen of Heaven, and Luisa's Appeal. Lastly, we also have various prayers, consecrations, and spiritual testaments from Luisa. In a letter written by Luisa to Federico Abresh, she expresses to him the joy from living in the divine will. In a brief section of the letter, Luisa writes, quote, May good Jesus reward you by dissolving you completely in the divine will and by keeping your will as a footstool under his divine feet. How happy you will feel because by living together with the divine will, what is of Jesus in the Queen Mama is ours. Ours his sanctity, his life, and the immense seas of his riches." End quote. Federico Abresh was a Franciscan tertiary and a close friend of Luisa Picaretta. He was a renowned photographer of Saint Padre Pio and played a significant role in fostering the relationship between Padre Pio and Luisa 
by acting as the messenger between them, particularly during the difficult years of Luisa's censure. Federico considered himself a devout spiritual child of Padre Pio and a faithful disciple of Luisa Picaretta. Following the wishes of Padre Pio, he became the first apostle of the divine will in San Giovanni Rotondo and worked diligently to spread Luisa Picaretta's writings. Now it is time to examine what the stance of Holy Mother Church is on Luisa Picaretta and her writings. We will examine several communiques from the late Archbishop Picchetti and his successor, Archbishop Leonardo Diascenso, and that of Cardinal Jose Sariva Martins and from Monsignor Paolo Rizzi. On April 2nd, 2015, the late Archbishop Picchetti invited priests attending the fourth international conference titled Church in the Divine Will to write a closing letter to be disseminated throughout the church. The letter emphasized that the participants had solemnly committed to being more faithful to the charism of living in the divine will following the example of servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. The focus was on living in accordance with this charism within the church, for the church, and in unity with the church. Here is a copy of that communique of April 22nd, 2015 from Archbishop Picchetti. As a side note, you will be able to view this document as well as all the others in the appendix section of this presentation. The late Archbishop Picchetti released another communique on March 4th, 2016, in which he presented Luisa as a messenger of hope and peace, especially to the suffering, that despite being tried by suffering herself, Luisa was jo a joyful witness to her own suffering that had kept her crucified to her bed for more than 70 years. Archbishop Picchetti encouraged the Association of the Faithful, Luisa Picaretta, Little Children of the Divine Will, in Corrado and the Archdiocese, along with the prayer groups scattered worldwide, to imitate Luisa's example of being a messenger of hope and peace and persevering through a steadfast journey rooted in faith in light of God's word, the sacraments of communion with pastors of the church and of witness to charity and Luisa's example. Here is that communique from the late Archbishop Picchetti. To emphasize Archbishop Picchetti's fervent defense of the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picoretta, he wrote an important communique dated November 1st, 2012, to address the many faithful worldwide interested in Luisa Picaretta and the spirituality of the divine will. Archbishop Picchetti noted emphatically to all those who claim that these writings contain doctrinal errors, that in fact, this had never been endorsed by the Holy See nor himself. In Archbishop Picchetti's own words, he says, quote, in the prayerful anticipation of the outcome of this examination, I wish to address all those who claim that these writings contain doctrinal errors. This to date has never been endorsed by any pronouncement by the Holy See, nor personally by myself. I would like to note that in this way, in addition to anticipate the legitimate judgment of the church, these persons cause scandal to the faithful who are spiritually nourished by said writings, originating also suspicion of those of us who are zealous in the pursuit of the cause. In the anticipation of the judgment by a competent authority, I invite you to make more serious and in-depth meditations and reflections in your personal reading on these writings in light of sacred scripture, tradition, and the magisterium of the church, end quote. 
That is the communique from March 4, 2016 by Archbishop Ikieri, written in defense of Luisa's writings and of the faithful. On March 4, 2020, in the Church of Santa Maria Greca, Archbishop Leonardo Diascenso led a Eucharistic celebration to remember the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. After the Mass, the Archbishop announced that he had written a communique for those interested in Luisa Picaretta's life and writings. During this event, the Archbishop mentioned a conversation with Cardinal Luis Ladaria, Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The congregation had concerns about theological ambiguities in Luisa's writings, unrelated to her virtues, and deemed it inappropriate to grant the Neolabstad. However, the Archbishop saw this as an opportunity to delve deeper into her writings, with the assistance of expert scholars. This news brought discouragement to many who found spiritual nourishment in these writings. Nevertheless, the Archbishop encouraged them to respond with obedience, commitment, and patience, much like Louisa did herself in her love for the church. He suggested they should read her writings with a focus on the author's intention in greater faithfulness with the teachings of the church and recognizing the divine will as the Heavenly Father's merciful appeal addressed to the free will of the people of our times. All right, a little late, but uh, we're still continuing. All right, so here we go. Let's get back onto this. Okay, as soon as I can find it. <clears throat> okay, so name of the Father and of the Son <clears throat> and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Our Lady, Queen of all saints, Pray for us, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're continuing with volume 12, 616, 1919. Louisa, Jesus says, um, when you felt cold, see, this is going to happen to us when, we, when we're not, you know, not filled with peace, joy, and happiness. This coldness, see, God, God allows us to experience this aloneness. Okay, when you felt cold, it was another little death that you felt. And you came to take part in the coldness of humanity who would not want to cool down, who would want to cool down this, this fire of God's love. But my love triumphing over coldness absorbs it in me to feel the death of their coldness and it gives them more ardent love. So what, what this says is you're going to experience not continuous happiness, but you're going to be happy, but you will, you will feel this coldness. And Jesus says, I want you to know that this coldness is a death that humanity ha has to go through. Uh, the, the, the lucky stiff, basically, you you have to go through this coldness, this death, uh, for all of humanity to be on fire with the love of God. So this, this is what's going to happen. So when somebody says, well, I'm not always happy in the divine will, Jesus is saying, because I'm letting you understand that this is where humanity is. They have no love for me. They have no desire for me. And I'm letting you experience this to let you know that this coldness is a death. He says that I want you to go through so that the fire of God's love may come back to humanity. As, as he said, with that young man of the widowed mother being carried out on a litter, he sees this woman, he had pity for the woman and for her son. Why? He says, this is where humanity is. We're living dead. We're dead. The, the, the human will is, is death. It's not the great gift, the gift of gifts, the prodigy of prodigies of the divine will of God. So our God is allowing us to go through this coldness to make us understand that this we're going to come to life. Humanity is going to come to life. I want you to to enter into this fire of God's love of the sacred heart of Jesus, the immaculate heart of Mary. Volume 12, 124, 19, oh, 1920. Jesus says, um, or Louis says, continuing in my usual state, 
I was uniting myself with Jesus, praying to Jesus not to leave me alone, to come to keep me company. And again, this, this longing for Jesus is what we have to have, like Louisa. She's not complaining. She's, she's not complaining. It's, it's, we are so far from God that he wants us to enter into this abundant life. And he says, I'm looking for souls who want this. So Jesus moved in my interior and told me, my daughter, if you knew how I, God, desire, how I, God, long for, how I, God, love the company of humanity, of you and your children, so much that in creating Adam, I said, it is not good for man to be alone. Let us make another creature who may resemble Adam and keep Adam company so that one may form the delight of the other. And then he says this, in these same words that I spoke my love before creating Adam, I do not want to be alone. I want humanity in my company. I want my children that I create in order to amuse myself with the, my little children. That, that's what you do with a little baby. When you look at a little baby, you are so amused, so beautiful, so innocent, so holy. To share with humanity all my contentments and with his company, I shall pour out myself in love. So we haven't seen anything yet. See, we haven't seen anything yet. When Adam fell, God said he was in sorrow for 4,000 years, waiting for humanity to beg for the Messiah. And for 4,000 years, they begged for the Messiah. They longed for the Messiah. And the Essenes especially basically broke away from the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, knowing that the priesthood was corrupt and went to the desert. And they longed for Jesus. They sought Jesus. They, that's, where, that's where the last, if you want to say, high priest of the Old Testament uh, that was John the Baptist. He went to the desert. And what does he do? He starts baptizing them. And they say, are you the prophet? He goes, no, someone after me is coming. It's greater than me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Then, then why are you doing this? To prepare the way of the Lord. This is in a way like Louisa. Louisa, this preparing the way of the Lord. John the Baptist was the precursor of the second fiat. Louisa is the precursor of the third fiat. We haven't seen anything yet. We're going to go back to what God wanted from the beginning. So in these same words, he says, I, God, don't want to be alone. I want humanity to be in my company. I want my children to be in my company. I want to create Adam in order to amuse myself with Adam and his children, to share with Adam and his children all my divine contentments. With Adam and his children, I want to pour out my love upon humanity. And Jesus says, now I found one born of, born, born of original sin who now can take the place of Adam and start the second generation of the children of light, which is going to be sanctification for humanity. This universal life that God breathed into Adam is going to cons consume the world in love through the sacred heart of Jesus, the immaculate heart of Mary. This new and divine way of holiness is here through little Louisa. And the match has been lit. The spark has been happened. This consuming love is coming. And we're, he got asked just to be alive at this time to witness what he is going to do. So what has he done? He says, to prove that it is coming on earth as it is in heaven, I give you the book of heaven through little Louisa. As you read it, as you study, as you put it into practice, a new beginning happens for all of humanity. Glory is coming. Glory is coming. Volume 14, 623, 1922. It would be better to lower one's forehead and to enjoy the light that my truth brings, loving it and making a little light that the human intelligence comprehends on one's own, but rather than putting it aside as something that does not belong to them because they do not comprehend the fullness of the light. So Jesus says, a lot of people are not going to understand the divine will. It's better to lower your forehead to enjoy the light and my truth, he says, to love the little light that the human intelligence can comprehend, but rather putting the human intelligence aside from a divine, from a human perspective that he says to enter into a divine perspective because the human cannot comprehend the fullness of the light that's coming. Okay. Now, what does that mean? What we've learned so far, you know, is in sacred scripture with a dogma and doctrine, uh, it's the fullness of the divine faith. It's fullness of the Catholic faith. But this light that's coming 
the human mind, we have to begin to see things from a divine perspective. So what has Jesus done? He's given us the book of heaven so that we can begin to understand this fullness of light. It's a language of heaven. And, and a lot of people don't understand the language of heaven. I had this one person say to me once, uh, Jesus said, open your mouth as a little bird so I can fill you as a mother bird fills the baby's mouth. And the person said, I don't eat worms. And I'm going, you're, th you're seeing it from a human perspective. God wants to fill us with, with food, with nourishment, with life. It's not, it's not, you're going to be, God's going to fill your mouth with worms. It's, it's God. So, so Jesus is showing this as you learn the, the language of heaven, as you learn this mystical language, it's not human understanding. If you try to understand the divine will from a human understanding, it's, you're, you're just going to be confused. So what Jesus is doing is he's slowly teaching us as, as if you want to learn French, you go to France. If you want to learn German, German, you go to Germany. You want to learn the language, you go there and study. This is what we're doing. As we're reading, as we're studying, uh, we're beginning to understand this divine, these divine truths, this divine reality, this fullness of the light. So he says, so it is with the sun. Although they don't, do not comprehend the sun, they enjoy the light of the sun as much as they can. They can make use of it to, in order to operate, to walk, to look, but how they long for the daylight all night long. I can't wait for sun. I can't wait for it to be warm again. I can't wait for it to be in that sunlight. So the light keeps them company uh, and, and lives with them. But then he says, my truths that are more than light in the sun can make the sun of the new day arise in them. That's why when you listen to the dawn of a mystery done by Archbishop Picheri, he what does he say? He says, we're entering into the dawn of the, the mystery of the dawn of the new day. This new day is coming. It's here. And we're all in this, in this together. Nobody's ahead of anybody. It, it's like being in a swimming pool, an Olympus like swimming pool and they're and standing in the pool waiting and the water's coming in. Okay. And then somebody else comes in and they get in and they're the same level. The water comes in. I think we're, I think right about now we're almost to the knees. <laughs> and when people start coming in, they're going to go, Oh, I, I, how you've been in it for so long. Hey, we're all in it in the same way. Everybody is in it at this point. So as you read it, as you study it, Everything that is before you comes with you, comes with it. The understanding is more is easier for you than for, for, for those that have been in it for a long time. For example, when I entered in, really reading the divine will, we had mimeograph sheets of paper. There were no books. I remember in our prayer group, we, we'd bring out a sheet of paper and we go, just you know, just Jesus just says, we were so excited because all we had was just a, one translation. And then in 1996, uh, before John Paul II, what does John Paul II say? He says, get ready for the new heavens. Get ready for uh, the, the, uh, the, the glory of the church, the new springtime of mankind, the third millennium. Get ready, get ready. And what happened in 1996? Before the year of Jesus, before the year of the Holy Spirit, before the year of the Father, before the year 2000, what does he do? He, we, he, we celebrate the year of Jesus for a year. Then we celebrate the year of the Holy Spirit for a year. We celebrate the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the year now of the Father. I remember it being on Pentecost Sunday. Um, I was sitting with Dr. Maravelli and his family in, in the piazza. We were, very, we were up close and, uh, uh, on Pentecost Sunday. And John Paul II says, Vene Creator Spiritus. I said, wow, he's calling upon the Holy Spirit. And he goes, Vene Creator Spiritus. I said, he's calling the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, Vene. I go, hey, we're supposed to, <laughs> Every, the whole crowd went, come Holy Spirit. I mean, something changed at that moment. Something changed at that moment. It was like, yes, the church said, come Holy Spirit. And for this third millennium that's coming, they're longing for the daylight. This is, this is, this is so, it's such a great time to be alive. He says, but my truths are more than light of the sun. It's the sun of the new day that arises in the human mind, neither regarded nor loved nor longed for, and are held as, tr as trifle. What a sorrow, Jesus says. However, when I see that they put these truths aside, I put them aside. Okay, so, he, so he said, when they came to say no to Louisa in 1938, I put it aside as well. And then in 1996, the, the, the writings were given back to humanity. 
And he says, he says, and I let my truths, truths do their course with the souls who love them and long for them to make use of their light in order to model their lives and become one with them. Do you think that I have told you everything about the truths of the divine will, about the effects and value that my truth contains? And how many more suns, S-U-N-S, do I have to make rise? And do not be surprised if you do not comprehend everything, but be content with living of its light. And this is enough for me, Jesus says. So as we live this little by little, he's teaching us, he's leading us, he's guiding us. Volume 14, 915, 1922. Then if you do not want to interest yourself with the divine will, who knows how much care, how much ardent yearning how the, for the effects of my will to be known from which I shall receive the complete glory of creation and the fulfillment of redemption itself. How many effects are still suspended to be both between creation and redemption because my divine will is not yet known and does not have its true kingdom in humanity, in the little children. So that's what he's doing. 5, 16, 8, 28, 19, 32, 19, 19, 23. Oh, how hard is my exile. My poor heart was agonizing because of the pain it felt for the soul who forms its life was far away from me. But while I was longing for this in return, the father, for, for, father confessor came in that precise moment after I had waited for so long, Jesus moved in my interior. Jesus squeezing my heart tightly made himself seen. And to I to him, my Jesus, could you not come before? Now I must obey. Oh, please, you, you have come and I receive you in the most holy sacrament, in the blessed Eucharist. And then we shall be alone again and shall be free to be together. And Jesus, with a dignified and indifferent appearance, told me, indifferent appearance, told me, my daughter, do you want me to destroy the order of my wisdom? Do you want me to take away the authority I gave to my holy church? See, he's saying, Louisa, we've got it. We've got to do this through the church. And while saying this, he let me share in his pains. I am 16, 114, 1924. So we have to go through what the church has to go through. The saints have said, the bride of Christ must go to Calvary and be crucified with the Lord. That's why we started out tonight or today with the, with the crucifixion. We have to go through this. But this crucifixion is essential for his bride. Five sixteen one fourteen nineteen twenty four. 16, 114, 1924. Jesus said, I had to associate myself with men, taking upon myself all of their evils and subjecting myself to all the necessities of life as if I were one of them. Okay. As, as a, if I was born of original sin. However, in me, there was this prodigy. If, if I wanted I would need nothing, either clothing or food or anything else, but I did not want to make use of it out of love for, for man. I wanted to sacrifice myself and everything, even in the most innocent things created by me, in order to prove my ardent love for humanity. And even more, this served to impetrate from my divine father that out of regard for me and for my will, completely sacrificed to him, the father would give back to humanity the noble royal garment of our most holy divine will. We're going to be clothed in divinity. This is what the priest says every day, a holy mass, putting the drop of water into the chalice. May we share in the divinity of Christ. Our nakedness is going to be reclothed in divinity. The human body is going to be in the image of the new Adam and of the new Eve. Jesus ascended into heaven. Mary assumed into heaven. There's two bodies in heaven. And now Louisa, and Jesus says to Louisa, everything I have, I give to you. What doesn't Louisa have yet? It's the glorified body. We haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> what's coming? All I can say is what's coming is going to, the earth, Jesus said, is going to shake. It's going to be with those who are in ecstasy, jumping up and down, praising God and others who are going to be pounding the earth with their fists, wailing and grinding of teeth, knowing that they didn't choose God, knowing that what God has given to humanity is not theirs. That's why Jesus said, when I return, will I find any faith on the earth? Jesus said it will be a few, a few. 
516, 25, 24 I felt embittered because of the privation of my highest and only good. And even more, I felt that everything was over for me. And the only, the one who is all my life was to come no more. See, she felt abandoned by Jesus. And, and he, Jesus said, I would do this because nobody loves me. Nobody longs for me. And I, I do this with for you, Louisa, because you're the only one at this point that loves me the way I want to be loved. And she says, and I thought that all the past had just been a game of fantasy. Oh, had it been a minute of power, I would have burned all these writings so that no trace may ever be left about me. She was, she was so humble. But my nature also felt pain, the painful effects of this. But it is useless to say on paper that what I went through, because the paper too, cruel, not a word of comfort was for me, does not give me the, this paper does not give me the one I so much long for, Jesus. I long for Jesus. On the contrary, by saying it, it makes my pains more bitter, and therefore I move on. The suffering that Louisa went through. How much do we love Jesus? Where we can't get to Holy Mass. How much do we long for Jesus when we can't receive the Eucharist? How much do we long for Jesus where we can't have Eucharistic adoration? 517, 1127, 1924. The human will is like the impetuous wind that moves the creature at every blow like an empty reed. Now to the right, now to the left. This is why in creating Louisa, I wanted Louisa to live in my divine will. So that arresting this imp 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 impetuous wind of the human will, the human will is fickle, miserable. It might render Louisa firm in good, firm and stable in love. Firm, stable, and holy and operating. I wanted to let Louisa live in the divine will and the immense ter territory of my immutability, never changing. But Louisa was not content. Louisa wanted her own, this, excuse me, but Adam was not content. Adam wanted his own little place. Adam rendered himself amused, uh, the amusement of himself and of others, amusement of his very passions. And this is why I pray, I supplicate that humanity Take this divine will of mine. Humanity, make Louisa, Louisa's own, that it may return to the immutable will from which Adam came, so that Adam, the humanity, may no longer be fickle, but stable and firm. I, God, have not changed. I wait for Louisa and her children. I long for Louisa and her children. I want Louisa and her children always in my most holy divine will. This is the fire of God's love that's going to come upon earth. Volume 17, 222, 1925. How many paths were in the creature in order to come back into my divine will if the soul wanted to? All the paths were opened between God and man. And by virtue of our divine will, all the goods were Adam's. And after all, Adam was our son. Adam was our image. Adam was a work that came out of our creative hands and from our, the ardent breath of our bosom, and Adam failed. Volume 17, 3, 8, 19, 25. My daughter, do you want to go through all the acts of my divine will that came out of it for the good of humanity? Come with me. Come into my holy humanity. I long for it, and I want you to do it. I want you to be one with me, fused with me, Jesus says. Do you hear him saying that to you when you go to Holy Communion? He says, you consume me. I want to consume you. I want you to become my food. What is the food of God? The will of God. Reigning in him. Him reigning in us. Image and likeness. Do you know that my holy humanity covered all the paths of the eternal will of God and all the acts that I found done for the good of all my brothers? I admitted my own to require requite the divine will for the many acts done for the good of all of hum human generations. This was the most legitimate act. This befitted me to do as God. First, to honor my celestial father and to keep doing it. And I, I left deposit of my acts in the divine will itself that humanity might remain always in act of giving back to the divine father the legitimate honor that creatures do not give to the father of forcing the eternal divine will of God to make peace 
with a human will. I did this, Jesus said. And now I found my firstborn, my newborn. And through Louisa, a new beginning is coming to all of humanity. This is why I love reading the divine will. It's not that I'm sanctified. I want that. I plead for that. I, I, not, I, I want what God wants. And what he wants is that we return to the image and likeness of God. So through holy baptism, we are in God's image. And now with the divine will, we're entering into little by little, step by step, breath by breath, the divine will of God. 517, 423, 1925. Since heaven knows that nothing glorifies me as much as the soul who lives in my divine will, that they too long for my divine will to live within the souls on earth so that each act that the creature does in my divine will is a kiss that she gives to and receives from the, the triune God who created her and from all the blessed, all the saints in heaven who are living one with their triune God in heaven. It's heaven and earth are kissing. What does that mean? It means finally it's back to where it belongs. One with God. But do you know what the kiss is? Listen to this. It's the transformation of the soul with her God. It is the possession of God in the soul and the soul in God. It's, it's back to where it belongs. One with God. This is what it is. It is the growth of the divine life in the soul. This is sanctification. It is the accord of the whole of heaven. And it is the right of supremacy over all created things. God, again, is back to what, what belonged for God, in God, through God, with God, one with God. And that's, that's humanity. It's begun with the new Adam, with the new Eve, and now they have the newborn. And God is saying to us, I want to offer this to you. How much do you want this? How much do you want this? 517, 426, 1925. Be quiet, my daughter. See, this, this, is, this is essential. Silence is important. When we're in front of the blessed sacrament, silence, be quiet. Listen to God. He's speaking to you. His voice is silent. You have to learn how to hear his voice, not with your ears, but with your heart, your mind, your soul. He wants to speak to you. Be quiet, my daughter. Let the eternal son of my divine will follow its course, whether through the writings or whether we're reading, through the print or through your words and your manners. But let this light escape like light. Let it cover the whole world. I, God, long for it. I, God, want it. How, how sad it was when we when we didn't have all the volumes. I want this. I want my children to dive into this infinite ocean of love and swim in it. 517, 979, 1925. I felt I could no longer be without my sweet Jesus. For several days, I had longed for his return, but in vain. I would say to Jesus from my heart, my love. Do you, do you, is that your words to Jesus, my love, my beloved? Luis is teaching us how she prayed, and we want to echo that, my love, Jesus. Come back to your little daughter. Don't you see that I can take it no more? Ah, to what a hard martyrdom you expose my poor existence by depriving me of yourself. And I, tired and exhausted, I would uh, abandon myself in his most holy divine will. It's, uh, I want to live here, Jesus, and I will wait for you. Waiting for God is the hardest thing. Waiting for the Lord. And a lot of people are snapping their fingers. It's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. It's, gonna <laughs> it's here. We're in that season. Jesus says, when you see the leaves change, you know summer is near. In the same way, when you see the things happening, and we're seeing the things that are happening, he says, I am near, I am close. It's 2,000 years ago, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now with Louisa, the kingdom of God is here. I mean, it really begins little by little for each person that wants it. <clears throat> as you're reading, as you're studying, as you're putting this into practice, you're learning the language of heaven. Volume 18, 10 4, 1925, my daughter, Daughter of my supreme volition, my will wants to make you take part in everything, everything of God. Can you see 
all the works that I have done while being on earth, I want you to enter into this. That keep my will keeps it suspended within itself because humanity does not dispose themselves to wanting to receive what Jesus has done, partly because they still do not know what I have done. Okay, the holy humanity of Jesus. See here the prayers I did at nighttime. See here, covered with bitter tears and ardent sighs for the salvation of all. They are all in waiting to give themselves back to humanity in order to give them the fruits that they contain. Be fruitful and multiply. Daughter, enter into these fruits. Cover yourself with my tears. Clothe yourself with my prayers so that my, my divine will may accomplish in you the effects that are in my tears, in my prayers, in my sighs. That's what we're doing for Lent. We're walking this with Jesus. That's why we pray the hours of the passion. We're witnessing with, with our, the mind of our eye, the eye of our mind, sorry, uh, the life of Jesus, the torture that he went through. Volume 18, 12, 6, 1926. Not only must I find the whole of creation, but the true living in my divine will, which binds everyone. And therefore I, God, must find in you, Louisa, as though in act, Adam holy. He came out of my creative hands, as well as Adam guilty, humiliated and crying, so that you, Louisa, and your children may bind yourself to Adam in his state of sanctity, not the fallen nature, taking part in his holy innocence and holy acts that you, Louisa, and your children will give me the glory you, Louisa, and your children may make known the whole of creation and make it smile again and sharing in his tears with Adam. She may long for, long for that fiat rejected that had caused so much ruin. I must find in you, Louisa, and your children, the prophets, the patriarchs, the holy fathers and all their acts. And if you, if those longed for the redeemer, he says, this is what I want from you and your children. I want you to long for the supreme fiat as triumph and fulfillment of all the size of humanity, all the tears of humanity, all the size and tears and sufferings of Jesus and Mary. Everything, everything's ready for the kingdom to be established on earth as it is in heaven. And he said, it's going to happen, happen with a twinkling of the eye. That's how quick it is. It's going to come. It's going to be here. Get ready. Jesus is saying, I'm separating the sheep and the goats. I'm separating those from light and darkness. I'm separating the wheat and the tares. I'm separating the good and the bad. I'm separating those who want Lucifer and want Jesus. Everything's being separated right now. And he says, would you stand in the breach for all those that are on the fence to fully embrace what God has planned? Volume 18, 124, 1926. May your isolation in the company of this isolated mother, this is this is the divine will, the uh, divine will who that cries and searches for her children. But as much as she cries, she shouts and calls her children, whether with the most tender voices, with the most bitter tears, with the most ardent sighs, or with the most thundering voices of chastisements. That's what we're going through. These unruly children keep far away from the womb of God, the womb of God who generated them. This is the divine will. My daughter, do you not want to share as true faithful daughter of my divine will? Do you want to share in her sorrows and in her isolation? Pleading for, begging for this divine will. Volume 19, 3, 6, 1926. It shall be known only that my divine will had its first field of divine action in your soul, Louisa, as well as everything that is necessary in order to make known what regards my divine will and how the divine will wants to enter the field so that humanity may return back to her origin and how it anxiously awaits Louisa and her children into its arms so that there may be no more division between humanity and me, Jesus says. And if this were not made known, how could the creature long for it? How could they long for this great good if it's not known? How could they dispose themselves to receive a gift, so a grace so great? If my mother, Mary, did not want to make known that I, Jesus, was the eternal word and her son, what good would redemption have produced? A good that is not known as great as it may be has no ways to communicate the good it possesses. 
And just as my mother was not opposed so much so, my daughter, Louisa, and your little ones, your children, should not oppose what regards my divine will. All the rest of its secrets, all these flights in the divine will, you do in my divine will. All the goods you take, you do in the divine will. The most intimate things between you and me do in the divine will, he says, and shall remain in this aquarium of the divine secrets. Do not fear. Your Jesus shall content you in everything. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be glorious. And he's saying, I want you to enter into the secret life of Mary, the secret life of Jesus. Not the exterior life is what the saints found, but the interior life, the secret life is what God wants us now to participate in. This is what sanctification is. Volume 19, 328, 1926. There are no goods nor prayers that have been done that are not being done in the Holy Church and are not with you, Louisa, to help you, Louisa, obtain the long for fiat. The sacraments and sacramentals are yours. It's going to help you obtain the fiat. Since the primary purpose of all was done by me and the queen of heaven and by all the good of the faithful, my holy divine will, everything is within you, Louisa, to impetrate the realization of their purpose of all what the saints have done, the holy church has done. Therefore, be attentive. I, Jesus, shall always be with you, Louisa, and your children. So you shall be my mama. And what does Jesus say to the, the apostles? Your mother is here. He goes, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? Those who do the will of the father. I want a blood relationship with you. So he says, you know, you are my mama, Louisa, and your children are my mama. You, Louisa, shall not be alone in longing for the triumph of our holy divine will. By him 19, 518, 1926. My daughter, Louisa, in order to conceive me the eternal word, my inseparable mother was enriched by oceans of grace, of light, of sanctity, by the supreme majesty of the Father. And since Our Lady had so many acts of virtue and love and of prayer and of desire and ardent size, size which surpassed the love, the virtues, the acts of all human generations that were needed in order to obtain the longed-for Redeemer, so when I saw the Sovereign Queen uh, in the Sovereign Queen, the complete love of all of humanity, of all the acts needed to deserve that the word, Jesus Christ, be conceived. I found in the Blessed Mother the ridicule of love of all of humanity. Our glory was then restored. All the acts of the redeemed ones were there. Even for those for whom my redemption was to serve as condemnation because of their ingratitude was there. Then did my love make its final display, and I was conceived. Therefore, the right to name of mother is natural for Our Lady. It is sacred, because all embracing acts of the human generations and substituting for all of humanity is what Our Lady did, as if it was she delivered all of humanity to new life from her maternal womb. Mary is the mother of all of humanity. How great it is to be Catholic. We honor Our Lady continuously. Volume 19, 523, 1926. The whole of heaven, the celestial mother, the angels, the saints are all turned toward you, Louisa. For what? The triumph of my holy divine will. Because their glory in heaven shall not be complete if my divine will does not have its complete triumph on earth. This is what's coming. This is what sanctification is. The complete triumph on earth. What does that mean? It means the evil one is going to be gone. He was banished from heaven. When the divine will reigns on earth as it is in heaven, he'll be banished from earth. And what, is, what does scripture say? Then there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more sin, no more death. This is the complete triumph of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. We haven't seen anything yet. Everything was created for the total fulfillment of the supreme will of God until heaven and earth return to its circle of the eternal will of God. They feel their works, their glory, the beatitude as though halved because not having found its complete fulfillment in the creation, the divine will cannot give what it had established to give from the beginning. And that is the fullness of its goods, the fullness of effects, the fullness of joys, the fullness of divine happiness that it contains. And this is why they, everyone in heaven is longing for 
my divine will itself, all for you, Louisa, and the intent on you, Louisa, and your children. It holds nothing back of the graces of the light of, and whatever it takes to form in you, Louisa, the greatest of prodigies. That is the fulfillment and its total triumph in a human born of original sin. It's finally happened. The true life of Jesus, the true life of Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve is found in a newborn, Louisa. Which one do you think is the greater prodigy? That a little light remain enclosed in the sun or the sun enclosed in the, its little light? What is the greatest prodigy? We're going to participate in this. Volume 19, 425, 1926. Oh, the privation of my Jesus, how painful it are you are. When 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 Jesus wouldn't, when she, Louisa couldn't see Jesus, she said, I can't breathe. My heart doesn't beat. I'm living dead. That's how much she was in love with Jesus. Jesus was her life, was her love, her, was her all. He says, you are the true martyrdom of my poor soul. I don't see you. I don't feel you. I don't experience you. The supreme will, how strong and powerful you are, giving me life, yet you prevent my flight toward the celestial fatherland. I'm not dying and going to heaven. I find the one who so much long for and desire, I want to go to heaven. Oh, please have pity on my hard exile. Pity on me who live without the one, Jesus, who alone, Jesus, can give me life, Jesus. You see her sufferings? Do we long for Jesus like that? We, we can't wait to be in front of the Blessed Sacrament, looking at Jesus, praying, adoring him, loving him, in the name of everyone and everything, past, present, future, bringing all of humanity to the throne of God. Volume 19, 523, 1926. What is impossible for humanity is possible for God. The little light of the soul and my most holy divine will is the sun, Jesus says. The sun of, of uh, the, the, the light, the life, the love of God. Now, my divine will must give so much to the little light as to be able to make of that little light the circle that to be enclosed in it, to radiate like the sun. And since the nature of light is to spread its rays everywhere, it remains in the triumph within this little circle. That's where the light is at this point. This is why the earth, this is why the earth is going to shake. For some, it's going to be shaking with joy and praise. And God, the Lord is so good. And for others, they're going to be pounding the earth with their fists, knowing, knowing they haven't chosen this. They didn't want this. So Jesus is saying to us, will you stand on the breach to, to bring humanity back to me? Will you do this for me? Will you do this so that the kingdom can be established? Since it's the nature of light to spread its rays everywhere while remaining the triumph within the circle, it shall spread its divine rays to give its light of my divine will to everyone, past, present, and future. This is the prodigy of prodigies. This is the divine will that the whole of heaven longs for the divine will reign on earth as it is in heaven. The fulfillment of the Our Father, the only prayer that Jesus taught his apostles, and we pray every day. Therefore, give broad field to my most holy divine will. Be opposed in nothing, so that what was established by God in the work of creation may have its fulfillment on earth, in you, this dust, as it is in heaven. Remember, man, that thou art dust. Breathe in me the rule of God, the breath of God that you breathed into Adam. But more than that, breathe this in with the new Adam and the new Eve. This is what God is asking for. He's not asking for us to just be good and holy and saintly. That's what he gave to the saints. He's asking us to begin to live this abundant life, to begin to breathe the way Adam did. When we breathe, say to the Holy Spirit, fill me with the breath that you breathed into Adam. I want everything in my being to be one with God, fused with God. Breathe in me, Jesus. As, as you breathed upon the apostles when you rose from the dead. Breathe with the Blessed Mother as you breathe to keep the baby Jesus a warm, warm at, at Christmas. Breathe into me this breath of God. Nothing will be opposed to the divine will. He established by God in the work of creation. 
It's going to have its fulfillment. And our God is asking us to begin to live this abundant life. So we'll be back in fifth, well, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, and God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lastly, Archbishop Diascenso highlights the importance of unity among the groups of the divine will to join the service structure named family of the divine will, because the time has come when walking together is the most effective way to guarantee the formation and diffusion of the doctrine of living in the divine will. And here is the communique of Archbishop Leonardo Diascenso. Monsignor Paolo Rizzi is the new postulator of the cause of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. In a communique dated June 20th of 2017, Monsignor Rizzi expressed confidence in the work carried out by the actor of the cause. He stated that this work serves as a solid foundation and a strong guarantee for a positive outcome in the canonization process. Monsignor Rizzi emphasized that the cause had reached a crucial stage in its progress at that time. This is the communique as mentioned from Monsignor Paolo Rizzi. You have reached the end of part one of the Divine Will presentation for bishops, priests, and deacons. And now we will proceed with part two of the Divine Will presentation for bishops, priests, and deacons. Fiat. Greetings, your eminences and reverend fathers for this second part of this presentation on the divine will for bishops and priests. In this second part of the presentation, we will review the current status of Luisa Picaretta's cause for beatification and the writings of some key figures surrounding this cause and Luisa's writings. Don Sergio Pellegrini is the spiritual assistant of the canonically approved association Luisa Picaretta, Little Children of the Divine Will. In an interview by CaratoLive.it, the city of Carato's online newspaper, with Don Sergio in March of 2023, he was asked about the status of the cause for Luisa's beatification and whether it is blocked. Don Sergio Pellegrini answered that the cause was neither blocked nor closed. He did, however, address some critical issues that were brought up in a letter in 2019 to Archbishop Desenzo, the Archbishop of Trani. The issues were not about individual texts or expressions in the writings. Rather, they address a general conclusion that can be drawn after reading the whole diary. Don Sergio Pellegrini indicated that this does not close the cause, but calls for closer examination of Luisa's writings. So it is under consideration to entrust some experts to study the diary precisely from the point of view of the issues highlighted by the congregation. He further stated that all this does not prevent that such writings can be read, drawing great spiritual benefit. In the same interview with CaratoLive.it, as discussed on the previous slide in March of 2023, Enza Arbore, who is the president of the association Luisa Picaretta, Little Children of the Divine Will, was asked about how the flow of pilgrims to Luisa's home was going. 
Enza Abore pointed out that about 150 came to Carato in late September of 2022 from all over Italy. It was an event of two days of catechesis on the divine will led by Father Charbel of Lebanon. Father Charbel during the pilgrimage offered the prayer at the bottom of the slide, which implores heaven's help to spread the gift of living in the divine will. Most beautifully, he prayed, Dear Louisa, I thank you because you offered your life out of love for the divine will and for the knowledge of this great gift that Jesus, through your fiat, wanted to bestow on the whole church and the whole world. Help me through your intercession to correspond generously with my priesthood, together with all those who are united with me, to spread and make known the gift of the divine will, so that it may be done on earth as it is in heaven." Unquote. Now we turn our attention to Mother Gabrielle Marie, who is the Mother Superior and Foundress of the Benedictine Daughters of Divine Will. She began under the guidance of her late abbess, Mother Angelica, Foundress of the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament and EWTN. Although Mother Gabrielle had beginnings of religious life in a community connected to and exposed to so many saintly religious individuals, it was from a request of a postulant under her care to read the writings of the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, about the divine will that would prove to be the most significant event in Mother Gabrielle's life. On a retreat in 2009, Mother Gabrielle Marie received a clear call to found a new monastic community in Italy dedicated to Eucharistic adoration and Luisa Picaretta's writings on how to live in God's most holy divine will. Father Elijah, a Benedictine monk, set about to found the Benedictine monks of divine will at about the same time. This Benedictine order was to be composed of brothers, sisters, and laity, striving to unite the Benedictine spirit of prayer, work, and hospitality to the life of the Holy Family, turning their respective monasteries and homes into little Nazareths. Mother Gabrielle relays the story of founding the Benedictine Daughters of the Divine Will on her website, benedictinesofdivinewill.org. As Mother relates, quote, the call to found this order became a reality in 2011 when His Excellency Monsignor Luigi Negri accepted the Benedictine Daughters of Divine Will as a public association for the faithful of the Diocese of San Marino Montefeltro. In 2016, the family was completed when our Bishop gave his permission and blessing to found the Third Order or the Lay Branch of the Benedictine Oblates of Divine Will." Unquote. The story behind the email concerns questions that came up regarding the blessing of the Church to read the 36 volumes of Luisa Picaretta. At the Fourth International Divine Will Conference in 2015, the question was asked directly to the Archbishop of Trani, can we read the 36 volumes? His answer, he pointed to Don Sergio and asked, what do they do here in Italy? Don Sergio stated that they copy the writings, pass them out in their prayer groups, and read and study them. Archbishop Picchieri looked at his audience and stated, see? Which is a very Italian way of answering a question. When Americans heard this, they wanted to have a more direct, to-the-point answer. So Mother Gabrielle paid a visit to Archbishop Picchieri and asked for a definitive answer. The Archbishop said yes, and that he didn't know where the rumors started about not being able to read all the volumes. 
Later in 2020, a woman wrote to Mother Gabrielle to again ask for a definitive answer. Her email reply is that which is on the slide. Specifically, Mother Gabrielle pointed out that in 1997, the two theologians appointed by the diocese to evaluate the writings affirmed that there was nothing in the writings contrary to Catholic faith or morals. In 2010, both Theologica censors appointed by the Vatican reached the same position. Finally, in 2012, the Archbishop of Trani wrote a formal notice containing a rebuke of those who claim Luisa Picaretta's writings contain doctrinal errors. Specifically, this letter stated the following, quote, in the prayerful anticipation of the outcome of this examination, I wish to address all those who claim that these writings contain doctrinal errors. This, to date, has never been endorsed by any pronouncement by the Holy See, nor personally by myself. I would like to note that in this way, in addition to anticipate the legitimate judgment of the church, these persons cause scandal to the faithful who are spiritually nourished by said writings, originating also suspicion of those of us who are zealous in the pursuit of the cause." Unquote. Now we're gonna look at Sister Assunta Marigliano, who is the co-founder of the pious association, Luisa Picaretta, Little Children of the Divine Will, located in Carato, Italy. And she is a promoter of the cause of beatification of Luisa Picaretta. Sister Assunta kept 40 years of her personal testimony by the order of Archbishop Picchieri and was published in 2019 under the title La Mia Familia e la Trinita, translated in English, My Family is the Trinity. Archbishop Monsignor Leonardo de Asenzo, who succeeded Monsignor Picchieri in Trani, wrote in the preface the beautiful encouragement on the slide here. Notably, he stated that, quote, through Luisa, it seems that Jesus wants to teach us a little more to live constantly in the divine will, unquote. You have reached the end of part two of the Divine Will presentation for bishops, priests, and deacons. And now we will proceed with part three of the Divine Will presentation for bishops, priests, and deacons. Fiat. We now turn to part three of the Divine Will presentation for bishops and priests. Thank you, your eminences and fathers, for your time in listening to this presentation. These next slides will take a look at what the saints and others have said regarding the divine will and the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Saint Anibale di Francia was the confessor for the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, for 17 years. He is considered the first apostle of the divine will, which flow from the writings of Luisa. This title was given to De Father de Francia by Jesus to Luisa and recorded by her on November 6, 1926. Jesus said, quote, When I have completed everything, I will entrust my kingdom to my ministers, so that as second apostles, they will be its heralds. Do you believe it is coincidental, the visit of Father de Francia? who has shown so much interest in the publication of everything concerning my will? No, no, I have arranged it. It is a providential act of the Supreme Will that wants him as first apostle and herald of the divine fiat." Unquote. It was the passion of Saint Anibale de Francia to make known to the world all the writings on the divine will that our Lord made Louisa record, and thereby accelerate the coming of the kingdom of God on earth, so that the divine will would be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. He pursued this holy task until his death in 1927. Saint Anibale was appointed not only spiritual director in all matters concerning her writings and their publication, but their ecclesiastical censor as well. As becomes evident in her writings known as the Book of Heaven, Saint Anibale pointed out the hiddenness of the humility of the devout soul of Louisa by stating, quote, the life of this virgin, Louisa, spouse of Jesus, is more celestial than terrestrial. She wants to be ignored and unknown in the world, looking for nothing else but her Jesus and her most holy mother, whom she calls Mama, who has a special predilection for this soul." Unquote. Father Bernardino Giuseppe Bucci, Order of Friars Minor, known as Padre Bucci, co-founded with Sister Assunta Marigliano, the Association of the Divine Will, and was nephew to Rosaria Bucci, who took care of Luisa for 40 years. Padre Bucci was her first promoter after Luisa's death, even visiting St. Padre Pio. Padre Bucci writes in the biography of Luisa Picretta about St. Anibale de Francia, stating, quote, According to Aunt Rosaria, St. Anibale enjoyed the great esteem of St. Pius X, who willingly granted him private audiences. It seems that St. Pius X paid great attention to Luisa Picaretta. Our saint submitted her writings to St. Pius X before having them printed." Unquote. Aunt Rosaria recounted that St. Pius X told St. Anibale after reading Luisa's writings on the Passion of Our Lord, quote, Dear Father, you must read these writings on your knees, because it is our Lord Jesus Christ who is speaking in them." Unquote. And it was the Holy Pontiff who urged St. Anibale to publish them. St. Anibale not only did visit Luisa to talk to her, he gave lectures to all those who frequented Luisa's house, especially the young people. And there were many vocations that came from those young people. The 17 years is a compilation of excerpts from the Book of Heaven letters between Saint Anibale and servant of God Luisa Picaretta, memoirs of Padre Bernardino Giuseppe Bucci, and other historical documents. The book commemorates the life of Saint Anibale and the 17 years during which he was Luisa's extraordinary confessor. The photo of Saint Anibale Maria de Francia on the book cover is a copy of the original painting which hangs in the Rogationist Church of Saints Anthony of Padua and Hannibal de Francia in Rome, Italy. From volume 22, June 1, 1927, the Book of Heaven, we find this quote about Saint Anibale, who died on that same day, quote, I, Luisa, saw the blessed soul of Father before me, near my bed, invested with light, suspended from the earth, fixing on me, but without telling me one word. I too felt mute before him. And Jesus added, Look at him, how transformed he is. My will is light, and has transformed that soul into light. It is beautiful and has given him all the shades of perfect beauty. It is holy, and he has been sanctified. My will possesses all sciences, and his soul has been invested by divine science. There is nothing that my will has not given to him. Oh, if all understood what divine will means, they would put everything aside. They would care about doing nothing else and their whole commitment would be to do my will alone." Unquote. 
Another important figure in the church who played a significant role in furthering the teachings on the divine will was Father Ludwig Beda. His response to the writings of Louisa and to that of the message of Jesus about the divine will reflect what we just heard Jesus tell Louisa about St. Anibale. Quote, if all understood what divine will means, they would put everything aside. They would care about doing nothing else, unquote. Father Ludwig Bida was born June 16, 1871, and died April 22, 1941. He was from the Benedictine Order at the Andesh Monastery, located on the Holy Mountain above the eastern shore of Lake Ammersee, in the middle of Upper Bavaria. In early 1930, Maria de Regibus from Turin asked Don Calvi, Luis's confessor at the time, to send copies of the treatise on the divine will and the hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ to well-known German Benedictine scholar, Father Ludwig Beda. Father Beda was a well-known publisher of numerous books in several languages. A couple of months after reading the treatise on the divine will, Father Beda wrote to Don Calvi asking permission to translate it into German. He called the treatise the greatest gift that has ever been written on this theme of the divine will. It is reported that he told Maria de Regibus, quote, to be linked with such a soul as this, Luisa, is more precious to me than possessing half the world, because she communicates to me what is divine with such abundance. I have set aside my great work on stigmatics, and humanly speaking, I don't think it will be published anymore." Unquote. Father Beda eventually published two German editions of the Hours of the Passion in 1936 and in 1937. He also received requests to translate Luisa's writings into English, Polish, and French. In a letter to Luisa, Father Beda wrote, quote, yes, I consecrate myself to this work, even to martyrdom. Now, I have set aside my great work on the stigmatists, and humanly speaking, I don't think it will be published anymore, since the editor has been offered another similar work, but of only two volumes. Moreover, even though the editor wants to publish my work, I have not been able to persuade myself to set aside the kingdom of the divine will. It seems to me that God wanted to put me to the test, to see what I would prefer. But the kingdom of the divine will is over everything else. I remain faithful to the work to which I have consecrated myself with a vow." Unquote. In another letter to Louisa, Father Beda wrote, quote, The kingdom of the divine will keeps me busy day and night. It is the most important thing in my life, and I would like this divine will to be my own life. The deeper we penetrate into this treatise, the more we discover the divine, which absorbs us and penetrates us so gently and sweetly that to follow it and live it is everything." Unquote. One cannot help but see a connection between Father Beda and Pope Benedict XVI. For indeed, both being in Bavaria, Germany, at the same time, we see years later than when Cardinal Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict XVI, presented his new autobiography to the German-speaking world in a press conference. He did so in the Kloster Andex Monastery in Upper Bavaria, the very monastery where Father Bida was buried. Note well that when the cause for beatification and canonization of Luisa Picaretta was officially proposed, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, at the time the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, nullified the previous condemnations of the Index, thereby removing the impediment to Luisa's cause. Thus, on the Feast of Christ the King, Sunday, November 20th, 1994, the process for the cause of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, was finally opened. And most recently, the second theologian assigned to evaluate the writings of Luisa Picaretta, 
by the Vatican Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, has given a positive, that is, a favorable judgment. This means that both of the official censors' laborium for the cause of Louisa have found nothing contrary to the faith in her writings, and her cause can now go forward. That from Padre Bernardino Bucci. We will hear more about Pope Benedict XVI's connection to the writings of Louisa later in this presentation. St. Pio of Pietrosina also made comment about Louisa. From Padre Bucci's biography, he recounts, quote, Luisa said to my aunt, Rosaria Bucci, you will be my witness. And one day, Padre, now Saint Pio, told her point blank in his Benevento dialect, Rosaria, go ahead, go ahead, for Luisa is great and the world will be full of Luisa. After the venerated Padre Pio's death, my aunt said one day, Padre Pio prophesied that Luisa would be known throughout the world. And she repeated the phrase Padre Pio had said in his dialect. Another connection with Saint Pio and servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, comes from Miss Adriana Palati, a spiritual daughter of Saint Padre Pio who moved from Northern Italy to San Giovanni Rotondo in 1945 to live near Padre Pio. In an interview with Padre Bucci, Miss Palati conveyed that, quote, Padre Pio encouraged her to spread Luisa Picaretta's spirituality in San Giovanni Rotondo and to help disseminate the divine will throughout the world as Padre Pio desired, unquote. She opened a house of the divine will at San Giovanni Rotondo, keeping alive the torch lit by Padre Pio with Frederico Abresh. In an interview with Miss Palati at this house of prayer for the kingdom of the divine will, she stated that, quote, he, Padre Pio, knew and loved Luisa and her writings, unquote. The slide here on the right contains links to other YouTube video interviews with Adriana Palati. Another key figure in the church who has spoken highly of Luisa is Cardinal Jose Sareva Martin, Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. In his preface for the Vatican biography, The Son of My Will, by Maria Rosaria del Genio, he expressed high praise of Luisa and her writings, calling them profound and noting that Luisa, quote, in her obedience to her confessors, one sees her nailed to her bed of suffering for about 70 years in order to create a magnificent masterpiece of love for all creatures, unquote. He also points out that she, Luisa, learns from the book of the cross that the will of God is not about carrying out orders received, but a gift in which one must place before all else the center of one's life. This living in the divine will is the actual way in which the Son, Jesus, lived on earth, bringing here with him the life of heaven. Another recognition of the beauty of the divine will writings of Luisa comes from the Vicar General of the Archdiocese of Trani, Barletta, Biscaglia, Nazareth, Monsignor Saviano Gianotti, where he prays in the communique regarding the Second International Congress of the Archdiocese. Quote, may Jesus Christ present in the Eucharist guide us as he has guided his servant, Louisa." Unquote. Now we turn our attention to Dr. Father Domenico Franze, 
whom had profound words to say about Louisa. He was a medical surgeon and served as professor of physiology and missionary medicine at the International Antonianum Pontifical University, an associate emeritus of the Pontifical Academy of Rome. In a letter to the General Superior for the Rogationists after the death of Saint Father Hannibal de Francia, he stated the following about Louisa. Quote, Reverend Father, I tell you that it is my judgment, both as a priest and physician, that only a mortified and continuously mortified soul, only a human will fused in the divine will, could arrive at concepts so basic and fundamental as those which this soul reveals. And this is achieved without studies or schooling, being only on a bed of pain and spasm, with an extremely limited background in literature, theology, or asceticism. Yet, she speaks with true competence about the most obscure things and gives solutions to the most difficult problems and takes the soul of one who reads her writings to the most aromatic spheres of virtue." Unquote. Another amazing statement by a prominent and learned priest was from Father Consalvo Valls. He served as professor of dogmatic theology, mysticism, and other subjects at the Antonianum Pontifical University of Rome, and as the delegate examiner for the revision of the books for the Order of Franciscan Friars Minor. This concept here he stated about Louisa accompanied a letter by Father Franze, whom we just looked at on this previous slide. He wrote, quote, by all these observations made in a brief manner and by the comparisons made, I am of the intimate conviction that the person in question is a soul of God and that the work being done in her is divine. I do not know the life or the story of the soul, but to justify my concept of her, the examination of this book is sufficient. Along with the effect that I myself received from reading it, which made new longings of spiritual improvement descend gently into my spirit, only God has the keys of the heart and he makes them vibrate towards holiness." Unquote. Now we turn to Father Angelo Sardone, the postulator general of the Congregation of the Rogationist Fathers. In 2018, he took relics of St. Anibale to Luis's home on February 4, 2018, to commemorate the life of St. Anibale and highlight his connection with servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. In his address to attendees of the week-long event of spirituality, Father Sardone stated, quote, Saint Anibale, with the presence of his relics, spiritually enriched the city of Carato, staying for eight days at the church Santa Maria Greca, where the tomb of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, is guarded. It was indeed touching to be simultaneously in front of two models of holiness linked together by an intense spiritual relationship and united, we could say, by one single mission, to live and spread the divine will." Unquote. Another connection between Luisa Picaretta and Saint Padre Pio is found in the biography of Luisa the Little Daughter of the Divine Will, written by Father Pablo Martin Sangiol. In Luisa's biography, which he wrote, called The Little Daughter of the Divine Will, it is written, quote, Luisa was bedridden in Carato since her teen years, and Padre Pio was cloistered all his adult life at Our Lady of Grace Friary in San Giovanni Rotondo. Therefore, they never met in person. However, 
Luisa and Padre Pio exchanged greetings and prayers, and each referred visitors to the other. Unquote. We turn now to Father Ricardo Pignatelli. He was the postulator general of the cause of Saint Anibale Maria de Francia. He noted that, quote, I can maintain that the process of canonization of Father Anibale was influenced also by his relationship with the Luisa. I must also affirm that, in her turn, Luisa was drawn by Father Anibale to share also in the concern for the Rogate, unquote. Luisa Picaretta wrote in volume 21, quote, I was worried about Father Anibale's health. Then from inside of me, I heard Jesus say, daughter of mine, he has been given a mission. I will bring him to heaven. He will continue his mission from here. He will shed his light on those who follow him." Unquote. Father Pignatelli also wrote uh, this about Luisa, quote, The devotion to Luisa Picaretta has helped spread the message and mission of Saint Anibale throughout the United States, Latin America, the Philippines, and elsewhere. In getting to know Luisa, her devotees, have been introduced to the beloved founder of the Rogationist Fathers and the daughter of the divine zeal." Unquote. Cardinal Fernando Sento, who was the apostolic nuncio of the Catholic Church, was good friends with Luisa Picaretta until her passing. Aunt Rosaria, who had had a close friendship with the Cardinal Sento since she was young, mentioned that the Cardinal would spend long hours talking to Luisa. And on one occasion, the Cardinal told Rosaria that Luisa liked to joke with him, saying that they would dye him red. And he would joke back, saying that he would try not to have himself rigged out in a fancy dress. However, Rosaria recalled a somber occasion when Luisa was condemned by the Holy Office. Despite this censure, Cardinal Sento continued to visit Luisa. When she asked about the situation, he replied that they were the ones most hurt by it, and that these were tremendous trials sent by the Lord. Cardinal Sento frequently expressed deep admiration for Luisa's life and spiritual doctrine, saying that the writings would drive him into ecstasy. He desired to live out those truths and hope for the publication of more volumes, and that it's what the Lord himself wants. He said, the lighted lamp should not be hidden under a bushel. He who is the light of the world will know how to overcome all obstacles. In 1917, the Archbishop of Trani at the time, Archbishop Giovanni Regine, due to disbelief and open hostility towards the writings of servant of God Luisa Picoretta, issued a severe decree that prohibited priests from entering and celebrating Holy Mass in Luisa Picoretta's home. Originally a privilege that had been granted to Luisa by Pope Leo XIII and confirmed by Pope Pius X in 1907. This measure was to be publicly announced in all the churches of the diocese. However, despite this dark period, a miraculous event took place to rectify this impediment. This is what happened. While the Archbishop was signing his famous decree, he was suddenly afflicted by a partial paralysis. When the priests present at that moment came to his help, he made them understand that he wanted to be taken to Luisa's house. Aunt Rosaria described this unusual episode in this way. It was about 11 o'clock when we heard the sound of a carriage that stopped right outside the porch of Luisa's house. I looked out from the balcony to see who it was and saw three priests. 
one of them, as it were, supported by the other two. Louisa said to me, open the door, the bishop is coming. In fact, Archbishop Regine was at the door, supported by two other priests, probably the vicar and chancellor of the Curia of Trani. The bishop was uttering incomprehensible words. He was immediately ushered into Louisa's room. It was his first visit to the home of the servant of God, who, as soon as she saw him, said, Bless me, your excellency. The bishop raised his hand as though nothing had happened and blessed her. He was completely cured. Archbishop Regine remained in Louisa's room in a secret conversation for about two hours, and to the wonder of all, especially the priests, he emerged from her room smiling. He blessed those present and left. An effort was made to keep the case secret, and so it remained to the wider public. As long as he was in Trani, Archbishop Regine regularly visited Luisa Picoretta, with whom he would have spiritual conversations. This episode inspired a sacred fear in the clergy, and Luisa's holy confessor, Gennaro Di Gennaro, was able to continue his ministry more peacefully. After this event, Anibale Maria di Francia also visited the servant of God more often. On November 20th, 1994, on the Solemnity of Christ the King in the Mother Church of Corrado, Archbishop Carmelo Casati of the Diocese of Trani Barletta Biscaglia, having received the Nanab Star issued by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, blessed the opening of the cause of beatification and canonization of Servant of God Luisa Picaretta. At the 50th anniversary of the transit into heaven of Servant of God Luisa Picaretta, Archbishop Casati stated, 50 years after her death, the writings of Luisa are more than alive in the souls who follow her from one end of the earth to the other. Souls who draw from the crystal clear doctrine of the divine will, a lesson of sanctity that spreads its roots in the will of God as life in man and as a complete fulfillment of the prayer of the Our Father. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Padre Bucci, who frequently conversed with the prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, Cardinal Pietro Palazzini, reveals to us that Cardinal Palazzini learned about Luisa Picaretta and her spirituality by his dear friend and teacher, Cardinal Fernando Sento. He referred to her as the dear Luisa, and he said with confidence that the raising of Luisa to the honors of the altar would be a benefit for the whole church because of the novelty and depth of her message on the divine will, which is a doctrine that has always been accepted by the church. He also acknowledged that while her writings might have imperfections due to lack of a formal education, it was the church's role to correct them, recognizing that Louisa was neither a theologian or a philosopher, but also that her writings and entire spirituality are a brilliant deepening of the prayer of the Our Father, especially the phrase, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Cardinal Palazzini lastly emphasizes that Luisa was totally submissive to the authority of the priesthood and firmly within the magisterium of the church. Cardinal Jose Martins, who was the prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, attended and said at the Fourth International Congress on the Servant of God Luisa Picaretta, titled Church and the Divine Will, that marked the 150th anniversary of her birth. 
that he was impressed with two elements that characterized the first day in her life. The first element was Louisa's receiving the gift of divine life at the moment of her baptism. That moment planted the precious seed of the very holiness of Jesus within her, which would germinate in her life in conformity to the divine volition of Jesus in her daily acts made of prayer, work, and so many encounters with the Lord. Louisa lived a life of ordinariness, but with the continuous tension of asking, even the most smallest of acts, the presence of Jesus to give glory to God the Father, the praise and adoration that all men should give him, and that she has done always and for all. The second element was the date of Louisa's birth, April 23rd, 1865. This day marked the Sunday in Albis, and that Pope John Paul II would consecrate this Sunday to divine mercy. This seemed to Cardinal Martins to be an anticipating sign in the life of Louisa. Lastly, Cardinal Martins highlighted that despite facing major catastrophic events, such as various epidemics, two wars, and has collected so many tears from the hard conditions of life, Luisa Picaretta transformed her own heart into a place totally inhabited by God. Those who have met her felt drawn to the heavenly reality she embodied and are driven to live holy lives amid ordinary daily activities, emulating the model of the family of Nazareth. The Cardinal emphasized that it is in the ordinary aspects of life that God's mercy seeks to restore humanity to the innocence of Eden, to a life weaved with joy and the certainty of being loved as the children of God. Last but most significant, this is the story of how the writings of servant of God Luisa Picaretta were made known to Pope Benedict XVI while he was still prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith during the pontificate of His Holiness, John Paul II. It is thanks to Jose Acuna that this was made possible and to his daughter Alejandra Acuna that we have an account of how this happened. In 1989, in Alta Camoco, Mexico, Jose Luis Acuna met with Bishop Ricardo Guizar Diaz and gave him the last book of Don Octavio Michelini that he had translated and published, titled The Cup is Overflowing, containing an appendix written by Mr. Acuna, because Monsignor Guizar had requested these books for the priests of the Diocese of Aguas Calientes. Mr. Acuna took advantage of these meetings to introduce the bishop to the writings of Luisa Picaretta and gave him some of the copies that he had already translated. Monsignor Guizar thought that the appendix was of great importance and subsequently made his ad illumina visit. During this time, he visited Cardinal Ratzinger and gave him a copy of the appendix written by Mr. Acuna. Cardinal Ratzinger was most interested in this writing because the appendix talked about the attacks and problems of the church, but also that those attacks originated precisely from the devil and his partisans to impede in the church and through her the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Due to hearing about the interest shown by Cardinal Ratzinger, Mr. Acuna planned to meet with His Excellency to tell him more about the Divine Will. Monsignor Guizar wrote Mr. Acuna a recommendation letter to ensure that Mr. Acuna could be afforded an audience with the Cardinal Ratzinger. Before their meeting, 
Mr. Acuna and his wife flew to Corrado, Italy, where they visited the association Luisa Picaretta and spoke with the Archbishop of Trani, Monsignor Giuseppe Carrada, and informed him of their upcoming visit with the Cardinal. Archbishop Carrada insisted that they mention to Cardinal Ratzinger that soon they were going to beatify the Venerable Father and now Saint Anibale Maria di Francia, Luisa Picaretta's confessor of 17 years. Upon his return to Mexico, Mr. Acuna informed Monsignor Guizar about the interview with Cardinal Ratzinger. And in the beginning of July, he selected other chapters of the writings of Luisa and sent them to the Cardinal Ratzinger with the letter stating, among other things, quote, I annex other paragraphs selected from different volumes of Luisa, which some of them make us see a luminous future for the Holy Church and for humanity, end quote. Monsignor Guizar returned to Rome to assist with the Synod of Bishops and providentially was present at St. Anibale's beatification. He once again visited Cardinal Ratzinger, and during a conversation, Monsignor Guizar emphasized how Father Anibale had given such importance to Luisa Picaretta's writings, emphasizing the importance of the mission and the writings of Luisa in the church. His eminence answered, saying, all of the writings of Luisa must be approved. This is the personal thank you note from Cardinal Ratzinger to Mr. Acuna for sending him additional copies of Servant of God Luisa Picaretta's writings, which was provided by Alejandra Acuna. This final section of the presentation will examine the role of priests in the divine will. Padre Bucci says, quote, Our duty is exactly this, a correct interpretation of the writings of Luisa Picaretta in the light of the magisterium of the church. This is the precise will of this soul, all of God, and very faithful and very obedient daughter of the church. End quote. Padre Bucci also says, quote, It would be as foolish for a lay person to stand at the altar and say, This is my body, as it would be for them to teach the divine will. End quote. Padre Bucci teaches that there are four key things an individual needs to prepare themselves in order to read Luisa Picaretta's writings. They are, one, perfect uniformity to the will of God, two, profound humility, three, obedience that must be connected to the will of God, fourth, intense spirituality, to be a Eucharistic soul devoted to the Most Holy Virgin in daily rosary, and to be totally subjected to the priestly authority and the magisterium of the church. Now, let us view a brief video clip of Padre Bucci himself reflecting and, and expanding on these points. It is not appropriate to read her writings without a proper preparation. To approach her writings, and to live according to the heart of God, and to begin the path to perfection that leads the soul to live the divine will, four things are needed. Perfect uniformity to the will of God, because a soul will never be able to love perfectly if not with the will of God himself. In fact, by loving God with the same will, the soul reaches to love God in the neighbor according to his way of loving. 
Second, profound humility. Placing himself in front of God and creatures as the last. Perfect humility overall. Because any slightest lack of purity, both in loving and in working, it goes from the heart to the soul and is reflected in the body which remains modeled. Third, obedience that must be connected to the will of God. In fact, if the virtue concerns the superiors that God gives on earth, the will of God is the obedience which concerns God directly. Both are virtues of obedience. The will of God is a very high spirituality. Therefore, living the divine will, propagating the kingdom of the divine will in the world. It means that it is no longer man who governs the world, but is God who governs it. But to understand these matters, a soul needs to have an intense spirituality. And there are three aspects. It must be a Eucharistic soul. A soul that spends many hours before God in the sacrament is already a beginning. To understand the great spirituality of the divine will, it must be a soul devoted to the Most Holy Virgin. And the rosary must be his daily prayer. Moreover, it must be a soul totally subjected to the priestly authority, to the magisterium of the church. So much so that her writings must always be read under the guidance of priestly authority. After a soul lives this spirituality, then, with some confidence, can begin to read Luisa Picaretta's writings. A good recommendation for reading is the book titled The Role of Priests in the Divine Will, and is a compilation of Luisa Picaretta's writings regarding what the Lord has said to her about the importance of the priesthood in the dissemination of the divine will. Jesus Christ stated to Louisa in the Book of Heaven that it is his usual way to manifest his works through the priests. And our Lord explains to Louisa that, quote, Now, my daughter, the kingdom of redemption and the kingdom of my divine fiat hold hands. And since it is also a universal good, such that if they want it so, all can enter into it. It is necessary that many know the news about it, and that it be conceived in the minds, in the words, in the works and hearts of many, so that through prayers, desires, and holier life, they may dispose themselves to receive the kingdom of my divine will into their midst. If the news is not divulged, my manifestations will not act as trumpeters, nor will the knowledges about my divine fiat fly from mouth to mouth, forming the conception of it in the minds, prayers, sighs, and desires of creatures. My divine volition will not make its triumphant entrance of coming to reign upon earth. How necessary it is that the knowledges about my divine fiat be known. Not only this, but that it be made known that my divine will already wants to come reign on earth as it does in heaven, in the midst of creatures. And it is to the priests as to new prophets, through the word as well as through writing and through works, that the task is given of acting as trumpeters in order to make known what regards my divine fiat." End quote. How can priests disseminate the truths and knowledge of the divine will? This can be accomplished by encouraging parishioners to pray and meditate on the 24 hours of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
encourage parishioners to meditate on the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will during the month of May. Give parishioners copies of the three appeals of Jesus, Mary, and Louisa, and encourage them to meditate on these at Eucharistic Adoration. And to encourage Divine Will Cynicals to form in their parishes, ensuring a competent priest teaches from the writings of Louisa, Holy Scripture, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. A great example of this is the website www.divinewill.life. It is a compilation of Divine Will lessons given by Reverend B. Thomas Seltzer, who has studied the writings of Louisa for 47 years and was the spiritual son of the late Padre Giuseppe Bernardino Bucci. That concludes this presentation on the divine will for bishops and priests. All the websites, links, names, videos, and documents mentioned within this presentation will be made available to you in the appendix section of this presentation file. The file will be provided to you depending on the method that you've received this video. If this has been emailed to you, you will receive a copy of this via email as well. Or if you're viewing this on a website, the link to the file will be provided in the video description. Thank you very much to the bishops and priests for your precious time and attention and all that you do for Holy Mother Church. Hopefully, God willing, this information inspires you to dive even deeper into the life of Servant of God Louisa Picaretta and her writings. May our Lord bless all of you, his ministers, as he uses you to further his kingdom, so that the will of the Father may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. All right, Fiat, um, for those of you that would like to see this presentation again, you can find it on the Fiat Luisa YouTube channel. It's actually the welcoming video right now that's posted, or you can just do a, a search for Bishop's presentation and it should come up. And within the description, as uh, the good friend of ours noted, um, there is a way to request the actual presentation itself. So since we have 15 more minutes before we see Father Celso, we're gonna go ahead and dive over into um, one of the readings of the Passion. Um, it was mentioned that preparation is needed before diving into this great book of heaven that we are studying the writings on. And Archbishop Picchietti, the late Archbishop Picchietti, may he rest in the peace of Christ, used to tell um, tell people that one of the ways to prepare was to read the Passion, the 24 hours of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ by the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, and to do that for three years before you ever open the Book of Heaven. So if any of you have not ever been exposed to the 24 hours of the Passion, um, you can find that also on the Fiat Louisa YouTube channel read in two different voices, one English uh, or American accent and one in an Italian accent. So to this moment, you will get a version of the Italian accented reading, and it will be the 24th hour, which is the hour that, hold on. It's the hour, it's the burial, the burial of Jesus, desolated, Mary Most Holy. We'll get the first part of it now and the second part between lessons four and five. Fiat. the 24 hours of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luisa Piccareta, the little daughter of the divine will. Preparation before each hour. O oh, 
my Lord Jesus Christ. Prostrate in your divine presence, I implore your most loving heart to admit me to the sorrowful meditation of the 24 hours in which for love of us you wanted to suffer so much in your adorable body and in your most holy soul unto death on the cross. Oh, please, give me help, grace, love, deep compassion and understanding of your sufferings as I now meditate this hour. And for those which I cannot meditate, I offer you my will to meditate them, and I willingly intend to meditate them in all the hours in which I have to apply myself to my duties or sleep. Accept, O oh merciful Lord, my loving intention, and let it be beneficial for me and for all, as if I effectively and in a saintly way accomplished what I wish to practice. Meanwhile, I give you thanks, O oh my Jesus, for calling me to union with you by means of prayer. And to please you more, I take your thoughts, your tongue, your heart, and with this I intend to pray, fusing all of myself in your will and in your love, and stretching out my arms to hug you, I place my head on your heart. And I begin. Twenty-fourth hour, from 4 to 5 p.m. The Burial of Jesus Desolate Mary Most Holy My sorrowful mamma, I see that you dispose yourself to the final sacrifice of having to give burial to your lifeless son, Jesus. Most resigned to the will of God, you accompany him and you place him in the sepulcher with your own hands. But as you compose those limbs and are about to give him the last goodbye and the last kiss, you feel your heart being torn from your breast because of the pain. Love nails you to those limbs, and by force of love and sorrow, your life is about to fade together with your lifeless son. Poor Mama, how shall you go on without Jesus? He is your life, your all. Yet, it is the will of the Eternal One that wants it so. You will have to fight against two insurmountable powers, love and divine will. Love nails you in such a way that you cannot separate from Him. The divine will imposes itself and wants the sacrifice. Poor Mama, how shall you go on? How much compassion I feel for you. Oh, please, angels of heaven, come to raise her from the stiffened limbs of Jesus. Otherwise, she will die. But, oh, portent, while she seemed to be extinguished together with Jesus, I hear her voice trembling and interrupted by sobs, saying, Beloved son, O oh son, this was the only relief which was left to me, and which halved my pains. Your most holy humanity, pouring myself out on these wounds, adoring them, kissing them. Now this too, is taken away from me, because the divine will wants it so. And I resign myself. But no, son, that I want it, and I cannot. At the mere thought of doing it, my strength leave me, and life runs away from me. 
O oh, please, O oh, son, so that I may have life and strength to be able to depart. Allow me to remain all buried in you and to take for myself your life, your pains, your reparations, and all that you are. Ah, oh, only an exchange of life between you and me can give me the strength to make the sacrifice of departing from you. So determined, my afflicted mamma, I see that you go through those limbs again, and you place your head in the head of Jesus. Kissing it, you enclose in it your thoughts, and you take for yourself his thorns, his afflicted and offended thoughts, and everything he suffered in his most holy head. Oh, how you would want to animate the intelligence of Jesus with your own, to be able to give life for life. You now begin to feel revived by having taken the thoughts and the thorns of Jesus into your mind. Sorrowful Mama, I see you kiss the lifeless eyes of Jesus, and I feel pierced in seeing that Jesus no longer looks at you. How many times his gazes filled you with paradise and made you rise again from death to life. And now, not seeing yourself gazed upon, you feel you're dying. Therefore you place your eyes in those of Jesus, and you take for yourself his eyes, his tears, and his bitternesses in seeing the offenses of creatures, and the many insults and scorns. But I see, my pierced mamma, that you kiss his most holy ears, and you call him over and over again, saying, my son, how can it be that you no longer listen to me? You, who would hear my slightest motion. And now I cry, I call you, and you do not hear me. Ah, love is the most cruel tyrant. You are more than my own life for me. And now I will have to survive so much pain. Therefore, O oh son... I leave my hearing in yours, and I take for myself what you have suffered in your most holy hearing, and the echo of the offenses that resounded in it. Only this can give me life, your pains, your sorrows. And as you say this, the pain and the grip on your heart is so great that you lose your voice and remain motionless. My poor mamma, my poor mamma, how much compassion I feel for you, how many cruel deaths you suffer. But the divine will imposes itself and gives you motion, and you look at his most holy face, you kiss it and exclaim, Adored son, how disfigured you are! Ah, if love did not tell me that you are my son, my life, my all, I would no longer recognize you, so unrecognizable you are. Your beauty was transformed into deformity, your cheeks into bruises, and the light, the grace of your face, which was such that seeing you and remaining beatified, was the same thing, has turned into paleness of death. O oh, beloved son, son, how you're reduced. What an awful crafting sin has made upon your most holy limbs. Ah, how much would your inseparable mamma want to give you back your original beauty? I want to fuse my face in yours and take for myself your face, and the slaps, the spit, 
the scorns, and everything you have suffered in your most holy face. Ah, son, if you want me alive, give me your pains, otherwise I will die. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of all saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, that was Marina. She did the translation. She's from the Puglia area. And uh, you can see why the Vicar General told us you have the best of the translations. Uh, in Italy, the translator is called the traitor because you put on paper the way you think. Uh, like for example, when, when the first uh, writings came out, uh, the man who translated it had difficulty with his father. And when, she, when Luis would talk about her father, there was a harshness at the first readings. And we were told not to read those first readings because they're not explaining what Luisa was explaining. And now you have Marina who loved her father. They were close in their relationship. And what was so amazing is you hear the love. You hear, like she said, when I, when I listen to Luisa, when I read Luisa, I hear my grandmother speaking to me in that dialect. So she understood uh, what the words meant in, in Puglia. They're different than the way they're expressed in, in, in Rome. In Rome, it's a whole different language. So what we have, and this is the best part, we have the best of the translations at this point, and we wait for the official translations that are going to come out. But the Vicar General, when we were, we were down at EWTN, he said, you know, what are you reading? And we go, ah. <laughs> and we went, we're reading this. And he, read it, he says, good. He says, Marina is good. you got a good translation because she understood the dialect. She understood the heart of Louisa, you know, and what, what a great blessing we have, we have by having these translations. So we're continuing with volume 19, 620, 1926. And Louisa says, my love Jesus, my ideal is to fulfill your most holy divine will. So Jesus is going to ask us, what is your ideal? What is, what is the best that you want? What do you want? I have to give it to you. My ideal is to fulfill your most holy divine will, Louisa says. And all my purpose is to reach to the point of which no thought, no word, no heartbeat, no work of mine may ever go out of the kingdom of your supreme will. Now, this is volume 19. She's learned how to do the will of God, 1 through 10. She's learned how to live live in the will of God, 1 through 19, and now God is getting ready for her to receive the divine inheritance of the Father, which is the divine inheritance of the Father is the way Adam lived before the fall. And when Adam fell, Jesus says, I saw Lucifer fall like lightning to the earth. Where Adam fell, he had to go where Lucifer was because he obeyed Lucifer. Why are we in this situation? Because Adam said, echoed, I will not serve, I will not obey. And because that echo, we echo, because this is what we say when we go to confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This is what I thought. This is what I said. This is what I did. This is what I failed to do. It's part of our life. And we don't want to live like this. This is why we go to confession. I want to make a firm purpose of amendment to avoid all the near occasions of sin. This near occasions of sin is the human will. So what does Jesus say? He says, look it. He says, you've done it your way. I've done it my way. He says, I, you've done it your way. He says, now let's do it my way. So she says, to, so Louisa says to Jesus, Jesus, my ideal, what I wish for, what I pray for is to fulfill your most holy divine will. Father, he says, not my will, but your, your will be done. Our lady said, let, fiat mihi, let it be done as you say, you tell me. And to Louisa's fiat voluntas may your kingdom, God reign in me on earth as it is in heaven. 
And he says, and that all, she says, that will reach the point to which no thought, no word, no heartbeat, no work of mine may ever go out of the kingdom of your supreme fiat. Even more, she says, that it may be conceived, nourished, raised, and formed their life. And if needed, their death. So I know that your will acts, no act dies, but once this you, you do something in the divine will, it is born and lives eternally. See, when we do the acts in the rounds of the divine will, it's Jesus in us that's doing it. It's Mary in us, the new Adam and the new Eve. It's this new and divine way of holiness. Uh, that's what we're going to call this from, from now on, the new and divine way of holiness. Because this is, I was 30 feet away from John Paul II, President Pope St. John Paul II, when he said this. At the canonization of St. Honorable de Francia, he says, you know, in his in his language, we now are going to enter a new and divine way of holiness. I went, oh, is he reading Louisa? Because that's what Arch that's what St. Honorable de Francia said, Louisa's spiritual director. So we want, what is our ideal? I don't want any thought, any word, any deed that I have done ever outside of the divine will of God. I want to do everything in the will of God. And even more, I want everything to be conceived in you, Jesus, as you're conceived in my heart, as you begin your life in my heart. I want every thought, every word, every deed to be go, go through your conception so that you, Jesus, breathe in my breathing. You, Jesus, beat in my heart beating. You, Jesus, pray in my praying. I want to be conceived, nourished, and raised. I want these acts and thoughts and words formed in your life. And even if they, even if they have to die, he says, I know, she says, that no acts in the divine will ever dies. But once they are born in the divine will, once they are conceived in, in the human heart, which is the place where Jesus lives, where our lady lives, it will live forever. This new and divine way of holiness and this abundant life that Jesus says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, is the life of Jesus and Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve. This is a great time to be alive. So it is the kingdom of your divine will and my poor soul that I, Louisa, long for, that we, the little children of Louisa, long for. We want nothing, nothing of earth. We want everything of heaven. This is all my ideal. This is my primary and ultimate purpose for being on earth is to live in your divine will. This is what Jesus says to Louisa. And then Jesus says now, this is what Louisa says to Jesus, I said, and now it's Jesus saying, Jesus, all love and making feast. He has Louisa, my daughter. My, so your, my, your ideal and my ideal are, your, are one. My ideal and your ideal are one. See, this is what we want. We want to be one with God. When you receive Holy Communion, Lord, I want, I want you to reign in me. I want you to breathe in my breathing, beat in my heart beating. I don't want to ever be separated from you. And that's why Jesus says, I give in the church, the Holy Church, my Eucharist. Why? To prepare them for the perennial communion with God. As Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening, God now wants that in us. He wants to walk in us and our walking. He wants to talk in our talking. He wants to breathe in our breathing. He wants us to be one with him, beat in our heart beating. He says, Louisa, my ideal and yours are one. Therefore, one is our purpose. Brava, brava. Finally, I have the little daughter of my divine will. And since your ideal and mine are one, you too have sustained a long battle of long years to conquer the kingdom of my divine will. How? Through your sufferings. What, what did Louisa do? Jesus said to Louisa, I want you to stay in bed. She could walk at 17 years old. I want you to go to bed and stay there. And she was obedient. And then she, Jesus says, Louisa, I don't want you to eat anymore. And she was obedient. I don't want you to drink anymore. And she was obedient. I didn't want you to sleep anymore. And she was obedient. What does this mean? Oh, God gave her the grace not to be hungry. God gave her the grace not to be sleepy. God gave her the, no, she was starving. <laughs> she was, she was tired. She was thirsty and she gave it up for God. What did God say to Adam? Don't eat of the tree of the front fruit in the center of the garden. Don't eat of that or you'll die that day. He couldn't obey that. So he put Louisa through the test. This is why God loves Louisa so much. What did she do? She did what Adam couldn't do. And God pushed her to the limit. 
Like Father Bucci said, he was there when he fed Louisa because the, the bishop said to Louisa, you must eat. You can't, you can't starve anymore. You must eat. So she said to Jesus, he asked me to eat. You told me not to eat. What should I do? He says, obey the bishop. So she obeyed the bishop and he, Father Bucci brought up a tray with, uh, I think, two pieces of, of crackers, two crackers and three grapes. And she, he handed it to Louisa. Now he's a little boy at the time. And Louisa takes the crackers and chews them. And she says, thank you. Takes the crackers and chews. I think she first said, do you want some? And he said, no. And so she took the crackers and she ate them. Then she took the grapes and she ate them and swallowed them. And then she asked for the plate again. She got the plate and the cracker came out. The cracker came out. The grape came out. The grape came out. The grape. She put it on. She handed it back to Father Bucci. And Father Bucci looks. He says, the grapes were glistening. He said, I wanted to eat them. He says, they look so beautiful. Now, here, Louisa is obedient to the bishop, but obedient to Jesus. She ate and she didn't vomit. They just came back up whole and clear and beautiful. This was witnessed by Father Bucci. And, and the thing about it is she was obedient to the bishop. She was obedient to Jesus, giving us an example of what we should be doing. It doesn't matter, even if, even if it seems as it's a contrary to what Jesus wants. God is going to take care of it. He loves obedience. Adam was disobedient. Adam was unfaithful. That's why being faithful, obedient to Christ and his church is so, so beautiful. And Jesus goes, good, good. You're on the way. But what more do you want? And he says, we say to him, like Louisa, my ideal want is yours, Lord. And God says, brava, brava. Since your ideal and mine are one, you too have sustained the long battle, the long years of suffering to conquer the kingdom of God, divine wealth, conquer the kingdom of the divine will. You had to endure pains. You had to endure privations. You have been even a prisoner in your room, Louisa, for bound to your little bed. He said, crucified to your little bed. Why? To conquer the kingdom of the divine will. So much wanted and longed for by me, Jesus says, my mother and you, Louisa. Finally, finally, there's a newborn who has conquered the kingdom, the kingdom of the divine will. By how? By her obedience. This is why a lot of people say, I don't want to go through what Louisa went through. Well, you're not going to. You're not Louisa. <laughs> and you, 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 wouldn't be, you can't even endure a, a sliver. You can't even endure a cramp in your foot. And you're going you're gonna to not fit. You're going to fast. You're going to pray. You're gonna, like Louisa, I don't think so. She did it for us. As Jesus and Mary did redemption, God found the newborn, Louisa, to do sanctification for us. So Jesus says, this kingdom has been longed for by me and for you. The cost of much to both, it cost both of us much. And now we are both triumphant. We are both conquerors, the king and the queen and the little newborn. This is Louisa. And as you read the book of heaven, you begin to see, I, I couldn't do that. And God goes, that's right. <laughs> you can't do it. She did it for you. She's the newborn. She's the first one. What does Jesus say? Who is my mother? Who is my brothers? The ones who do the will of the father. Louisa not only did the will of the father, but she lived in the divine will. So Jesus says this, Louisa, so you too are a little queen in the kingdom of my divine will. Even though you are little, you were always queen because you were the little daughter of the divine great king, our celestial heavenly father. That's what he wants to do with us. Jesus says, Louisa, your children are going to become my divine masterpieces. Your Again, he's working on us. He's teaching us. He's leading us and guiding us to what? To him and his church. Why? So that we can possess the gift that Adam lost. This is the gift of gifts. This is the prodigy of prodigies. When you read the book of heaven, it is so beautiful. If you can't read, find Marina's, find Marina's translations. Listen to the way she reads this. I remember when she went through uh, one through 19 and then we got the higher volumes and then she went through one through 36. And when she got to 36, she says, you know, I mistranslated a lot at first because I didn't know the depth of this beauty. So she retranslated everything again. And I'm telling you, 
we have exactly the way Jesus spoke to Louisa in her dialect through little Marina. And when you listen to Marina, you really hear Louisa. You can, you can hear Louisa. It's so beautiful. So Jesus says this, as there therefore as conquerors of a kingdom so great, take possession of all of creation, take possession of all the redemption, take possession of all of every, heaven, everything is yours, Louisa, because you're right. Your rights of possession extend wherever my divine will reigns as whole and permanent. And then he says this, all of heaven, we are waiting for you, Louisa, to give you the honors that befit your victory. What does that mean? We just went through the 40 days and 40 nights of the titles of Louisa. 40 days and 40 nights, why? To prepare us for the sealing of the communities. The holy angels are going to seal the communities and no harm will come to them. Why did we go through those 40 days and 40 nights to get ready? Now, the next event, and again, this is going to be fun because Our Lady of uh, in Brazil, she said that uh, you're going to see the letter A in heaven, in the heavens, in the sky. And see how God works, though. The, the heavens is, is the eclipse on, on April 8th. And the first eclipse, it's like the blessing from northwest to southeast. And this, the, then there's an arch that happened over, over um, Christmas, Christmas time. Okay, so then there's an arch. And then, then the blessing, an arch, and then this way, a blessing from south to north. It's, it's a blessing of the United States. Now, why? Because Our Lady of America said, my children of America will bring purity to the world. What is the purity? It's the true life of Jesus and Mary. Jesus, our Savior. Mary, our Queen. How? Through the little newborn, Louisa. And the A, the arch, in Hebrew means Alpha, the beginning. It's really a beginning of a new era. And then we're going to get ready for something that's going to be extraordinary as well. And that's going to be May 12th. Uh, May 12th is, is we're going to witness on Mother's Day, Our Lady uh, uh, blessing her children in a powerful way. So this time of Lent, this time then of Easter, is going to prepare us for, for a new and divine way of holiness that's coming to all the world. Again, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Look at the heavens. I'm not talking about st astrology, but look at the, the, the stars. Look at what, what the scripture says is going to happen. It's not, I'm not predicting uh, um, uh, anything, but what, the, what, what sacred scripture has always told us, get ready, the, the, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. What's coming to the earth, and Jesus tells us to Louisa, is the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Great and glorious things are right around the corner that we are going to witness. We're, God's got it all planned. He's got it all planned. So you too, he says, you're the little baby who has so much cried for and longed for her Jesus. Are we crying for Jesus? Are we longing for Jesus? Or are we pretty happy with earth? Here's a good television program. Oh, here's great. Here's some sports. Let's watch that. Here's, we're trapped. <laughs> we're trapped with misery. You know, we'd rather cheer pigskin being thrown from one corner of the uh, stadium to the other than cheer Jesus. Adore Jesus. Love Jesus. Praise Jesus. Thank. Well, I got to put in my time. And then, then we wag our, we wag, we wave our flag for what? For our team. I mean, come on. The, the, did you know that all the sports began after the birth of Louisa? We had, yes, we had wrestling, we had running, we had javelin throwing. But all the sports began. Football, basketball, soccer, hockey, tennis, golf. Why, why all these sports? Because that's people's gods. How do I know it's their gods? They're drinking and partying after these sports, celebrating, pigskin being thrown from one end of the ground to the other. That should be for Jesus. 
It should be for our heavenly father. It should for, be for this out, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no, you're, you're a little too conservative. You're exaggerating too much. Who is Jesus in your life? Who is Jesus in your life? He says, he says to Peter, who do people say that I am? And they go through it. And he goes, who do you say that I am? That's what he's asking us. Who is Jesus? Is he your heartbeat? Is he your breath? Is he your steps? Is he, are you praising him and glorifying him and worshiping him? How often do you spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament adoring Jesus in the monstrance? Who is your Jesus? Oh, he's my Lord and my Savior. Real nice. Jesus says, I want a personal relationship with you. I want you to consume me. And then he says, I want to consume you. I want you to become my food, Jesus says. I want to become your food and your life living in the divine will becomes my food. So he says, you too are the little baby who cried so much and longed for Jesus. But soon as you have seen me, your tears have stopped. As soon as you see me, you're flinging of yourself onto my lap. You have attached yourself to my breast and victorious. You have suckled my divine will and my divine love. Like a, like a baby longing for his mother. Don't, don't read this humanly. <laughs> These, this is a mystical language. He says, you're going to come to me like a baby longing to be fed. By who? Our Lord and Savior and Master and King, Jesus, my Savior, my God. As though in triumph, you have taken rest in my very arms as my little one, my new newborn. And I rock you so that your sleep might be longer, that you may, I, God, may enjoy my little newborn in my arms and triumphant extend the kingdom of my divine will in you, Louisa, and now in us. It's, this is the most glorious time to be alive. He saved the best for last. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, we're going to live like this until in a thousand years. No, that's not true. The kingdom of God is at hand, he said, 2,000 years ago. And now with Louisa, he says, I want to enjoy my newborn in my arms, triumphant. And I want to extend my kingdom of my divine will in you, Louisa, and your children. Hopefully that's us. Who are the children of the Luisa? Those that are reading and studying and putting to practice these truths that Jesus breathed into Luisa. And he, he wants to breathe it into us. Volume 19, 7, 1, 19, 26. Now the saints of the Old Testament found themselves in the same condition as Adam. Adam was a divine repeater, repairer. And excuse me, Adam was not a divine repairer. The divine repairer, Jesus, was missing. While rejoining the human race and the divine was the pay of debt of guilty Adam in a divine way. Jesus took the place of guilty Adam. As a matter of uh, Barabbas, Bar, uh, son of Arabbas, son of Abbas. God, Jesus took the place of Adam, died on the cross for him. However, both the ancient saints and the modern saints who have taken my divine will as much as they have known, the very miracles that the saints have performed were little particles of the power of my, my divine will communicated to them by doing the will of God. So all my saints have lived, some in the shadow of my divine will, some in the reflection of its light, some submitted to the power of, of the divine will, some to the order of its commands, because there is no sanctity without my most holy divine will, Jesus says. But have they possessed of the divine will the little of that they've known? No more, because only when a good is known does one long for it and arrives at possessing the gift. No one can possess a good, a property, without knowing it. And suppose one did possess it without knowing it. That good is though dead for him, because the life of knowledge is missing. What is Jesus saying? The saints were great doing the will of God, but possessing the divine will, they never had. Why? They didn't know about it. Why didn't they know about it? Because they didn't have Louisa. Louisa is the newborn. Louisa is the firstborn of the divine will. 
This, this abundant life of Jesus and Mary was breathed into little Louisa. The saints knew how to do the will of God. So what does the saints have done? The saints have built the convents, the rectories, the parishes, the orphanages, the hospitals, the, the schools all over the world. And what's happening right now? All of them are falling apart. Why? They have to. Because the kingdom is coming. The kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven is here. It's here because of what Jesus gave to Louisa. He says, when you read the book of heaven, everything in your life changes. Everything. You become more Catholic. You fall more in love with Jesus. Jesus, you fall more in love with Mary. You fall more in love with the sacraments and sacramentals. You fall more in love with the tradition of the church. You fall more in love with sacred scripture. You fall more in love with the dogma and doctrine. It becomes to make more sense to you. Why? Because the kingdom is coming. He's, he saved the best for last. Everyone is going to be Catholic. Jesus says there'll be one church, one flock, one shepherd. Everyone's going to be Catholic. The universal life that God breathed into Adam is ours. Volume 19, 7 to 1926. My daughter, come with me into the midst of creation. I want to show you heaven and earth. They await you, Louisa. They want you, the one, Louisa, animated by the same divine will that animate, animates creation and redemption and gives life to them and would make the whole of creation resound with a most sweet echo, this this harmony of heaven, the eternal love of their maker. This I love you of God breathing into creation. Now we can breathe it in. We, we're beginning to recognize with our senses, we can hear God and see God and smell God and tusk, touch God and taste God in creation. We can begin to, to taste that I love you. How many people say, oh, this is a beautiful sunset. Well, let's go home and watch TV now. It's like, <laughs> this is the I love you of God. And it's only for a few, a few minutes. He says, enjoy it. Breathe in this I love you. And then give to me. I thank you and I praise you and I love you and I glorify you. When we, when we look at all of creation, it's an I love you of God. He says, enter into this divine I love you. It's, it's amazing. He says, very, very clearly. Uh, I want you to participate in this divine, I love you. He breathes into us this divine, I love you. We breathe out with Jesus praying in our praying, with Mary praying in our praying, and I love you. And this is not human love. It's divine love. It's saying, Jesus, you, you pray in my praying. I can't pray. Mary, pray in my praying. I can't pray. I want to pray but my human misery is, is so great that I can't pray in my praying. I want you to, I want to participate my voice in this echo of, I love you to the father. That's what Adam was doing. That's what Jesus showed Louisa. He says, I want your voice. Jesus says, I want it flowing in each created thing. I want to hear your I love you animated by the mute language, the perennial glory and adoration to their creator, which Jesus and Mary have done. I want to hear that in you. I want to see the DNA of Jesus and Mary in you. He sees it in Louisa. He wants us to participate in all of creation. And he says, since all things are bound to one another, one is the strength of the other, because one is the supreme will that vivifies them, preserves them. And the one who possesses the divine will is bound to them with the same divine strength, with the same divine union that Jesus and Mary have. So if you are not present in the midst of creation because of your absence, they would feel the universal strength, the bond of their inse inseparability lacking in all of creation, if you're not there. Therefore, come into our dominion, God says. For everyone longs for you, Louisa. You're the one that has this gift. And now everybody's going to be linked to you, Louisa. And at the same time, I, God, shall make you comprehend more the things about the great distance that exists between the sanctity of those who possess the unity of the light. This is, this is those in the divine will. And the, and the kingdom of my divine will and the sanctity of the submission of the resignation of the saints who possess these virtues. 
they did the will of God. To live in the will of God, he gave to Louisa. And God now wants us to possess this. What does this mean? It means to enter into paradise on earth as it is in heaven. To begin to praise God and love God and thank God and glorify God and worship God. Not with our human misery, our failed prayers, but with the true life of Jesus and Mary. The new Adam and the new Eve that was given to Louisa. Come into our dominions. For everyone longs for you, Louisa. At the same time, I shall make of you, Louisa, comprehend more things. And he, she gives that to us as we read, as we study. The distance that exists, exists between the sanctity of those who live in the divine will and the sanctity of the saints. There's a vast difference. Volume 19, 822, 1926. Each act of yours, Louisa, done in the divine will is a new horizon which you make arise for the eye of the human intellect to make it long for the light of the good that my holy divine will possesses. Louisa, my daughter, in order to prepare this kingdom, it takes work. It takes celestial laws. And uh, all the laws are laws of love. It's the battle we're in. He calls us to be in his army, the, the divine will army. Why? He says the battle we're in is not a battle of blood. It's a war of love. God is going to conquer all of humanity with this war of love. All the laws of fear, all the laws of penalty, all the laws of condemnation do not enter into the divine will because the laws of love of my divine will shall be friendly, filial, and a reciprocal love between God and man. It shall, listen to this, and therefore fears uh, and condemnations shall have neither force nor love. And if there shall be some suffering, it shall be the full triumph and glory. The, what, what does that mean? The suffering is no more worry, no more fear. This is what you're going to die to. No more worry, no more fear, no more anxiety, no more complaints, no more negativity, no more doubts. You're going to enter into the full, the, the consequences of this is glory and love and triumph of God. And there he says, therefore, be attentive. Because this is about making known a celestial kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. About manifesting its secrets on earth as it is in heaven. Prerogatives, its goods to draw souls to love it, long for it, and take possession of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. This is the fulfillment of the Our Father. God saved the best for last, and he predestined us to be alive at this time to witness what he is going to do. How do I know this? Because Jesus says the sure sign of the kingdom is the book of heaven. What it does, it magnifies sacred scripture. It magnifies our dogma and doctrine. As Our Lady said, my soul magnifies the Lord. What's coming is the light, true life of Jesus and Mary. We're going to be, it's going to be heaven on earth. Jesus said, I rose from the dead. So my children would rise from the death of their human will. Volume 19. Uh, volume 19, 913, 1926. That's the fulfillment of praying your round in our divine will comes your refrain so pleasing to us. Supreme will, supreme majesty. Louisa, your little daughter comes before you. Now this, we're going to echo this. Supreme majesty, the little children of the divine, divine will with Louisa come before you on your paternal knees to ask for your fiat, to ask that your kingdom may come and known by every person, past, present, and future. I ask you for the triumph of your holy divine will, the fulfillment of the Our Father, that it may dominate and reign over all of humanity. I am not only the, the only one who is asking for this, but with me are your works, Jesus, Mary's works, Jesus. Your very will, Jesus, Mary's very will. The two are the same. Therefore, in the name of all, past, present, and future. I ask, I plead for your fiat. Pray this prayer in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Look at Jesus in the monstrance. Pray this prayer in front of him. He's waiting for you to do this because Luis has already done it. And he's saying, now, who wants this? Who wants what I gave to Luisa? And when we say yes, he goes, prove it. Well, how do I prove it? Echo what, uh, what Louisa said. That's what the Echo book is all about. When you read the Echo book, it's just astonishing. Therefore, in the name of everyone and everything, I ask, I plead that your fiat reign on earth as it is in heaven. 
Louisa, if you only knew what a breach in our supreme being is this refrain of yours. We feel, this triune God feels, we are prayed by everyone with all of our works, beseeching our very divine will. Heaven and earth are on their knees asking us, triune God, for the kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, if you want it, continue your acts, continue your prayers. And by reaching the established number, see, there's a certain number that's needed. I remember people say, I've been praying for 10 years and nothing's happened. You haven't finished your prayers yet. There's a certain established number for everything. Some people, you have to pray and even die not seeing it happen, but your prayers are going to be answered. I trust in you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. I have confidence in you, Jesus. I don't have to see it. I know you're going to answer my prayers because what does Jesus say to the apostles? Ask, believe that you have received it, and it is yours. He says, by reaching the established number, you will obtain what you long for with so much insistence. St. Francis said, if you're not praying with, with, with joy, you're not praying. If you're not praying with confidence, you're not praying. People, let people, people, this is how people pray. Please, 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 please. Oh, it didn't happen. Please, 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 please. No, it's Jesus. This is my prayer. I'm confident in you. Remember the woman who was bleeding for 18 years? She said, if I only touch his tassel, this is the, the tillet, the prayer shawl, the, the strings that are hanging down. That's the hem of the prayer shawl. And she says, if I only touch it, why did she say that? Because in Leviticus, it says, the Messiah will heal you by the hem of his garment. So she reached for it. And Jesus says, who did this? <laughs> and the apostles goes, there's so many people here. How, how, how do we know? He knew. And he, look, he looked around, who is going to respond to this? He had to hear from her. I did it. Why did you do this? Because Leviticus says, the Messiah you will be healed by the Messiah. Now, that's one of the reasons when, when the priest wears the stole, the, the habit of the church is you hang on to one end of the stole, okay, as the hem of the garment of Jesus to pray for healing at confession. That's, that's a practice that has been forgotten. But you can ask your priest, can I hold on to your stole as, as the woman held on to the hem? And so what he said, right after that, it says, she looked at Jesus and told him everything. And then what's Jesus' response? Because of your faith, you are healed. Faith in what? I know you are God. I know you are the son of God. I know you are the Messiah. You can heal me. That has to be our faith. It's not please, 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 please. And I said, answer in my prayer. I trust in you. I believe in you. I know you're going to answer my prayer. And I have confidence in you, Lord. I don't have to see the way I want it. I want the, your, your will to be done. Remember in, in volume 36, uh, Louisa said to Jesus, I would like all the children born to the light of the day become baptized Catholic. And Jesus says, it's done. Louisa says, I just prayed for this. How can it be done? And Jesus says, that's my prayer that I gave to you. And you prayed it with confidence and it's completed. What are the prayers that Jesus are asking you to pray? He wants to hear them. He wants to hear them because he wants to answer them because they're his prayers. So this is so great. 520, 10, 12, 19, 26. I felt immersed in the sea of pain and privation of my highest good Jesus. And I asked her, I'm praying my round, praying the round of creation. Pray in the round of redemption. Learn how to pray the rounds. That's how Jesus and Mary prayed for those 30 silent years. That's the way Adam prayed before the fall. Learn how to pray your rounds. We have the book of rounds if you want them. And some people go, it's repetitive. It's rep Yeah, it's praising God and loving God and glorifying God, worshiping God in the name of everyone and everything. It's, it's never ending. That you may obtain what you long for. This is what Jesus is saying. And it was not given to me to find one of whom I so much long for. So the waters of pain swelling more and more drowned me in the sorrows of the pain. But that pain only Jesus can give. That's this. He, he, he stands away from us to see. Do we really long for him? Do we really wait for him? Do we really search for him? 
only a pain that Jesus can give. And he knows how to give to a poor little heart that loves. Does your heart love? He wants more love from you. And because it is little, it cannot sustain the all divine immensity of the bitter waters, the pain of his privation. Therefore, it remains drowned and oppressed, waiting for Jesus, the one who I so much yearn for, so much long for. Like I said, that's what's missing with the little children, holy divine will. The Essenes longed for the Messiah. They went away to the desert longing for the Messiah. Even the last high priest went into the desert to long for the Messiah. That was John the Baptist. Jesus is waiting us for to long for him, to desire him, to search for him. Oh, let's watch sports now. Oh, let's watch a little soap opera. Let's watch... No, focus on Jesus. I, again, he has to be your all. He, for all eternity, you're going to be with God. And the earth is the only time where you can prove that you want to be with him. St. Teresa says, on earth, you could, you, you could love God when you're, without seeing him. Because once you get to heaven, you're going to see God. You're going to fall on your face to adore him and to love him and to praise him and to thank him and to bless him. him. He is so perfect. He's so holy. He's so loving that you, you can't stand in his presence. He's so beautiful. This is the only time where we can freely love Jesus. By 20, 4, 11, 4, 1926. <clears throat> now the kingdom of the supreme fiat, he says, we triune God shall have copies of our sovereign queen. So she too longs for, she awaits the divine kingdom on earth in order to have her copies of her children. What a beautiful kingdom it shall be, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of infinite riches, a kingdom of perfect sanctity, of perfect dominion of God. Our children in this kingdom shall be all kings and all queens and shall all be members of the divine and royal family of God. They shall enclose all of creation within themselves. They shall have the remembrance, the, the physical likeness of our celestial father. Therefore, they shall be the fulfillment of our glory and they shall be the crown of our head. Jesus says, the little children of the Holy Divine will have a triple crown in heaven of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who is the first one that's going to get this? It's the one who lost the triple crown. The triple crown was given away. The first one will be the Pope. He works with Louisa. Wait till you see. He has the keys to the kingdom. Don't be upset about anything. God knows exactly what he's doing. And he's, he's bringing us to this fullness that's coming. This, the crown basically will be, the crown of my children will be on God's head. But God is going to put the triple crown on his children's head. Then I remained thinking about what Jesus told me. And I thought to myself, before the Blessed Virgin Mary knew that she was to be the mother of, the God, of God, the word of God, my mama had no pain or no sorrow. More so since living in, in, within the expanse of the supreme will, Our Lady was eternally happy on earth. Therefore, among the seas that she possessed, she lacked the sea of pains. Yet without this sea of sorrow, she impetrated for the long Ford Redeemer. Now, this is our question that we've given to Louisa. And Jesus says, the one who lets herself be dominated by divine will possesses as many seas for as many acts that she does in the divine will. Now, he's talking about Our Lady. And while she does little, she has much. Our Lady has a divine volition that delights in making of the little act of humanity an ocean. The I love you has become a divine sea. Only within these divine oceans, the divine seas can impetrate for the long for kingdom of my divine will. This is why, Louisa, you are our newborn. Louisa, you are the little daughter of my divine will was needed. So that turning her little pains and her I love you into everything that she does, into this ocean, the seas that communicates within the ocean of the eternal one. And she could have the ascent, this, this, this gift to impetrate the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So what does he say? Our lady suffered. 
Our Lady suffered uh, now more than ever because she sees her children on the edge of the abyss. She sees that on the edge of the abyss. And she says, will you, will you stand in the breach? As Moses stood in the breach for the Israelites, will you stand in the breach for my children to bring them into the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven? Or are you willing to do this? Louisa said, yes. He says that to us now. I, I don't want any of my children to be lost. They're on the edge of the abyss. Would you stand in the breach for them? Would you pray in the name of Jesus and Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve, the way I taught Louisa? Do you want to enter into this abundant life? And when we say, yes, God, Jesus and Mary say, good. My children are safe. You're standing in the breach for them. As Moses stood in the breach for the Israelites, you're standing in the breach for all of humanity, past, present, and future. It's not, the divine will is not be about becoming a saint. That's volume one through volume 10. How to become a divine mirror of Jesus. It's to enter into this, this time of the Holy Spirit, this, this new and divine way of holiness, this divine, this Pentecost that's coming upon the earth. Why? So that we can get to volume 20 through volume 36 to receive again the divine inheritance of the Father that Adam lost. This is what sanctification is about. This is why we're alive. This is why we're Catholic. We'll be back in 15 minutes. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And your pain is so great that it suffocates you. It breaks your speech, and you remain as though lifeless on the face of Jesus. Poor Mama, how much compassion I feel for you. My angels, come to comfort my Mama. Her sorrow is immense. It inundates her. It suffocates her. It leaves her no more life or strength. But the divine will, breaking through these waves, gives life back to her. You are now at the mouth of Jesus, and in kissing it, you feel your lips embittered by the gall which so much embittered his mouth, and sobbing you continue. Son, say one last word to your mama. How can it be? that I will no longer be able to listen to your voice. All of your words you have spoken to me in life, like many arrows, wound my heart with sorrow and with love. And now, seeing you mute, they put themselves in motion once again within my lacerated heart. They give me many deaths and would want to snatch, by force, one last word from you. But, not receiving it, they torment me, and they say to me, So, you will no longer hear him. You will no longer hear his sweet accent, the melody of his created word. He created as many paradises in me as words that he spoke. Ah, my paradise is finished, and I will have nothing but bitternesses. Ah, son, I want to give you my tongue in order to animate yours. Give me that which you suffered in your most holy mouth. The bitterness of the gall, your ardent thirst, your reparations and prayers. And so, hearing your voice through them, my sorrow will be more bearable. And your mama will be able to live through your pains. Tormented mama, I see you hasten, because those who surround you want to close the sepulchre. Almost flying, you take the hands of Jesus between yours. You kiss them, you press them to your heart. And placing your hands in his, 
you take for yourself the pains and the piercings of those most holy hands. Then you fly over the feet of Jesus, looking at the cruel torture which the nails have made in them. And as you place your feet in them, you take for yourself those wounds, and you offer yourself to run towards sinners in the place of Jesus, in order to snatch them from hell. Anguish in the mouth. I see you give the last goodbye to the pierced heart of Jesus. Here you pause. It is the last assault to your maternal heart. You feel it being torn from your breast because of the vehemence of love and pain, and by itself it runs to place itself in the most holy heart of Jesus. And you, in seeing yourself without a heart, hasten to take his most holy heart into yours, his love rejected by many creatures, his many ardent desires not fulfilled because of their ingratitudes and the pains and piercings of that most holy heart which will keep you crucified for the rest of your life. In looking at the wide wound, you kiss it, you lap up the blood, and feeling the life of Jesus in yourself, you have the strength to fulfill the bitter separation. Then you embrace him, and you allow the sepulchral stone to close on him. My sorrowful mama, crying, I pray you not to allow for now that Jesus be taken away from our gaze. Wait for me to first enclose myself in Jesus in order to take his life within me. If you, who are the spotless, the all-holy, the full of grace, cannot live without Jesus, much less can I do it, who am weakness, misery, and full of sins. How can I live without Jesus? Sorrowful Mama, do not leave me alone. Take me with you. But first, place all of myself in Jesus. Empty me of everything in order to place all of Jesus within me, just as you place them within yourself. Begin with me the maternal office which Jesus has given you on the cross. Let my extreme poverty break through your maternal heart, and with your own hands enclose me completely in Jesus. And close the thoughts of Jesus in my mind, so that no other thought may enter into me. And close the eyes of Jesus within mine, that he may never escape from my gaze. And his hearing in mine, that I may always listen to him and do his most holy will in everything. Place his face within mine, so that by looking at him so disfigured for love of me, I may love him, compassionate him, and repair. His tongue in mine, that I may speak, pray, and teach with the tongue of Jesus. His hands in mine, so that each movement I make and each work I perform may have life from the works and actions of Jesus. Place his feet in mine, so that each one of my steps may be a life of salvation, of strength, and of zeal for other creatures. And now, my afflicted mama, allow me to kiss his heart and to lap up his most precious blood. You yourself enclose his heart in mine, that I may live of his love, of his desires, of his pains. Lastly, take the stiffened right hand of Jesus, that he may give me the last blessing. The stone closes the sepulchre. Tortured 
you kiss it. And crying, you give him the last goodbye and depart. But your pain is so great that you remain almost petrified as your blood runs cold. My pierced mama, together with you, I say goodbye to Jesus. And crying, I want to compassionate you and accompany you in your bitter desolation. I want to place myself at your side, to give you a word of comfort, a gaze of compassion at each sigh, strain, and sorrow of yours. I will gather your tears, and I will sustain you in my arms if I see you faint. But I see that you are forced to return to Jerusalem along the path from which you came. After only a few steps, you are already before the cross on which Jesus suffered so much and died. You run to embrace it, and in seeing it colored with blood, the pains that Jesus suffered on it are renewed in your heart, one by one. Unable to contain the pain, you exclaim, Oh, cross, how could you be so cruel with my son? Ah, you have spared him nothing. What wrong had he done to you? You have not permitted me, his sorrowful mama, to give him even a sip of water while he was asking for it. And to his parched mouth, you gave gall and vinegar. I felt my pierced heart melt, and I wanted to offer it to his lips to quench his thirst. But I had the sorrow of seeing myself rejected. Oh, cross, cruel, yes, but holy, because divinized and sanctified by contact with my son. Turned a cruelty which you used with him into compassion for miserable mortals. And for the sake of the pains he suffered on you, impetrate grace and strength for the souls who suffer, so that not one of them may be lost because of tribulations and crosses. Souls cost me too much. They cost me the life of a son God. And as Corridamprix and mother, I bind them to you, O cross. After kissing it over and over again, you leave. Poor Mama, how much compassion I feel for you. At each step and encounter, new pains arise, which increase in their immensity and become more bitter. They inundate you, they drown you, and you feel you are dying at each instant. You are now at the point at which you met him this morning, exhausted under the enormous weight of the cross, dripping blood and with a bundle of thorns on his head, which, bumping against the cross, penetrated deeper and deeper, giving him pains of death at each blow. In crossing your gaze, the gaze of Jesus looked for pity, but the soldiers pushed him and made him fall to deny you this comfort, making him shed new blood. You see the ground soaked with it. You throw yourself to the ground, and as you kiss that blood, I hear you say, My angels, come to place yourselves as guardians of this blood, so that not one drop of it may be trodden upon and profaned. <clears throat> so we'll begin in the name of the father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, the Queen of all saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, listening to, to Marina uh, always brings tears to, to my eyes. She's, she, under, she knows I can and reads these words that she has translated. And uh, what you can see is um, uh, uh, the love of Jesus and Mary through Louisa to, for us. And I've had people come up to me and said, well, I've read all the 36 volumes. Now what do I do? And I was like, <laughs> okay, now go back and read it. <laughs> it's not a novel. Well, I finished the novel. Now what do I do? We got another novel for me? See, as you read, as you study, Jesus is going to show us more. He says, he says, each word that I breathe into you is a divine life. And every time you read it, I'll expand it. I'll expand it. And, and what happens is it's like a balloon. He says, I will fill you as much as you want. 36 to 100 fold. So 100 years from now, when you read that word again, it's more beautiful. Why? He's, he's filling in all the voids that that word that Jesus spoke is filled with. So when you, when you read and reread in the book of heaven, nothing, nothing can compare to it. Nothing. Because this isn't, he says, there's many books that are written. We have libraries of books. But this is the only book, the book of heaven, that will transform a soul. This transformation of the soul is Jesus breathing in our breathing, Mary breathing in our breathing. And what's happening is there's this transfusion of, of the blood of Jesus, the blood of Mary in us. I mean, that's a mystical way of explaining it. You're, you're beginning to begin to live this fullness of the life of Jesus and Mary. And it's just, it's just a glimpse. The fullness isn't here yet. When that great day happens, and we're waiting for that great day, uh, heaven and earth is going to rejoice. So we're, we're continuing with volume 20, 11, 6, 19, 26. And Louisa says, I was feeling all oppressed under the weight of the privation of my sweet Jesus. She, Jesus didn't appear to her. Jesus wasn't with her. And she was so filled with sorrow because Jesus is her life. It just shows us how much we can be late for Holy Mass or leave early before the blessing of the priest. Yeah, it's just something to do. No, but when we realize that the holy sacrifice of the mass is 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 we're, we're, we are at the foot of Calvary again in a mystical way. We're receiving at the Last Supper the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus where he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. A lot of people say, oh, he was only kidding. Do you think he really meant that? Really? I mean, did God not mean that you must eat my flesh and drink my blood? Even though he used the word manj and chew, he didn't mean it. He was joking with the apostles. You mean to say that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was fooling us. Take my mother into your home. Let her be with you. Let her teach you what, what Jesus taught her. He was only kidding. And now with the book of heaven, oh, it really, it's, it doesn't mean anything. When even St. Pope, Pi, Saint Pi, Pope Pius X said to St. Honorable de Francia, we must kneel because Jesus is speaking to us. Oh, it doesn't mean anything. She says, I long for the celestial fatherland in which I shall never lose the sight of Jesus again. I long for heaven so that I'm no longer subject to the hard martyrdom of feeling myself dying without dying. Lord, Lord, Louisa went through great torture. And Jesus said to Louisa, why, she says, why do you do this to me? You make me die every day and, I, and then you bring me back to life. And Jesus says, I want you to be born again and born again and born again. It del I delight in that because you're more and more and more beautiful. 
this life that I breathe into you come, becomes more spectacular. You become, as he says to Louisa, my divine masterpiece each day that you're born again. So it's not just being born again. I am born again. It's constantly dying. What are we dying to? No more worry, no more fear, no more anxiety, no more complaints, no more negativity, no more doubts. It's dying to the human misery. What's the human will? Worry, fear, anxiety, complaints, negativity, and sin. And Jesus says, enough, enough. I know how you're living. I don't want you to live like this anymore. I'm going to give you my gift of the divine will, where you will enter a life of peace, joy, and happiness. If you, you want to be worried, fearful, anxious, complaining, and negative, then you are anticipating hell. If you are peaceful, joyful, and happy, Jesus says, I am there. My mother is there. Luis is there. It's heaven. And you're, you're anticipating heaven. Then he says, Louisa, what do you want, heaven or hell? That's where we are today. What do you want, heaven or hell? Then we better begin to work for it. How do you work for it? Being peaceful, joyful, and happy. Worry comes. I'm not going to feed the demon worry anymore. You keep worry alive in you by feeding it worry, feeding it worry. And it's, he's got, I got you. You're under my spell. Then you feed them fear, anxiety, complaints, negativity, and sin. I've got you. But when you say no more worry, as Jesus tells Louisa, no more fear, as Jesus tells Louisa, no more anger, no more negativity. Oh, you don't understand. I got to be negative. That's the truth. No, it's not. It's baloney. Be peaceful, joyful, and happy. The truth is heaven. The truth is heaven. Begin to live heaven. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That means the devil is going to be, who's been banished from heaven will be banished from earth. Oh, I long for the celestial fatherland, which shall no longer lose the sight of Jesus. I shall no longer be subject, subjected to the hard martyrdom of feeling myself dying without going to heaven. My daughter, your pains, your long sacrifices, your incessant prayers, incessant prayers that my kingdom may come soon, my manifestations that I've given to you in the book of heaven about the divine will, I shall unite every, everything together with me, Jesus says, and shall form foundations in you. He's building. I'm building the new Jerusalem for you. Look at the beautiful things that humanity has built. The angels are doing this. Jesus is doing this. A new, a new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. Once I have completed everything, and I then, once I've completed everything with you, Louisa, and then I entrusted everything to my priests and ministers who shall be like second apostles of the kingdom of my divine will. They shall be the criers, the proclaimers of the divine will. So what's the second part right now? He's completed everything with Louisa. It's done. Now he's going to entrust the kingdom to his priests, like second apostles of the kingdom of my divine will. They're going to be the promoters of this. So this book of heaven that you're reading, you need a priest to feed it to you, not a lay person. And see, a lot of people have made the divine will Protestant. You don't need a priest. Well, the ontological change that occurs in a priest, a bishop, a priest, a deacon, is so that they can proclaim the word and give homilies. A lay person can't get in the pulpit and make a homily. It's a nice talk, maybe, but it doesn't touch the soul. That's what a priest is for. He's to be like a second apostle of the divine will, criers, proclaimers of the kingdom of God on earth, in us as it is in heaven. Ministers of God, priests of God. Again, God's going to give you what you want. You want to Protestantize the divine will? Go right ahead. He does. He says, it's you, you've got a free will. But if we listen to what Jesus says, once I've completed everything in you, Louisa, I'm then going to entrust to my priests as second apostles of the kingdom of my divine will to proclaim this to the world. Your pastor, your priest, Jesus says, I want to give this to them. Are you praying for your priests? Are you praying for your pastors? Are you praying for your bishops? Are you praying for the cardinals? Are you praying for the Pope? 
it's not a time to condemn. It's a, it's a time to pray. Do you think that the coming of Father de Francia, who showed so much interest in, in these writings, was taken to heart the publication of these writings, which regards my divine will, came by chance? No, Jesus says, no. I, God, myself, Jesus, had disposed it. It is a providential act of the supreme will that wants Honorable de Francia to be the first apostle of the divine fiat and proclaimer, proclaimer of the divine will. And then the daily coming of the priest, Jesus says, I myself dispose this, that I might find quickly the first apostles of the fiat of my kingdom so that they might proclaim what regards my eternal will. Therefore, Luisa, let me finish what I've started with you. And after I've completed it, I may entrust it to the new apostles, the priests of my divine will. And then you, Luisa, will be able to come to heaven. Why? To see from up there the fruits of the longed-for kingdom of the eternal fiat. Luisa's watching this. Luisa's praying that it's being accomplished. Again, there's going to be one church, one flock, one shepherd. Read the last chapter of I'm 24. It's going to happen. It's, it's, God has this planned. And we're in it. This is, the, this is the fun part. He's asking us to participate in this. I'm 20, 11, 14, 19, 26. My daughter, it takes much to sustain and persevere a divine will in the soul. And the divinity, knowing that the creature does not have the equivalent things for a divine will so holy, holds nothing back. Everything is placed in Luisa. Everything is at Luisa's disposal. Why? In order to form the sanctity of living in my divine will. Who is the one who possesses it? Luisa. That's why when you listen to Marina read, she she understands the these words that Luisa wrote. I, you know, she, when, when we copied the writings of Luisa from the secret archives of the Vatican, you could see in her writing when she was in pain, you could see in her writing when she was filled with joy. I mean, the pain was in the pencil, the pencil marks, the ink marks, the joy was in the ink marks. She, she loved Jesus. It's, 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 uh, and when these writings come out, when you'll be able to see her writings, what, what she's done, you're going to understand there's times when she's suffering greatly and she's still faithful. She's still faithful. Everything is placed in Louisa. Everything is Louisa's disposal in order to form the sanctity of living in my divine will for those who read it. God himself as the prime actor and spectator, my holy humanity gives everything. My holy humanity did everything. My holy humanity suffered and conquered. And they're the endless seas as helps of this divine sanctity, fully divine. This isn't about being good and holy and saintly. That's what God showed the saints. That's volume one through volume 10. But to enter into the fullness of the Holy Spirit that's not here yet, he's trying to get us ready to enter into the receiving the divine inheritance of the Father. It's not here yet, but we, he wants us to get ready. It's going to come like this. It's going to be real quick. Twinkling of an eye, Jesus says. We got to get ready for this. And it's such a joy to read, to study, to put into practice. So he says, my queen mother herself places her oceans of grace, these seas of grace of love and of sorrow at your disposal, Louisa, as your helps, Louisa, and feels honored that they serve the supreme will of God in order to accomplish the divine sanctity of the eternal fiat returning to humanity. Heaven and earth want to give. They give and feeling all infested by this holy divine will. They desire, they yearn to help the fortunate creature, Louisa, and now us, to fulfill the purpose of creation. What is that? To return to the origin of our sanctity. What God breathed into Adam, image and likeness of God, that supreme volition wanted for all of humanity. Therefore, nothing shall you lack on your part of Jesus, Louisa. Nothing. And more so, since it is my desire from of old, wanted and yearned for and longed for, for as long as 6,000 years, wanted to see our image reproduced in humanity, our divine sanctity impressed our will operating in you, Louisa. Our work is enclosed in you, Louisa, 
and our fiat is fulfilled. It's done. Jesus says, now it needs to be known. Now it needs to be known. 520, who needs to know it? The, the, the book of heaven was given to us. And he says, read it, study it. You can have as much as you want or as little as you want. 520, 11, 20, 19, 26. Again, this is very, very, very important. And created the creature, the divinity act like a father who sends his children for their good to one town, one to a field, one to a cross, one to, the, one to cross the sea and some place nearby, some far away, giving each one of them a task to, to fulfill. You have been given a task to fulfill by Jesus himself. I want you to know this. It's an office that Jesus says I've given to you. But while he sends them, he anxiously awaits their return. He wants us to come back to him full of this gift of gifts. He is always on the lookout to see if his children are coming back. And he speaks, he speaks only about his children. If he loves, he loves running to his children. His thoughts are to fly to his children. Poor father, he feels crucified because he has sent his children far away from him and he longs for their return more than his own life. And if this may never be, he does not see all of them and only part of them come back. He is inconsolable. That's, that's, that's the tears of Jesus and Mary right now. He weeps and utter moans and cries of sorrow, such as to snatch tears even away from the hardest of hearts. Only when he sees his children return back into his paternal arms to clasp them to his breast, he burns with love for his children. And then, and only then is he content. And Jesus says, how our celestial father, more than a father sighs, more than a father burns and raves for his children. Because the father has delivered them from his divine womb and he waits their return in order to enjoy them in his loving arms. And the kingdom of the supreme fiat is precisely this, the return of our children back into our paternal arms. And this is why we try on God long for the divine will so much everything's going to be everything's going to be the way god wanted it from the beginning the evil one he's going to be banished from earth not only earth not only our solar system not only our galaxy he's going to be banished from the universe his six thousand years of being under his thumb even though we've been redeemed two thousand years ago the six thousand years is coming to an end we've entered the seven thousandth year the third thousandth year the seventh thousandth year. A day will be like a thousand years. A thousand years will be like a day. I remember when some of the people said, I can't wait for that, that first thousand years. And I said, that's just the first day. We're going to be one with God as God originally planned. 520, 11, 27, 19, 26. I was all abandoned in the arms of the adorable will of God. And I prayed to my sweet Jesus to make use of an act of his divine power so that the supreme volition might invest all human generations, binding all human generations to the divine will that I might form its first children so longed for by the most holy divine will. And then Jesus says, Louisa, don't become distracted. Louisa. Don't you see that the foundation of the kingdom of the eternal fiat in you, Louisa, is formed. It was formed by my steps. It was formed by my works. It was formed by my heart palpitating with love and is formed for the honor of my holy divine will. It is formed by my ardent sighs. It is formed by the burning tears of my eyes. All of my life lies within you, Louisa to form this foundation. Therefore, it is not befitting that your, your work, your, your little work is over. This foundation is so solid and so holy that it is done without distraction. Don't do it with distraction. It can't be done with distraction. Or you, without praying your rounds, you must pray your rounds of creation. You must pray your rounds of redemption. This is what Jesus is asking. Are you praying? Are you learning how to pray the rounds? Oh, I, I, I'll get to it. No, are you learning how to pray the rounds? It's, it, the time is short. Our lady said, 
1947, time has now come to an end. She said this to Bruno. Are you ready for what God is going to do? Have you started it? You, you have to begin this. Are you praying your rounds of the supreme volition? Are, you, are, are they done shaded? No, no, my daughter. I do not want this in you. I don't want it. I want this fullness in you. That's what he's saying to us as well. Do not fear. You shall remain buried in the sun of the most holy divine will. God's going to bring us into the oneness with him. This S-U-N of the divine will. 520, 12, 3, 1926. Continuing in my usual abandonment and my adorable supreme fiat, I anxiously longed for my highest good, Jesus. Have you longed for Jesus today? Did you long for Jesus yesterday? Did you long for, are you going to long for Jesus tomorrow? Is this going to be part of your life? Longing for God. Holy Mass is there for you. You might have to drive a little farther. Holy Mass is there for you. Spiritual communions are there for you if you wish. Eucharistic adoration is there, is there for you if you wish. If you can't find the Eucharistic adoration in your parish, go to the internet. Spend an hour with Jesus looking at him. That In that monstrance is Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our King. He's, a, as St. Paul, as St. John Paul II said, he is a prisoner of love waiting for you. To console you, because he knows how tough it is. To help you, because he knows how tough it is. To comfort you, because he knows how tough it is. And he says, I'm here for you if you wish. Jesus says this very, very clearly. I anxiously long for my highest good Jesus in the endless light of his eternal divine will, whose boundaries cannot be seen, either where they begin or where they end. I was all eyes. This is, this is from the book of Revelation. I was all eyes to see if I could catch sight of Jesus, the one who I so much long for. Jesus is asking us, where, who am I to you? By 20, 12, 6, 1926. Now, while Jesus with me, the fidgets of his love were such and so many, and that his heart was beating very strongly and leaning against his chest, and leaning his chest on upon mine, she says, I'm, he made me feel his ardent heart beats and drawing his lips close to mine, he poured into me that fire that was burning him, the love of God that was consuming him. It was a liquid, like being liquid fire, and was so very sweet, but of the sweetness that cannot be described. This is a mystical language. It's, we want to be fed by the Lord. Well, what is in the Lord? His sacred heart, the immaculate heart of Mary. He wants to fill us with this liquid love of fire. He wants us to be consumed in his love. That's what's coming upon the earth. The, this outpouring of the, the love of Jesus and Mary, the sacred heart of Jesus, the mecca heart of Mary, is a consuming fire that we're going to be thrown into. For some, it will be ecstasy. For most, it will be wailing and grinding of teeth. By 20, 12, 10, 1926. In all the feasts in which the Holy Church honors my mother, all of heaven celebrates, all of heaven glorifies and praises and thanks the supreme will because they let see that they, the triune God, let see its life in Our Lady, the primary cause by which Our Lady obtained for the long for Redeemer. And therefore, because this fiat had life in Our Lady that dominated and reigned in Our Lady, they find themselves in possession of the celestial Jerusalem. You see what's coming? It was precisely the divine will that formed its life in this excelling creature, the Blessed Mother, who opened heaven that had been closed by the human will. And just as all the power of the divine fiat in the creature was needed in order to infiltrate redemption, and by holy humanity that possessed that power was needed in order to form it. In the same way, in order to infiltrate the coming of the kingdom of my fiat, Another creature was needed. He's always talking about Louisa. 
who would let the divine dwell, divine will dwell within herself and give the divine will free field in order to form its life in Louisa. And so that my divine will itself through Louisa may be ac accomplished, may accomplish the one and most important prodigy. What is the most important prodigy of God? The coming of the divine will to reign on earth as it is in heaven, the fulfillment of the Our Father. Because this is the greatest thing that shall take divine balance in the human family. Everything will come back to order. I do great things in you, Louisa. I centralize you in you, Louisa, everything that was necessary in Decorius to know about this kingdom of mine, the great good that my divine will wants to give, the happiness of those who shall live in the divine will. It's long story. It's long sorrow of many centuries because while it wants to come to reign in the midst of humanity, to make them happy, happy. Listen to this. Listen to this. Humanity does not open the doors to it. Humanity does not long for my divine will. Humanity do, does not invite the divine will. And even while it's present in their midst, they do not know the divine will. That's... That's where we are today. This is what makes the Lord so sad. This is why Our Lady's tears are tears of blood. Only a divine will could bear such invincible patience. Being in humanity's midst, giving them life and not being even known. Jesus says to us, my divine will is great. My divine will is endless. My divine will is infinite. And wherever my divine will reigns, it wants to do things worthy of its greatness, worthy of its sanctity, worthy of its power that it contains. We haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> the greatness, the sanctity, the power of God is going to come upon the earth. For some, it'll be wailing and grinding. For most, I should say, it'll be wailing and grinding. So Jesus is saying, I want my children saved. Would you, would you pray for them? Would you pray for them in the divine will? So he says, Louisa, be attentive. And he says to us, be attentive to what I'm going to do. It's, this is not about just anything. Or it's not about forming a saint. It's about forming the kingdom of my most adorable will uh, on earth as it is in heaven. So being a saint is volume one through volume 10, and you have to become a saint. But this gift is not about making you a saint. You should already be a saint, loving God and praising God and thanking God and glorifying God, being with our Eucharistic Lord, spending time with our Lord, praying the Holy Rosary every day, meditating on the mysteries every day. You should be living a life of, of, of sanctity, keeping holy the Sabbath. It's not a Sunday is not another Saturday. God is waiting for his children to come back to him to, to live a saintly life. So he says, this gift of gifts is not about becoming a saint. It's about living in the divine will and receiving the divine inheritance of the father. Forming the kingdom of my most holy divine will in each and every soul. So God is alive. Jesus is gazing and you're gazing. Jesus is listening and you're listening. Jesus is speaking and you're speaking. Jesus is breathing and you're breathing. Jesus is beating and your heart beating. Jesus is the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve. This is what sanctity brings us to. And the fun, the one who possesses it, this gift of gifts, this prodigy of prodigies, is little Louisa. Again, once we start reading, nothing will be the same. Once we start reading, nothing will be the same. Your life can't be the same. Why? Jesus is speaking to you, and he's touching your heart, your mind, your soul. And you can't, you, you're, not the, you're not the same anymore. You want more of the life of Jesus. You want more of the life of Our Lady. You want to fall more in love with Jesus. You want to spend more time with Jesus, more time with Mary, praying the Holy Rosary. That's what, that, that's what the life of Louisa is. It gives to the souls. A new and divine way of holiness, as John Paul II said. This new and divine way of holiness is ours. 
And all that God is asking of us is, can you say fiat? When, when, the, when the angel came to the, Our Lady, she says, you're going to be the mother of God. And Our Lady said, how can this be? I've already made a life, promised a life of virginity. Joseph made a life, promised a life of virginity. I'm not going to know man. I'm not going to be able to have babies. How, how am this? How can this happen? And the angel said, it'll be through the power of the Holy Spirit. She said, fiat me. Let it be done to me as you say. It's the same thing with the divine will. Jesus is saying, I want you to share in my divinity. I want you to be that drop of water put in the cup filled with wine. I, I, that drop of water becomes wine. I want you to share in my divinity. We go, how can this be? I'm a sinner. There's no way I can do this. I can't even become a saint. How can I live? Jesus says, it'll be through the power of the Holy Spirit. The second Pentecost is coming. We haven't seen anything yet. God is going to win. The, the, the evil one is so foolish. I mean, he thinks he's going to thinks he's going to beat God. This is why the, the communities were sealed. We, we, if you ever prayed the prayer of the community of seals, you know it's on the internet. Go and and pray this, Jesus. What what's your community? It's your family. It's your friends. It's your neighbors. It's your coworkers. It's your parishioners. It's your prayer group. Where you're not in charge where God is in charge and God is going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. That's what he said to Louisa. Louisa, let me do this. Get out of my way and let me accomplish what I have planned. He's going to do it. Therefore be attentive. This is not just about anything or about forming a saint. It's about forming the kingdom of my most holy divine will in all of humanity, past, present, and future to prove to the evil one he might have he might have stopped it for a little bit but he didn't it did come to a complete halt it's been put on hold if you want to say a pause if you want to say for the kingdom to reign on earth as it is in heaven now jesus says this i'm 21 3 5 19 27 i felt myself at the summit of affliction because of the privation of my sweet jesus again Louisa could not breathe without Jesus. She, her heart couldn't beat without Jesus. She loved him so much. And in my interior, I was saying to Jesus, my love, my life, how can this be? Do you talk to Jesus like that? My love, my life, my spouse. Do you, how do you talk to Jesus? Is there an intimacy in your, your talking? The reason Jesus gave us the book of heaven, he wants us to see the newborn, the firstborn of the divine will, how she spoke. And he says, I want to see that in you, not just mimicking, but am I your life? Am I your love? Jesus says. And if that is true, watch what I'm going to do. So Louisa says, my love, my life, how can this be? You have departed from me without saying goodbye, without teaching me where to move my steps. See, as a little newborn, you can't walk. What am I, how am I to do this? You're saying to Jesus, this, this question, this is our questions that were given to Louisa. You know, Louisa never doubted, never was upset, never worried, never was fearful, never was anxious, never com was complaining. And people say to me, oh, she was always complaining. Louisa said that at the end of her life, she says, Jesus, I'm so sorry for all the complaints, all the negativity, all the doubts that I went through. She said, Jesus says, you never doubted. All the people that were going to watch, read this, in this, this book of heaven, it's their questions that I gave you. It was their doubts that I gave you. It was their worries, their fears, their anxieties, their complaints that I gave to you. So Louisa was tortured by our doubts, our worries, our fears, our anxieties, our complaints continuously. Why? So Louisa would put this down on paper as her questions. And Jesus said, I did this so that I could answer everyone in the book of heaven. Any, all their questions are answered, Jesus says, because you went through it, Louisa. So what does that mean? That means that all your answers, all your questions are answered in the book of heaven. They're all answered in the book of heaven. They are all answered in the book of heaven. And as you, what about this? What about that? Read, 
<laughs> you want to hear your question? Oh, that's my question. Want to hear your doubt? That's my doubt. Want to hear your worry? That's my worry that you Jesus gave to Louisa so he could answer you. Read the book of heaven. No more questions. There's no more worries. There's no more fears. There's no more anxieties. There's no more complaints. There's no more negativities. There's no more doubts. You asked, you, Jesus took your question, gave it to Louisa, and he answered her. If, if you're still, after reading the book of heaven, have questions, you haven't read, you haven't read the book of heaven yet. Every one, of your, every one of your questions are answered by Jesus himself through Louisa. He says, basically, even more, it seems that you yourself have barricaded the way so as not to be found. This is what she's saying to Jesus. As much as I may go around all of creation, all the redemption, I call you and you do not listen to me. The ways are closed and I exhaust, exhaust myself with tiredness. I am forced to stop. And I long for Jesus, the one whom I wish to find at any cost, but do not find you. That's where we are. Ah, Jesus, Jesus, come back. Come back to the one who cannot live without you. Do you pray like that? And you're living in the divine will? I don't think so. Jesus, Jesus, come back. Come back to the one who cannot live without you. But while I was pouring out my sorrow, he barely moved in my interior. That's where Jesus is. Like we said right from the beginning, you've got to recognize Jesus who's been consecrated, who sits on the throne, his throne, which is your heart. He says, I, I could bear, just barely feel him move in my interior. And in feeling him move, I said to him, my Jesus, my life, my love, how you make me wait for so long to the point I cannot bear it no more. If you make yourself seen, just it's just like flashes without saying anything to me. So it becomes darker than before. And I remain restless, even more raving with sorrow. And I search for you. I call you, but I wait for you in vain. And Jesus compassionating me told me, Louisa, my daughter, do not fear. This is important for us. I am here with you. You have to begin to hear Jesus speak to you, not with your ears, but with your heart, your mind, your soul. And what does he say? Louisa. And he says to us, I, what I want is that you never go out of my divine will. That what I want is that you continue your acts always without ever moving from the boundaries of the kingdom of the supreme fiat. And this shall give you the firmness that shall make you be like your creator. For once he has done an act, that act is a continuous life without ever ceasing. We, when we pray in the divine will, we will see that I love you that we give to God in the name of everyone and everything past, present, and future. The echo of the I love you is, is everlasting. Why? It's Jesus and Mary who are saying this in us through little Louisa. You, wait till you enter into this. Jesus says this. Vine 21, 316, 1927. To you, Louisa. To you, Louisa. This, now we're going to hear what, why Louisa is so important. To you, Louisa, it is given to unite everyone, to embrace everyone, so that finding everyone and everything in you, Louisa, just as everything is found in my divine will, you, Louisa, may place harmony among them and they may exchange the kiss of peace. Where? In, in, in the kingdom. Uh, what does Jesus call the kingdom? Uh, the divine wedding feast. The kiss of peace in my kingdom shall be restored in the midst of humanity. We're not going to be separated from God ever again. We're going to be where God wanted Adam and his children, and he failed. And it took 4,000 years for Our Lady to bring Jesus into the world. Why? To start that universal life, that Catholic life that Adam lost. And 
now, 2,000 years later, Jesus said, what I've done with Louisa has brought everyone to enter into this kiss of peace between heaven and earth. Everything's going to go back to the way God wanted it from the beginning. What is that? That's paradise. Paradise is still in existence. The animals, the vegetables, the minerals, the, the air, the water in paradise is still in existence. We're not there because we obeyed the evil one. I will not serve. I will not obey. So Jesus takes our place on the cross, Adam's place on the cross, Mary with him at Calvary. Why? That, that your will be done, Father, not my will. And this is what God is waiting for in us. He wants, as he says, through Louisa, the, the exchange of the kiss of peace and my kingdom shall be restored in the midst of humanity. Here then is the necessity of these truths, these lessons, these knowledges that I gave you, Louisa, in the book of heaven, of the wonders of my divine fiat. Why? To dispose humanity. Why? To attract humanity to desire, to want, to long for this kingdom and the kingdom's goods that are in the divine will, as well as the necessity that I first chose one creature, Louisa, the newborn, the firstborn, by living in my divine will with her universal acts, where the acts of Jesus and Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve, that my divine will administered to Louisa are divine acts that impetrate, that bring about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven for humanity. This is the reason why you're born today. I didn't ask to be born. How many times have I heard that one? No, God wanted us to be born. He predestined us to be born, to be alive at this time, to watch what he's going to do. I act like a king whose people have been rebellious against his law. Now, now in the long run, the king feels compassion for his people. He chooses one of his most faithful ministers. This is Louisa. And opening up his sorrowful heart, he says to this soul, I want to trust you. Listen, I have decided to give you the mandate to call back to me the poor exiled souls, to release the prisoners, to give back the right to possess the goods that I, God, removed from them because of their rebelliousness. And if they are faithful to me, I will redouble their goods. I'll redouble their happiness. So this minister, this one who has this office, which is Louisa, was always after the king, praying the king on behalf of all of his people to give the grace of forgiveness and reconciliation to everyone, past, present, and future. And then after he arranged everything in secret, they call other ministers. Now, this is the second part, the priests. Your priest has been chosen by God to live at this time. Your bishops have been chosen by God to live at this time to turn and work with God in a powerful, powerful way so that the kingdom can be established on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to what Jesus says to his priests, the role of the priests in the divine will. Nothing's going to stop the priesthood. As a matter of fact, everyone is going to rejoice in the priesthood, rejoice in the Holy Church through the priesthood. He says, I call the priests in order to give them the orders of this beautiful news to reach the people, the people in prisons, the people in exile, how the king wants to make peace with them, how God wants each one to return back to his place, back to his office, and all the good that the king wants to give them. And the beautiful news spreads, and souls desire, souls begin to long for, souls begin to dispose themselves with their acts to receive the freedom and the kingdom that they have lost. And while the news is spreading, this faithful minister is always after the king, beseeching him with incessant pleas to let the people receive the good established between the two of them. When we begin to understand Louisa, that's, this is why... We pray those 40 days and 40 nights of the titles given to Luisa. Who is this Luisa Picaretta? Luisa La Santa, Luisa the Saint. And Father Bucci said, the church is going to discover Luisa is the saint of the divine will. And God is asking us to breathe this life in us. The sanctity of sanctities. This, this sanctification of humanity that God wants to see in us. 
this new and divine way of holiness that God wants to see in us. What a great time to be alive. We haven't seen anything yet. This is just the beginning of what God is going to do. And he's going to do it very quickly. This is what you have to understand. Soon, you're going to see some things that are going to make you shake. But we're going to be jumping up and down in joy. The kingdom is coming. And we're going to trust in God and believe in God and hope in God more. As he said to St. Faustina, the final devotion I give to my church before I return is divine mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I have complete confidence in you. We'll end with a prayer. May the blood that flowed upon the wood of this cross free us from our human will, that we live in God's holy divine will always. We pray for divine healing for all the little children, holy divine will. We continue to pray for the divine sealing that the holy angels bring upon all the, the holy communities of God. And we pray this in the name of Jesus under the mantle of Mary through the intercession of Louisa. And we pray that this prayer becomes God's command in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Father Salso. For those that want to remain for the final 13 minutes of the 24th hour of the Passion, that will complete that um, hour of meditation. We're going to remain on uh, for those that have the time to do so. Fiat. Quiet his thing. Oh, how do we do him? Mute. Okay. Sorrowful mama, allow me to give you my hand, to lift you and raise you, because I see you faint on the blood of Jesus. As you walk, you find new sorrows. Everywhere you see traces of blood, and you remember the pains of Jesus. So you hasten your step and enclose yourself in the cenacle. I, too, enclose myself in the cenacle, but my cenacle is the most holy heart of Jesus. From there, I want to come to you to keep you company in this hour of bitter desolation. My heart cannot bear leaving you alone in so much sorrow. But I feel pierced in seeing that, as you move your head, you feel the thorns you have Literally taken from Jesus people. penetrate into it. Yeah. The pricks of all our sins of thought, which, penetrating even into your eyes, make you cry tears of blood. Since you have the sight of Jesus in your eyes, all the offenses of creatures pass before your sight. Still a hundred. How bitter you remain. <laughs> Which is great. How you comprehend all that Jesus has suffered, having his own pains within you. But one pain does not wait for another. As you prick up your ears, you feel deafened by the echo of the voices of creatures. And from the variety of these offenses which reach your heart and pierce it. And you say, Son, how much you have suffered. Desolate Mama, how much compassion I feel for you. Allow me to dry your face, wet with tears and with blood. But I feel like drawing back on seeing it now covered with bruises, unrecognizable and pale with mortal paleness. I understand. These are the mistreatments against the Jesus which you have taken upon yourself and which make you suffer so much that as you move your lips in prayer or as your inflamed breast sighs, you feel your breath embittered and your lips burned by the thirst of Jesus. Poor Mama, how much compassion I feel for you. Your sorrows increase evermore. 
and as I take your hands in mine, I see them pierced by nails. It is in your hands that you feel the pain and see. Your sorrows increase evermore. And as I take your hands in mine, I see them pierced by nails. It is in your hands that you feel the pain and see the murders, the betrayals, the sacrifices, to be fixed. and all well, the evil works. Repeat. Repeating the blows, <laughs> widening the wounds, and embittering them more and more. Oh. How much compassion I feel for you. You are the true crucified mother. And so much so that not even your feet remain without nails. Even more, you feel them not only being pierced, but torn by many iniquitous steps I... and by the souls who go to hell. And you run after them that they may not fall into the infernal flames. But this is not all. Pierce Mama. All of your pains, uniting together, echo in your heart and pierce it. Not with seven swords, but with thousands and thousands of swords. More so, since you have the divine heart of Jesus within you, which contains all hearts, and whose heartbeat encloses the heartbeats of all. And in beating, it says, Souls! Love. And from the heartbeat, souls. You feel all sins flow in your heartbeat and death being inflicted on you. While in the heartbeat, love. You feel life being given back to you. Therefore, you are in a continuous act of death and of life. Crucified Mama, as I look at you, I compassionate your sorrows. They are unspeakable. I would like to transform my being into tongue and voice in order to compassionate you. But before so much pain, my compassion is nothing. Therefore I call the angels, the very sacrosanct trinity, and I pray them to place their harmonies, their contentments, and their beauty around you to soothe and compassionate your intense sorrows, to sustain you in their arms, and to requite all of your pains with love. And now, desolate Mama, I thank you, in the name of all, for everything you have suffered. And I ask you, for the sake of your bitter desolation, to come to my assistance at the moment of my death. When I find myself alone and abandoned by all, in the midst of a thousand anxieties and fears, come then to return to me the company which I have given you many times in life. Come to my assistance, place yourself beside me, and put the enemy to flight. Wash my soul with your tears. Cover me with the blood of Jesus. Clothe me with his merits. Embellish me and heal me with your sorrows and with all the pains and works of Jesus. And by virtue of them, let all my sins disappear, giving me total forgiveness. And as I breathe my last, Receive me into your arms. Place me under your mantle. Hide me from the gaze of the enemy. Take me straight to heaven and place me in the arms of Jesus. Let us make this agreement, my dear Mama. And now I pray you to return the company I have given you to all those who are agonizing. Be the Mama of all. These are extreme moments, and great aids are needed. Therefore, do not deny your maternal office to anyone. One last word. As I leave you, 
I pray you, to enclose me in the most sacred heart of Jesus. And you, my sorrowful mamma, be my sentry, so that Jesus may not put me out of it, and I, even if I want it, may not be able to leave. So, I kiss your maternal hand, and you, bless me. Twenty-fourth hour, Reflections and Practices Jesus is buried. A stone seals him and prevents his mama from looking at her son any longer. And we, do we hide from the gazes of creatures? Are we indifferent if everyone forgets us? In holy things, do we remain indifferent with that holy indifference which makes us never disobey? In the total abandonment of Jesus, do we conquer everything with a holy indifference which leads us continuously to Him? And do we form with our constancy a sweet chain so as to draw Him toward us? Is our gaze buried in the gaze of Jesus, so that we look at nothing but that which Jesus wants? Is our voice buried in the voice of Jesus, so that, if we want to speak, we do not speak but with the tongue of Jesus? Are our steps buried in His, so that, as we walk, we may leave the mark of the steps of Jesus, not of our own? And is our heart buried in His, in order to love and desire as His heart loves and desires? My Mama, when Jesus hides from me for the good of my soul, give me the grace that you had in the privation of Jesus, so that I may give Him all the glory that you gave Him when He was placed in the sepulchre. Oh, Jesus! I want to pray to you with your voice. And just as your voice penetrated into the heavens and resounded in the voice of all, in the same way, honoring your voice, may my voice penetrate even into heaven to give you the love and the glory of your own word. My Jesus, my heart palpitates, but I am not content if you do not let me palpitate with your heart. With your heartbeat, I will love as you love. I will give you the love of all creatures, and one will be the cry, Love! Love! Oh, my Jesus, give honor to yourself, and in everything I do, place the seal of your own power, of your love, and of your glory. Thanksgiving after each hour. My lovable Jesus, you have called me in this hour of your passion to keep you company, and I have come. I seem to hear you praying, repairing, and suffering in anguish and sorrow, pleading for the salvation of souls in the most touching and eloquent voices. I tried to follow you in everything, and now, Having to leave you for my usual occupations, I feel the duty to say to you thank you, and I bless you. Yes, so oh Jesus, I repeat to you thank you thousands and thousands of times, and I bless you for all that you have done and suffered for me and for all. I thank you and I bless you for every drop of blood you shed, for every breath, for every heartbeat, for every step, word, glance, bitterness, and offense which you endured. In everything, O oh my Jesus, I intend to seal you with a thank you, and then I bless you. Please, O oh Jesus, let my whole being send you a continuous flow of thanks and blessings so as to draw upon me and upon everyone the flow of your blessings and thanks. 
Oh, please, oh, Jesus, press me to your heart. And with your most holy hands, seal every particle of my being with your, I bless you. So that nothing other than a continuous hymn to you may come from me. This marks the potential start of a third world war, and we will soon be here. All right, that marks the, the end of our day of recollection. Thank you very much for joining us, Fiat. It with a silent.